the Finance Committee of the Quincy City Council uh, to order this evening. Uh, let me just do a little housekeeping before we start. In accordance with Chapter 20 of the Act 2021, signed by Charles, Governor Charles D. Baker, extending certain provisions of the open meeting law, the Finance Committee of the Quincy City Council will be convening via remote conferencing services that will air on Quincy Access Television, Channel 9, Government Access, relative to any and all matters pending in this committee, including but not limited to uh, two nights of budget hearings, Wednesday, June 23rd, and Thursday, June 24th. Also pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Um, Ms. Manning, could you call the roll? Sure. Councilor Andronico. Councilor Kane. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Liang. Present. Councilor Mahoney. Present. Councilor Palmucci. Councilor Phelan. Present. Ca uh, Chairman McCarthy. Present. Seven members, you have a quorum. Thank you. Um, first, thank, I want to thank everyone. I know we had a lot of meetings scheduled, a lot of rescheduling. Um, hopefully tonight and tomorrow night. We'll take care of our, our uh, business here in regards to budgets. I'm going to open it right up uh, to Mr. Mason to give us an overview on revenues. Eric, uh, you have the floor. Council, I'm, I'm going to share my screen for res uh, a revenue presentation. Right. Give me one second, please. Can uh, everybody see the presentation up? Uh, much, uh, yes, sir. Right, thank you. Um, so uh, to give you an overview of the FY 2021 uh, revenue, we uh, we started the year with a projection of 326 uh, million. And we, uh, I believe I was in front of this body in May of last year, discussing some of the revenue shortfalls we were facing. Uh, a lot of them didn't come to fruition, especially on the state side. Um, so with, with the current pro, uh, where we are currently in the year, we're projected to have a finish of about 331 million to 334.8 million in end of year revenue. So we are performing above where the original projection was. Um, in the year of COVID, that is certainly something that you know, we're, we're cautiously optimistic about, uh, but it was good performance. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing looking into FY 2022, the state has increased our state aid appropriation to 3.8 million, with the majority of that, about 3.1 million, going directly from Chapter 70 into uh, from Chapter 70, which is the school, uh, which is related to the school department, and that's reflected in this year's budget appropriation. Also, um, local receipts are recovering a lot faster than we originally pre projected. Um, they're recovering at a, at a we projected them to have a decrease of about 20 percent. Um, they had a decrease around 9%, so about half of what we expected, which is very good. Um, surprisingly, certain industry mails tax has uh, had a strong recovery in the last couple quarters in uh, vehicle excise tax, motor vehicle excise tax, which we'll cover throughout this presentation, also recovered or also are outperforming what they were originally thought. And all this data is, is as of today. Um, overall collections are at 96.7%, and we are 97.8% of the way through the year. I do want to make a point of clarification. Um, under Mass General Law, we are allowed to continue to collect receipts up until September. Many, many uh, fourth quarter receipts that are held by the state do not come in until usually sometime in late July and August. So I do expect this number to increase and we're actually ahead of where we usually are. Um, in terms of levy collection, uh, we're, at a, we're at 100%. We're actually, we're technically we're at $100,000 short of our $240 plus million levy collected. So it's been a very, very strong performing year, uh, despite some of the challenges I know a lot of homeowners face. Per, our personal property um, that also that, that exceeded 100%, and I'm sure there's probably some questions on uh, did personal property exceed 100% if we pass a tax levy? And that's merely tax revenue from previous years getting absorbed into this year's personal property tax. Uh, motor vehicle excise tax is at um, it was I believe this is a typo. It's at 90% now. That is. It, 
to be honest, that's uh, kind of incredible. Um, there was a lot of data coming out of the Federal Reserve early in the pandemic that showed a decline in motor vehicle sales, which I think we can all understand why. If people aren't driving to work, you're probably less likely to go purchase a new vehicle. Uh, but that's strongly recovered. I think one of the more interesting facts is the average vehicle price sold uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and in the United States has increased about 20 percent um, during the pandemic. So it, uh, that's what sales readjusted. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there was a 9.1 percent decline in FY 2020 in local receipts. We did project a 20 percent decline, so this is certainly uh, a lot better than what we thought was going to happen. Uh, we're projected to finish about 24.7 million in that category. Um, some interesting notes: uh, business certificates are are up a lot, and they had a 35 percent beat over projection. Um, I think that's probably a good indicator in terms of uh, the local economy recovering during COVID. Uh, I think one of the most interesting, and most people probably a big animal lover, dog licenses are are 142 percent over what they were originally expected. Uh, and it reversed a trend. We actually saw a trend in Quincy over the last uh, five, seven years of less and less dog uh, licenses. Not, not normally, maybe a three to 4% uh, decrease year over year. And this year bucked that trend pretty uh, pretty aggressively. So uh, a lot more uh, furry, four-legged friends of Quincy. Um, and as I mentioned before, vehicle excise tax are trending well above expected. Um, if we hold, if the trend holds true to previous years, we should be projected about a, 105% of annual budget for that. Um, kind of looking forward into uh, fiscal year 2022. Uh, if we look at the state, as mentioned earlier, it's a $3.8 million increase with 3.1 million being increased from chapter 70, that's education. Um, Quincy is, a, is considerably above the foundation spending level. I know a lot of this body served on the school committee, so we're very familiar with the foundation level. Because of that, that 3.1 million gives the school department a lot more flexibility than, say, in some communities that are right up against the foundation spending. Um, we saw, we also saw an increase, a $687,000 increase in unrestricted local aid, um, which is a surprising bump. I think a lot of uh, financial and economic analysts didn't think this would happen this quick, given the um, kind of the uncertainties at the state level during the pandemic. Um, and the only decline we saw in veterans benefits, and that is a product of the uh, de of demographics. So we simply, um, unfortunately, there's a lot less veterans around um, as the older generation passes away. And we'll continue to see, there's a lot of analysts who, and I agree with them, will continue to, see, continue to see this decline year over year. Um, the final slide before I'm willing to have to take any questions is I wanna talk about um, some of the insights from local receipts. There are strong indica indicators of recovery business activity, vehicle purchases, and meals tax are all what we like to call optimistic statistics. They, they, make, us look, they make us believe that people are increasing consumer confidence, um, which is important whenever you come out of a, a recession. It is important to note that we have, we, micro, microeconomics didn't even really exist the last time we had a global pandemic. So we're hoping that in normal recession, these would be good signs. So we're hoping in this time, there'll be good signs also. Um, Oh, we're outperforming expectations in the local receipts, but uh, pretty ha pretty handedly. Uh, but we are still carrying conser conservative optimism as we go forward. I still believe it'll probably be take maybe another year before local receipts fully recover. But given the trends are going now, I could be proven wrong by the time I hopefully talk to this body next year. And uh, I'm more than happy to take any questions that the uh, committee has. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Eric. That's a very clear and uh, solid presentation. Uh, appreciate it. Any questions for Mr. Mason from any of my colleagues? No? Okay. Eric, uh, thank you for that presentation. And um, I'll move right on, Eric, and keep you right in the, uh, right in the sights. And we'll go right to municipal finance if we could. Yep, so I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. All right. So uh, my budget this year, um, uh, my budget this year had, uh, it's well, the personal service lines are a net decrease of $2,000. There are some changes from year over year, uh, specifically the, uh, the reduction of my previous position, which is chief economist, and that being replaced with uh, the strategic asset manager. Um, some other, um, issues in this budget, or I should say highlights in this budget, is we had a union upgrade to financial analysts that we paid for with um, some budgetary movements. Um, additionally, you'll see admin secretary was decreased. Um, the 
Otherwise than that, um, everything else included here are step increases. There are no, throughout this budget, you'll see no salary increases that are just related to percent increases due to union negotiations. Um, those are not included in this so far. Um, in the big increase in my budget year over year, you'll see is the equipment line has been reinstated at $400,000. Thanks, Eric. Any questions for Mr. Mason on municipal finance? President Liang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually saw uh, Councilor Phelan's hand go up before mine. So I'm going to defer to him first, if that's okay. Yeah. Was, who was up? Was Councilor Palmucci ahead of you? Uh, no, Councilor Phelan. Councilor Phelan, go right ahead. Thank you, President. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, to, to, to Eric. Uh, question on the equipment line. You know, I wasn't here when, when this was actually in. So what is that for? Because it went from 300,000 to zero back to 400,000. What exactly are you spending that on? Historically, it's been used for police cruisers. So this is for police cruisers? Is this yes, it uh, makes up the vast majority of the history of that. Are we looking that, that we're gonna to have to buy more police cruisers? Did we not buy any of it last year? Uh, we try and keep up with it last year. I don't believe there was a uh, I don't believe there's a police cruiser purchased using FY uh, 21 money, but I, I can verify for that. Um, during the pandemic, we did cut down on those purchases. Um, I believe the only police vehicle bought last year was the prison transportation vehicle we had to purchase relative to how they changed uh, uh, the hearings they did for uh, COVID. Uh, but besides that, it's, it's been used primarily just for uh, police vehicle purchases. And are these basically um, bought off the state contract on this moment? Historically, yes, unless we get a better deal by going through an individual firm, but actually usually it's just right off the state bid list. So this isn't, is this used for anything else? Any other vehicle purchases? It's been used to purchase the occasional pickup truck that's been needed or maybe um, other vehicle related equipment. It, it's, I believe it's only ever been used for vehicle purchases, at least in time in here. Uh, but the majority of it's police vehicles, occasional, an occasional pickup truck if one goes down or is involved in a car accident. It's important to remember um, when one of our vehicles is in a, a car action, even if it's not um, the city driver's fault, the, if we get a receipt from the insurance company, um, that goes into the general fund under non-miscellaneous recurring and can't be reappropriated without an action from this body. So this uh, this budget line helps adjust for that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, President Liang and then Councilor Palmucci. Thank you, Eric. Can you just, um, you went through the explanation of the, um, the positions and how some of them had shifted, which explains what I imagine is um, all the transfers and adjustments that we see here. So I'm just referring to this last fiscal year. There was um, a transfer out of the salary wage perm line. Um, there was a transfer into the manager of accounts, out of chief analyst, and then into, I'm sorry, out of interagency compensation. Um, can you just go, I, so I, like, I know you explained it sort of like at a high level, but like with respect to this specific line items, could you just Absolutely. tell me which each of them are? Because again, salary wage perm, I'm not clear on, oh, right? And so, um, the, when the budget was deliberated last year, it was formed before I think we fully understood what was going to happen during COVID. And uh, I had some, my office had two retirements this year that were unexpected and another retirement that's going to occur in the next couple of weeks that um, was most likely going to occur previously. Um, as some people left early or some people stayed on, that kind of changed the composition of my department. And we were able to move these funds around. Um, the salary wage perm uh, money was, in, well, it's included here this year, is that that was to cover uh, the uh, employee who is uh, going to retire soon, who has extensive knowledge of the city, city's uh, accounting system, to keep them on to advise. Um, that was supposed to happen last year. It ended up not happening due to COVID kind of completely shifting the landscape. Um, and in terms of moving money into financial analysts, that was, we had some breakage in the line that allowed us to increase that salary when uh, the, in, the individual got the upgrade. And so that money was moved into that line to reflect, so it would uh, reflect accurately how much they were getting paid that year. I'm sorry, wait, but there says, it says here that there is money taken out of the chief analyst line. There was 61,000 yes. to 91,000 appropriated that was taken out of that line. Yeah, so that was my previous position. <clears throat> it, I uh, took over the CFO role <clears throat> in late September. That was we had two direct we had um, two people taking money out director of accounts. One was the previous individuals in the role, and the new individual he was training. Um, due to kind of the complexity of COVID and the different absences we had related to exposures, 
uh, that individual ended up staying on longer to complete the training. So we're taking, we took the funds out from that empty position that was not filled at the time and moving it into that line. Okay, and then just so, I'm sorry, so the 21,460 for Sally Wage for me, so that was last year to, to keep somebody on, correct? Is that person yeah. now still here? So I'm sorry, which one, which line item did the 21,000 get appropriated to? It should have been moved into, I can check this, I have my regular budget in front of me. Um, it got, I believe it, I, again, I don't have the exact transfer in front of me. Um, I believe it got moved into um, the manager accounts. I can bring up the report right now. I'm just making sure because if it wasn't needed for that specific line item last year and it was moved out to accommodate for another one, this is just more of a bookkeeping thing in my head, right? If, if okay. it's not needed for the salary wage line, but it's needed elsewhere and it's already appropriated elsewhere, then to that logic, then we wouldn't need it again this year in that line it, item. It, it's, it's not appropriated elsewhere. It, that individual, we were, they were projected to retire, but they, and then they were going to trans transition over to an advisor, a te uh, you know, temporary role, an advisory role. That individual, because of COVID, because of having the difficulty in training the next person, because we had exposures like every office did, and that delays training, for, especially for such an important, sophisticated position. Um, we moved that money as, along with the position I vacated. We combined those salaries to be able to fund both people in the position as the training occurred. We didn't originally envision that. It was a side effect of COVID. Subsequent to that, going into next year, we believe the arrangement that we were going to have in F, going into FY21 will occur again. So we do need that money to bring up, to have this person on part-time to help with some of the advisements. Okay. All right. Thank you. And can you, do you, do we able to find where it was transferred into? Uh, that's uh, bringing it up right now. It was just loading right now, Council. My apologies. If you're just staring at a screen with a loading thing, I can certainly hold off and we can come yeah, back. I know, we'll hold off yeah. No That's worries. Cool. Why don't we wait for it to load? And um, oh, Mr. Chairman, I do see Susan raising her hand if, if that's okay. Um, I, I don't want to hold anybody up just, you know, waiting for a no, loading I, bar. Yeah. <laughs> I see Sue O'Connor. Sue, do you want to add to this? I just wanted to let you know that the money was moved into the whatever, except the manager of accounts. Payroll line. Okay. Thank you, sir. Oh, I see. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, both. You're Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilor Palmucci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mason. Good evening, Councilor. It, this isn't the first time you're appearing before us as. Uh, whatever your title is, Director of Municipal Finance, right? That was last year? Uh, not for budgetary reasons. I was still in my previous role last year. Okay, that's what I thought. So welcome in your new role. Uh, you've done a fantastic job. I've, I've always been impressed with you and the, the job that you do um, in your department. Uh, so I, I'm looking, I have similar questions perhaps to what um, Councilor Liang touched upon, and that's your, your previous position, which was Chief Analyst Economist, right? I believe, yes, Councilor. Yeah. And so that was budgeted in 20 in 21. And then there's no request for it in 22. Correct. Okay. And then if I look at positions, um, there's two new positions as a strategic asset manager for 96 uh, or $97,000 and then a financial analyst and uh, an out analyst position for $74,000, which are, were not in the 20 or 21 budget, right? Correct, absolutely. So we're creating two new positions, right? I, I do want to note that the financial analyst position um, was an upgrade of a previous position that was there. Explain that to me. So I mean, and I heard you talking a little bit about that, but I didn't quite get it. So um, if you look at we that the individual the position was um, originally we were getting the same union as admin secretary of the both supervisors union. 
So we thought we'd be better served having uh, the financial analyst, uh, an individual who, uh, who applied for it, um, was already in the office. So they kind of knew the background of it. And we elevated that. We brought that position down to zero and elevated that position higher to that financial analyst. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, and then, so the, so you, you, you lined out the administrative secretary. What, what does that have to do with the financial analyst? And uh, why can't I say that word? Analyst position. Sure, with it too. <laughs> uh, to be honest with you, I think what uh, I, I think this is a semi, you know, I, I don't want to generalize it. Um, when new department heads come in, they kind of reorganize based upon the skills they have. Mm -hmm. um, it, personally, I found the financial analyst position to be more um, effective in optimization of my, my departmental salary. Um, than the admin secretary. Um, there were some okay. roles as part of that, that that could be divided out across my current staff, myself included. All right, that makes that makes sense. Um, so how does the financial, an, uh, and I, I'm just going to say it, the financial analyst position get created uh, in the last quarter of fiscal year 21 without there being an appropriation from the city council to fund that position or an ordinance being passed to create that position? I, I can comment on the first part of the ordinance. I would defer to legal or uh, the mayor's office of non-ordinance expert. Um, how it was, was created is that we had considerable breakage in my lines um, from my previous, my, the breakage from my previous role, because I took that over so early in the year, basically left three quarters of salary sitting there. Um, so that's why the adjustment, so from 58 to, I believe it's in 71, is uh, 13,000. There was an upbreakage in my previous role. So um, kind of the side effects of running a leaner staff during COVID allowed for more flexibility. Um, and uh, again, I defer to uh, Solicitor Timmons or Chris Walker on the uh, ordinance part. Sure. Um, so as far as the, um, and as far as the strategic asset manager, that was a new position that was created, I think, we discussed it previously. It was created last year at some point, um, and that was being paid out of uh, the DIF fund, correct? Um, I believe it might have been primarily for, I first charged the DIF fund. And if it was, that oh, was, and then COVID money, right? It, yeah, it, all the all that charge has been now moved over to to COVID funds. Okay, and now it's coming onto the budget. It's being requested to come onto the budget in this particular uh, budget, right? Yes, it's being requested the, out of the general fund. Okay. Um, and do you have job written job descriptions for these two positions? Yes, I do, Counselor, and I'd be happy to provide them for you. Okay. Um, and neither one of them had an ordinance that came in, right, that you know of that the council approved to create these positions? No, not to my knowledge, Counselor. Okay. All right. I mean, I'm, um, you know, again, I think you do a fantastic job. I just, um, you know, I'm concerned about adding positions while we're not yet out of the woods of uh, the pandemic. And I just referenced the mayor's own public statements in the, in the Quincy Sun that I have in front of me where, you know, he just raises the concern that the, the timing fiscally isn't very good. Um, and I haven't been persuaded or convinced of the need for these positions, these two new positions. So I'm going to move to cut $170,619.33 from the budget, which represents the strategic asset manager and the financial analyst positions. That's a motion, Councilor. Yes. A motion? Yeah. So um, the strategic asset manager's position, uh, 96971 which would be 510027, and financial analyst, I got that the first time, 73 <laughs> And um, what was your number you came up with, Counselor? Uh, 170619 And if I could just say, um, you know, whenever we're cutting something from the budget, it's almost very similar to the school committee budget that we give the mayor a bottom line number. Um, even though we go through it line by line, uh, the mayor can keep whoever he wants uh, in the uh, functions of the, the executive office. So by cutting these exact amounts, we would be sending the message about these positions, but the mayor could keep these positions and um, 
you know, reorder the funding from a different source. I, I don't disagree with that premise that the administration has put forth before. So, you know, for, for what it's worth. Okay, so there's a motion to cut $170,619 for municipal finance. Jen, can you do a uh, yep. roll call vote on that one? Council Andronico. No. Council Kane. Yes. Council DeBona. No. Council Harris. No. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. Council Phelan. No. Councilor Chairman McCarthy. No. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Four to five. Four to five, it didn't pass. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh. That it, Councilor Palmucci? <clears throat> yep, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilor Mahoney. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Mr. Mason, I just had a couple of questions, too. You mentioned that um, the capital asset manager was paid out of COVID and then I think you said out of DIF and then went to COVID and then came into the budget, correct? Yes, it was paid for <clears throat> originally signed to DIF. Uh, it was paid for out of COVID. Um, well, like all the charges were moved to COVID and now I'm requesting it to be uh, uh, moved on to the general. So you have three other positions, I think, that are being paid out of DIF or COVID, the special counsel two for $50,000, an office aid for 31,850, and a financial coordinator for 65,000 out of DIF. Right. That, are being um, charged, that are being charged to those accounts to municipal finance. Being charged to municipal, I'm only aware of one of those uh, accounts. Okay, which one are you aware of? The financial coordinator. Okay, and what is that, and um, why is it being charged out of DIF and into your into your department? Uh, that position acts as a liaison between the planning department and municipal finance to cover all the financial issues related to DIF. Now, I thought we could only have um, it, it, I'm, it just if you could. I know that they did some work back when Joe Finn was here. That there was an order that I thought it was only a general contractor or uh, like. Um, so he was overseeing our whole project. So now we have financial coordinators that are coming out of the DIF, and then we had a capital asset manager that was being charged out of the DIF. So I believe we weren't supposed to be charging um, personnel to that those line items. Uh, my recollection of that vote is that it was not passed by the body. Um, I think it was something that was looked into by the DOR, and the DOR was the one that made the statement. I'm unaware of that, Councilor. Okay. So the other two positions that you know, you don't know what the special counsel to or the office aid is or why, where those are being charged to? No, I'm unaware of those positions, counselor. Okay. And then I just have a question. This is just a, this is just for, a, a, when we start the budget, we don't get actually what's, and I always find this very frustrating because we get like kind of a list and we have a salary. We don't know if it's one person or two people. We have to ask how many people are in your department. I did ask for that. And I think they told me there was nine employees in your department. Then, you know, just out of, you know, you know, because, the capital asset manager was introduced to us at a different meeting. We wouldn't probably even know have known that person was even brought on to the in, brought into your group. And I do think that that's a critical oversight because it's not very transparent about who's being hired or even who's retiring. So typically, I mean, at least in in private practice, when you're doing things, you're looking at budgets. We want to see how many employees you have you know, how many people maybe might be retiring, how long you can last with them because you can stretch your budget a little bit longer, kind of like you were talking about last year, how lean you were. But we as the city can't see that. And we're, this is a public entity that we're running and it should be transparent. And we can't see that. So we can't reconcile the number of employees that we have in the city of Quincy. And then when we have other employees, just like I said, these four employees that look like they're being charged to municipal finance. And as you said, you only were aware of two. If I wasn't looking for them or asking for them, I may not have known they were there at all. So are there any other people transparency, really, that you know of because you're the chief financial officer. So whether it's being billed to our budget or into any of our bonds, how many people are we, we billing to the bonds? Wouldn't it be better to account for them in our budget and then do a transfer from those bonds so it could be transparent? We, people would know that we're paying salaries for people. And are these people getting benefits? Um, uh, uh, first addressment is nobody gets uh, outside of the diff. Um, you cannot bond any sort of, you can't use uh, any bond money, both premium and net proceeds for okay. personnel positions. I'm so currently in my department. So the, so the diff, we're using the diff and we're using COVID money. So 
I'm asking, you know, if we're charging people to COVID and we're charging people to DIF, are they employees of the city or are they contractors in the city? Which are they? Um, the people being charged as employees would be regular employees, just like myself or a number of the uh, department heads who appear in front of you. So they are entitled okay, so to benefits. So um, that if, capital asset manager was an employee of the city? Correct. And the, and the financial coordinator is an employee of the city? Correct. Being charged by your department and the office aid and the special counsel too. But we yet, none of us know that they're there because we don't have an idea of that. And when we're looking at the budget, just like when we talked about, we did the transfers last night, or two nights ago when we were talking about $300,000 $300, being transferred from the hotel motel or from, I think it was hotel motel for, for trees or wherever, they, wherever we're doing the transfers for. We're offsetting that from that budget so that we can see it's coming from those accounts. Shouldn't we be doing the same thing so we can see where we're spending this money for it to be transparent? I'm asking this because you're the chief financial officer. I would think that you would want to be transparent with the general public. It's because the whether it's the diff, because the diff is a bond that we took out on behalf of the taxpayers to fund the downtown. And the forty-six million dollars, as you said, that's a financial, that's a financial um, financial money that's coming in from the federal government that the city can can use any way they want, still be transparent about the people that we're 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 funding. Would you not agree? I mean, if you ask my professional opinion, I mean, that's, that's why the city adopted ClearGov as an open software, open checkbook software. Um, in terms of offsets, I think the you know, general well, theory... Might say, the, you might have ClearGov, as a, but but it's not showing up in a budget. We can't see it. And if I didn't go searching for it, I wouldn't have been able to find this being charged to your department. So I don't see how transparent that is. I, I, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't share this with us, and 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 I don't think anybody else in the council they might know, but but I'm asking how how is that transparent if you, if it's not being shown, and the general public can't see where these people or who these people are, or why they're why they're being charged. Capital right. asset manager was being charged to your department and hired, and I think Council Melmucci just made a point, and I think there is a a state order that says that you have to. Um, you have to actually bring it to the council to get it approved with the job description. And it should be posted on our website before anybody's hired. And hiring is not my field of expertise. Pardon me? I said hiring is not my field of expertise. I, I'm sorry, you're breaking up. I said hiring is not my, my area of expertise, so I feel uncomfortable commenting on it. Well, hiring may not be your area of expertise, but your area of expertise is the chief financial officer. So the number of people that we have um, that we're that we're hiring and the number of people that we're going through the budget. I'm assuming that when people are submitting their budgets, you're looking at their budgets too in all departments. So you want to know how many people do they have and where are they getting paid from? And you know, and I would assume that you would know where if there were people being paid from from diffs or from from the um, from the the pandemic money in all different departments, whether it's your department or any other department. I mean, for the presentation, true? yes, understood. Okay. But when I said special counsel to an office aid, you said those are not going to your department, but you don't know where they're going to. Correct. Okay. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm questioning this because I, I know you're, you're, you're presenting your department, but my concern is, is you're the chief financial officer of the city of Quincy, who oversees the whole budget, not just your department, the whole budget. And you may not understand the procedures for hiring, but there is a procedure. And you, I mean, somebody should be giving you direction on, on how to do that. I certainly know that a new job has to be brought to the city council to give approval for it. It has happened before. I think you're aware of that happening before as well, because that budget was created and then line items created in the budget so that we can actually apply it to it. And furthermore, we just did pass an ordinance this year that all jobs must be, must be posted online. We've had jobs that are created they're not posted. They're not transparent. You say that you have adopted open an open government form of policy, but we can't see it. And I, I don't think anybody else, I'm not sure. I don't want to speak for my other counselors, but this certainly isn't transparent. It's not showing up in the budget. I have no idea how many I, on each line item. I don't know if it's one person or two people. I'm assuming that's one person. I, I had to call and ask, I, you know, I requested this and I got a breakdown with nine employees. I dug a little bit deeper and looked into certain things and I found a few other things. So it's, it's just not very transparent. It's, it's very upsetting to me. They don't know where they're coming from. And, you know, you have, you have not one, but two people that are being charged out of our departments through the DIF. And they, I don't believe the financial coordinator qualifies for, um, for that position in the, in the DIF. So 
I, I question that. I don't feel comfortable with that. That's not what people signed up for when they when they um, when they approved it. I didn't approve the diff for the capital. I didn't approve the diff three. So the capital asset management is being charged to that or was being charged to that. And then I'm not sure why you would then take it from the diff and then move it to the forty six million dollars for the for the pandemic money. So how does a capital asset manager qualify for pandemic money? I don't. I mean, it is. I mean, <laughs> it seems it seems odd. So Mrs. Mrs. Mahoney. Okay. Um, I'm done, I'm done, Mr. McCarthy. No, I, want, I, didn't, I want, didn't want you to run out of time if you had any questions about no, the budget. I think, I think what I'm having a problem with is that there's other, there are other departments that have similar situations, and I was hoping Mr. Mr. Mason was going to be, to be able to enlighten me, but unfortunately he was not able to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mason. I was very impressed. Thank you, uh, Councilor Mahoney. Uh, anyone else have a, a question on municipal finance for Mr. Mason? Um, could I get a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Motion to approve. All those in favor? Aye. No. The ayes have it. Thank you. All right. I'm a, I'm a no. I don't, usually it's like all those in favor, all those against. So I, you want to call? I'll just say no. No, no, I don't need a roll call. I just okay. no. So I didn't know that I only have one chance. I thought there was a, another question coming. So I just say no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation on no, Council Palmucci. Um, next item up is the reserve fund, Mr. Mason. Uh, so this year's reserve fund is uh, obviously pretty different than last year's, Include, included as a salary increase line. This is a practice the city has done before. Um, the salary increase line is as we're, it's a good faith effort shown by the city as we negotiate contracts with the union. And that is a, that is a, money held in the event that the union settle and retro checks would have to be issued. Um, reserve for stabilization, that's um, primarily made up of $5.5 million in projected savings from the pension obligation bonds that this body approved on Monday. Um, so that's included in the reserve for appropriation for OPEB is back in the budget that's previously been in there, but was uh, foregone during COVID. Motion to approve. Motion on the floor. Any questions on the motion? Council Palmucci. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mason, uh, why not put the full savings from the pension obligation bond into stabilization? What's the what's the thinking in terms of what we're saving versus what we're not saving? And I guess before you answer that, what page, what page is this particular item on? It's on page six of the six. Uh, Department Alliance. Great. Okay. Oh, yeah, I um, see it. So that's because the first the first year debt uh, the first year debt payment service is likely to, this will uh, you'll see this in the um, in the debt portion of the budget also um, we're projected to have if we what the payment would have been amortized is projected to be somewhere around fifteen million so we put that in, we put uh, five point five million in and then the remaining difference is going to, is uh, basically not raised, so we don't have to raise it on the tax levy. And so that's kind of that first phase you'll see of um, the, a lower trend growth in the tax levy. So if we included all the savings, we would have to raise all that on the tax levy during um, when we sent tax bills in December uh, by not including it here. We're kind of deferring that and allowing that to help stabilize the tax bills. And or the other option would be to not add new positions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> keep the, the budget level funded or close to it, right? I mean, it's, it's not, that's not the only option to not put it on the taxpayers, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the only option. Okay, all right. Um, and so how much is the, so you said the projected savings this year is 15.5 million from yes. the POB? Yes, right. And what's the, and what do you anticipate the um, first year payment to be? Um, it depends on interest rate, anywhere from eight to 10 million, depending on when we hit the market and what the term of the term of the bond is. Okay. Uh, and so you're saying you put the 5 million, which is roughly the difference for the first year into the, are you calling it stabilization? It just as personal service. Oh, I'm sorry, council. This is actually- Oh, reserve appropriation. Below. Yeah, it's yep. uh, stabilization. Okay. So that's essentially what I was saying, but it's only for this year, right? That's it's a good. conversation or discussion we'll have perhaps on a yearly basis, as we know the savings from the last year. Yes, and um, if we look like kind of a long, a long horizon forecast, 
um, when, when this is in front of this body to be discussed next year, that 5.75 million will have already been raised on taxes. So it doesn't, you don't have to raise it again next year. It's already right. 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 Got it. No, I mean, I think that's fiscally, that's fiscally prudent and it's up to this, you know, it's up to the administration and this body to um, continue to essentially put the savings from the POB into the piggy bank in case we need it for pension obligations or, you know, for some other calamity. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the one I think of the most is, was that snow that year we had all that snow I and mean, we spent so much money on, you know, dump trucks hauling snow. It was ridiculous, but that costs a lot of money. So it's good to have stabilization. Um, one last, one last bit. And, and obviously I voted for the POB, the pension bond, because I like the idea of saving the money. That doesn't mean I want to then spend all that money on new positions and, you know, other things. It, so I, I think it, this is, if that's the cost, then this is a wash and we're saving that money and putting it, you know, in that piggy bank. But where does this remind me um, on our financial plan, or whatever you want to call it, our, our, our uh, municipal fiscal policies, we have the debt number that we try and stay on, um, you know, percentage of the budget. We also have one for stabilization, right? Yes. What, it, what is that? Do you know? Our, our goal is to be at 10%, I believe, council. So 10% per year or 10% total? Uh, 10% total. Okay. And so what is the addition of this 5.7 give us? Uh, should, we should be about 4 to 5%. We did use some stabilization last year. If we had not used that stabilization, I would be at 6%. Okay. What did we use the stabilization for last year? We used it to reduce the tax rate. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we can't argue with that. Um, so this is, I mean, we're doubling what we have in stabilization and arguably right yeah. now. And we're going yeah, from yeah. 4 to 5 to 10 Um and arguably, if we realize even more or uh, even the same kind of savings from the pension obligation bond next year, we could get close up to that. Um, oh, I'm sorry, we're not doubling it, but we can get closer to that number. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Okay. I'm just talking to myself at this point. Yeah. Okay. All right. No, that's good. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions for Mr. Mason in regards to the reserve fund? So we have a motion motion to approve. Chen, will you call a roll call? Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor Pamucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. Chairman McCarthy. Yes. Nine members. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Mason. We'll move on to retirement and pensions, please. Eric. Uh, that's been has been heavily discussed by this body over the last uh, couple months. This is the pension payment uh, given our uh, usage of uh, pension obligation bond. As you can see, it's it's, it's decreased uh, roughly twenty five million dollars, and currently the only cost in there is what is the normal cost. And what we have to pay for early retirement incentives. Move approval. Motion to approve. Any questions on the motion, Councillor Andronico? Thank you, Chairman McCarthy. Uh, Eric, I just had a quick question on this here. Um, given that the the amount would be, I think it's yeah, seven and a half million. There um, is that presumption then that the city would be pursuing a, a thirty year bond uh, for for the pension liability. Uh, no, Councillor. This is just related to the normal cost of the pension. So um, normal cost carries a myriad of things, uh, but mostly the biggest cost of normal cost is usually people who are currently in the system who don't pay the required 11%, um, who were hired in the 80s and 90s and before pension reform in the early 2000s. This is that contribution. And on top of that, it's also the early retirement incentive payment that the state makes us we can't amortize that and we can't defer that payment. It happens all up front. Um, not to foreshadow, but um, that will be seen in the long-term debt section that we'll cover. I believe that's coming up next on uh, my schedule. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. No more questions. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions? Councillor Mahoney. Can I just ask a quick question on that? So, Eric, did you just say people that were hired before 1980? Is that I, what you said? It's anybody. It's 1980 was 
when they started uh, really heavily requiring pension reform, uh, I believe in okay. Massachusetts, but yep. uh, up, up until the mid 2000s. Oh, so it's from 1980s to the 2000s. Is there a breakout? Do you have a breakout of the employees, like the percentage of people that are, you know, the, are you tracking that percentage of people that have been paying in? Um, I, I would defer to the retirement board on that. Okay. So it's not, something, it's not something that you looked at when we were looking at the, um, it wasn't something you were looking at when you looking at the, the, pension, the, the pension obligation bond. No, it was not, yeah. Counselor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Any other questions for Mr. Mason? Oh, President Liang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Eric, what is this amount projected to be next year? Um, I can get that information for you, Counselor, by off by immediately reaction. I believe it's around 8.2 million. Uh, but I would want to confirm that. That's from looking at that table more than I'd like to admit. Okay, do we know if it's gonna stay? Is it staying around that amount essentially from this point onwards, since we have the pension obligation bond now? Um, yes, these are normal costs. These are not related to the, what the pension obligation bond addresses is the unfunded liability. These, This is separate for unfunded liability. Okay, and so I'm just wondering what we're looking at for because I remember when we were having the conversation for the pension obligation bonds, um, when you were breaking out the payments for us, and I just want to have a clear understanding of this since we're on it, you said that there was $7.5 million that must be appropriated and could not be refinanced, and so this is the 7.5 that you're referring to. And then... Correct. Um, you're anticipating somewhere around nine and a half million for the first year of the payments for the bond. You said we'd be going into that for the short term or long term debt conversation, right? Not necessarily here, but can we get to the next part? Yes, that's where that's what budgets are. Okay. And then I think you said earlier, I'm sorry, I know that this is all sort of connected, but not, and then there's five and a half in reserves to offset for next year. So that would equal out the total of the twenty two point five I think we were discussing during that bond. I just want to make sure I have it all, all clear in my head, but um okay, and then I think that's it for now. Actually, sorry. Let me let me look at this again when we're discussing the um the short term and long term debt. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, we get a motion uh, to approve time and pensions. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Um, moving on to unemployment compensation, Eric. Yeah, it's uh, unemployment compensation, which I know the counselors have their year dates, um, and they can see that it's been last year was a quite an extreme year day, um, performance of this account. Um, it went way over what it was originally budgeted for. Um, my office, working with human resources, have been in strong communication with the DUA. It does look like um, we're finally going to start seeing some of the unemployment settle down. In this cost, I do project that it will fall back into normal. And so I do think this 100,000 is the appropriate number. Um, I haven't taken any questions on it. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Any questions on the motion? Seeing no questions, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Uh, next item, Medicare. Um, uh, this is similar to what it's been in previous years. This is our contribution relative to uh, having to contribute to Medicare for um, our current employees. Any questions for Mr. Mason? Uh, Council Palmucci. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mason, does this include uh, the uh, payment for the college as well? Or um, is this not a fund that's, that we're paying for them? I don't believe so. I'll ha uh, I would want to check that with um, with HR and with our outside advisors on that. My inclination is strongly no because they have a separate EIN number, and Medicare is paid based on EIN numbers. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No questions. Motion to approve. So move. So move. On the motion, one more time. Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Uh, next up, Furnace Brook Golf Course. So, I know we're not seeking an appropriation of Furnace Brook Golf Course this year. Um, so this is going to lay zero. I, 
um, I would defer to Solicitor Timmons, but I do not, or the, actually, I'm sorry, or the uh, clerk. Um, I don't know if this requires a vote as it's not soliciting for um, an appropriation. Uh, Mr. Walker, could I reach out to you for a second? Just in regards to that uh, comment by Mr. Mason with Furnace Brook Golf Course, could you comment on that a little bit before we move on? Sure, Mr. Chairman. Um, ultimately, this is a function of the format of the budget. Um, with the team zeroed out this year, there is no appropriation request. It's always been in the budget, um, and it remains there for demonstrative purposes. Uh, for the next couple of years, as we would normally <clears throat> normally do anything that's zeroed out. Uh, but there is no appropriation request tied to this because um, the city will be taking full um, custody of, of the golf course this coming year. Thank you. Any question? Question, uh, Council Palmucci. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Perhaps uh, through you to, to Mr. Walker. Um, yes, so, so how are people getting paid? who are employees of the golf course at this point? Through, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Council, that's a, uh, a question we're gonna be handling a little bit later tonight uh, via the Department of Natural Resources. That's, not, that's the operation of the golf course. This is simply the property tax bill that was part of the, the lease agreement with the golf course. So as part of the lease agreement with the city over the course of 50 years, the city was required to pay. This gets into that convoluted uh, discussion we have uh, occasionally about this. The city was required every year to pay the property taxes, even though we're essentially paying ourselves. Uh, that's what this line item is. The operational end of it will be covered in the uh, Department of Natural Resources Budget Council. Okay. All right. Thank you. Move approval. Thank you. Motion to approve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mason, uh, once again, uh, long-term debt. So this is a reflection of the, all the capital decisions that um, have been brought in front of this body and uh, voted and approved. This is the um, the debt payments for them in the long run. I think the biggest one of note is you'll see the new account code 590109, pension obligation bonds. This is the projected um, amount needed um, for the first year debt payment. I do want to caution that, that that we don't know what that first year debt payment is. This is, uh, I would say, conser I would say conservative, um, depending on if it's at 30, 25, 20, 22, 27, whatever the term length bond is. Um, this would be enough that we believe we'd be able to satisfy that first that first year bond payment. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Mason. Uh, Chair recognizes Councillor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, been listening to you for the last couple of um, departments, Mr. Mason. And here's this is the area where I kind of say um, there's an increase here um, on the long-term bonds. It's gone from the budgeted 7.8 million dollars in 2021 to to 10.187, an increase of 2.37 million dollars. Um, previous year, year 2020 to 2021, it's 7.2, and then it jumps up to 7.8, which is kind of like a uh, maybe five, uh, maybe five hundred thousand dollars, and then it, now it jumps up 2.37. What is what is that for? Why is that an increase of 2.37? Um, council, a lot of that um, has to do with some of the new buildings, but the predominant amount of that is the diff. And um, as this body is well aware of during tax rate season, we charge off that debt payment to the DIF. So how our accounting system works when it comes to this type of tax is that the general fund appropriates it. And then during the tax rate, this body that so chooses to votes to charge some of that expense or all the DIF debt expense to the DIF fund. I believe this year it's going to be approximately three, uh, about 3.1 million. Um, I would, I, I would respectfully ask that I can, uh, if given the opportunity, I can clarify that number uh, for you. If you could, Eric, uh, Ms. Mason, uh, just for the public, for the folks that don't necessarily know what a DIF is, or can you just explain how the different district uh, improvement financing fund that we have in the downtown, can you articulate the exact reasoning um, behind where the DIF is going to pay that back in the tax rate? Can, can you articulate that Absolutely. for the folks uh, that don't fully understand that? 
Yeah, I'll absolutely try to articulate it. That's never been my specialty, Councillor. Um, so how it works is that um, in 2006, the city got approval from the state under Chapter 40Q, which is a part of the law that you know allows the city to use, and not just city of Quincy, this is a program that's throughout the state, um, to use a special, uh, a special financing vehicle. What it does is it freezes, it freezes property values at 2006 in the downtown, in the diff district. And what it does is it says, okay, this area, we're going to grow it at the exact same rate the rest of the city's growing. And then any growth above what the rest of the city got for growth, that can be used to pay debt service for capital improvements and capital management and development of assets in that diff district or uh you know, adjacent that may feed into that district. So what the DIF does is it allows us to take the property value in the downtown to use the nomenclature. Um, it get, it's tax base. The tax base does grow, the, just like the rest of the re, just like the rest of the city. It's not like it's frozen at 2006. It just grows at the baseline for the rest of the city. Then any extenuated um, property tax growth, that difference between the two is used to support debt service. Okay, just a little step further, Eric, and I, I asked you about this previously in, in previous meetings. Where are we at for percentages in our long-term debt? Uh, so right now, after we adjust for the diff, um, we're going to be at approximately 6.75%. 6 6.75. What, what were we at? 6.75. What were we at last year? I believe we were at 6.56, Councilor. And I, I will be clarifying statistics. Do you have an idea of what we were in 2020? Um, I do not have to talk to so something I feel confident okay, so about disclosing. A little bit of an increase. Do you think, anticipating the bonding that's happened in the last, I guess, a uh, few months, do you anticipate that hitting the 7% par next year? Uh, personally, I don't, because a lot of, we have considerable amount of debt falling off in the next three years. Um, okay. Uh, we, we did a refinancing action in 2005. We, we refinanced uh, 2005 debt um, about 10, 15 years ago. And that is getting ready to, to fall off. So you consolidated so you consolidated some debt, and then it's it's going to fall off. Do you, do you roughly have a per amount of, of um, millions? Do you have an, a, a how much? Um, if I, if I'm allowed to be broad, I believe it's about three to four million dollars um, net over the next three years. So about a million dollars a year, which correlates to about twenty to thirty million dollars in new projects on top of what the the growth range would be. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to kind of clarify it. Um, the diff plays another ball game, and you you clarified it for me. So thank you, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Council. All set, Council. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chair recognizes President Liang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Eric, I wasn't going to ask this because you answered the question already, but now I have a follow up to it. The debt to budget ratio you said is six point seven five right now, and the cap uh, based on financial models should be around seven, right? Uh, when did we do that? Seven and a half. When did we um, last put together that financial? It wasn't a financial model. What was it? The, the financial policy for the city? Yes. When was it um, that we put that together? Do you remember? That was shortly after I joined. I believe it was in 2016. And that's only for general fund supported debt. Okay. And then do you know roughly um, how frequently that should be updated? Just because that's, that was always sort of my baseline. And I feel like over the years it has changed. Um, I think when we first put that together, um, the percentage of debt that we were aiming to keep around having with respect to the total of the budget request was, I think, lower than seven and a half percent. So it's obviously grown over the years, right? I'm just wondering if it's, um, it would certainly be helpful for me if we prudent to do another financial model, you know, at this point in the game too, just um, especially with the larger bond that just got taken out, the pension bond, you know, um, do you think that would be something that would be useful for us just to again, reestablish what a good baseline would be? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think policy review and procedure review is always important when it comes to kind of these large, long-term financial procedures. Absolutely. Okay. And then um, what what makes the, the range increase every year? Uh, because again, I think when we first established the range, it was a lot low. I think it was, and my memory is so off right now, but five to maybe six, six and a half percent. So it's already increased a whole percentage rate at this point. The, the uh, financial policies were uh, between six and seven and a half percent. That's what uh, was voted upon by this body. And uh, the range is because in, um, investors of Quincy debt don't want to see our debt fall below a certain level because mm -hmm. that usually correlates with uh, asset depreciation. Um, and obviously, you don't want to climb too high because that correlates to debt burden. So it's almost like flying a plane. you got to hit the right speed in between there. 
Uh, S and P does recommend, and our financial advisors do recommend staying above six percent. And uh, this body deliberated for seven and a half percent. So the that's where those numbers come from. And, and it's tied to budgetary growth, which is always uh, always an, uh, an aspect of whenever we talk about these numbers is that the budget's projected to grow at a certain percentage. When it doesn't grow at a certain percentage, that can distort that number too. Okay. All right. So that's seven and a half and increase over time. I mean, it hasn't increased over time. Um, it can increase in total do- like real, like total dollar amount because it's seven and a half percent of a bigger budget. But in budget, well, I mean, as far as what we want to stay in a range on, we can see that range growing above seven and a half percent, right? Uh, Long term debt projections don't show it's going above seven and a half percent. Okay. All right. And then, um, so the question I actually did have, though, is for the, the 9.5 for the pension obligation funds, like you had said at the beginning of this, right? That's an estimate right now. We don't know what the exact number is going to be until we actually go and bond out and see what the interest rate looks like. But you know, I imagine that that's going to happen after this budget is approved. So just logistically, how is this going to work if the first payment comes in and it's either over or under the nine, you know, 9.5 million? Could you just explain both scenarios for me? Just again, logistically, what, what is going to happen? So if it's over that amount, uh, we'd be back in front of this body requesting an appropriation for it. If it's under, um, that money would just fall into the end of year surplus. Okay. And uh, do you know roughly when we would know what that amount, the final amount looks like? Um, Conservatively, late July, early August. Uh, But again, conservatively, uh, we we have to better understand the the bonding schedule for now that the POB is approved, we can now start talking about uh, like real dates as we move forward. Okay. It'd be really helpful if we can know uh, what the exact amount is once you find out. Absolutely, Councilor. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilor Palmucci, then Councilor Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Eric, you said the debt ratio only applies to general fund um, debt. So what other debt is there? Are you just talking about the oh, DIF? Oh, there's DIF, there's hotel motel, uh, there's CPC debt. Uh, those, are your, those are your three big ones. Um, I, I, those are the ones I'm most familiar with, and I believe those the, may be the only ones. And there's also water and sewer debt. Water and sewer debt is not included in this either, uh, but the body does vote on um, long-term and short-term debt within those individual enterprise funds. All right. And do we have a? Do we try and maintain the same fiscal policy of uh, 7% debt in those uh, budgets? In the water and sewer enterprise fund, that's actually really interesting. Depending on who you talk to, the, uh, the University of Maryland, they do a, like an awesome study on this. It, it's different for different parts of the country. Older cities, which I think Quincy would apply as, who have aging infrastructure, it's actually encouraged to have a, a higher debt to budget ratio because that's the more you replace old pipes, the less you're going to have to appropriate for lost water. So the logic there is you're, you're saving money in the capital investment because you're not having all this unbuilt water, which eventually should be built to users. Um, the hotel motel tax, the, there's no general guidance on those type of special revenue accounts. Um, it's really, uh, what it really comes down to is kind of that long-term stability of the funds, um, which again is is not doesn't have the same um, industry consensus that right. we do stuff like this. Because it's not like everywhere has the CPA. I mean, it's yeah. not as well studied as a sewer department. Okay, so um, I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna use this area to kind of express some frustration with spending out of the diff because this is where we're. Uh, essentially paying for the diff um, or offsetting the diff later on, but this is where the money comes from. So the so the city council had specifically uh, in the last couple authorizations um, for the diff, I think it was 80 and 61 million, 80 million and 61 million. And, and just to be clear, we're talking about $182 million debt in the diff, right? Yeah, 182, 181, I believe. Yeah. And what's the total debt that the city carries? Long-term debt? Is, uh, the diff is long-term debt, right? Uh, no, some of it's short-term debt, some of it's long-term. We, we do have a gross debt figure, um, and I believe it's around $540 million, and that includes the debt. So we, we look at uh, uh, overall outstanding authorization. That's the um, industry metric we use, so everybody's kind of talking about the same amount. Okay. So when you talk about gross debt of $500 million, you're including the 182 from um, from DIF. Correct. All right, so that's um, and that's 
about 36 percent. You know, it's a little bit more than a third of what the total gross debt is is coming from the DIF. So, I mean, I think that's important to understand because, right, we're talking about, you know, I'm not one to say I've approved a lot of this. Um, I voted in favor of a lot of this borrowing, and I, and I, and I stand by it. I don't. I think borrowing is good. It's um, it's the only way you're going to do big things, right? We're never going to save up enough money to build a school. You know, we're never going to save up enough money to build a new fire station or you know things like that. And and they need to be done. We can't as a municipality let our infrastructure, our buildings uh, crumble. And you know, it's just, it's not good for a city. So you have to use debt. Right. It's about how you use debt and making sure that the debt that you use, um, you can afford, essentially. Uh, and, and I think, you know, this body's adopted those fiscal policies that we want to stay right around 7 percent. And we've done that. And I think it was like maybe five, six years ago. I don't know that we did that. And, and we've, we've done that. We've increased the debt, but we've increased it to a level that we all agreed upon made financial sense. So so I'm comfortable with debt in general. Um, what I'm uncomfortable with about debt. And the way in which the administration has used debt is when they put salaries in, in employees on to a bond, right? That because you're essentially the bond is like a, a, a credit card, right? You don't, you know, you don't pay your bills with a credit card unless you're in complete financial, you know, straits. You don't you don't pay your bills with a credit card. You buy something big that you can't afford in a lump sum so that you can pay it out over time, right? So it's fine for building a school, building a police station, uh, animal shelter, wh what have you. But when we when we have you know salaries and payroll coming off of debt, we're paying interest on that, uh, and it's very frustrating to me. And the, the administration has continued to use the DIS fund um, as a as a source of uh, of um, I don't know, I guess revenue, but it's a source of monies to con continue to add people to the payroll, like we see with the um, um, the asset manager, right? The strategic, uh, the capital assets manager started off on GIF. So that's no, that's, that's with no authorization from the council. It's no vote from the council. That's not even us being notified that they're being put on that. Um, that position is paid out of that. And then it gets, and then it gets switched over to federal money. And then now the first time we see it is after someone's been on the job for six months, um, that it comes to the, to the budget. So I guess what my question here is, I made my point in, in, in how I feel about it. My question is, how many positions do we have that we're paying for out of DIF? Because the way I look at it, there's um, the capital assets manager, which just came off of DIF um, a month ago, right? 521, May 21st, they, they, they came off of, uh, that position came off of DIF, moved over to the COVID money, and then we're looking July 1st to move it over to general, to general fund. Um, there's the engineering manager uh, out of the planning department, the director of institute relations out of the mayor's office, the capital assets manager, uh, as I said, financial office, um, the downtown events coordinator out of the planning department, and then the engineering, again, the engineering man manager in the planning department. So there were four. Um, I added an amendment to our diff bond, to the diff bond requests that, and I'm looking at them right now, that the, that the council passed saying that we weren't going, because I expressed this issue three bonds ago that we weren't going to any more fund positions, new positions, create new positions out of DIF because we don't, we don't as a policy and the council supported this, we don't as a policy want to be borrowing money to pay today's salaries. Um, it's short-sighted and it's far more expensive than simply take, you know, taking it on, on the payroll onto the general, onto the general, um, um, the general fund. So, up until May 21st, there were four positions being paid through the DIF. The uh, amendments that, that I made and were approved by this body to the DIF said that there would be no new positions created, uh, that we would only keep the two existing, which was the engineering manager uh, and the special counsel. And so despite that, the administration has hired a director of institute relations, um, a capital asset manager, and a downtown events coordinator. Uh, which exceed what what this body has authorized them to do. So um, I guess to you, what what can I do as a city councilor right now? Um, and can I do anything by way of cutting this line that would prevent additional payroll expenditures out of the DIF account? Is there anything? I mean, could I 
could I add up these, these salaries that I'm looking at here? This, you know, it's uh, payroll looks like it's um, the weekly payroll is $3,887. So why do I calculate that out uh, for a year, you know, times 52. And then I cut that, cut that from this budget to send the message that we don't want to be paying salaries, new salaries out of this. I, I can opine on that. This is a question about what the action do would cut, but I defer to solicitor Tim. No, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't want to hear. Uh, but go uh, ahead. No, tell me what you think. If you were to cut this, this is specific to debt service. And under uh, national law, we, regardless of when the debt payment comes in, we have to pay it. So it wouldn't have any net effect to the, to the specifically related to operations within the debt. Okay. So we'd have to pay it anyways. People will get paid. Debts will be honored. Debt right? will get paid, yes. Okay. With that being said, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to move that we cut $202,164.56 from this line. I'll give you that number again. Uh, and the point is to send a message to the administration that when this when this body puts in an amendment that says you can't hire new people out of um, out of borrowed money from the diff, that we mean it because they're doing it anyway. So that number is moved to cut this line item by two hundred and two thousand one hundred and sixty four and fifty six cents, and that's the weekly salary um, over the course of a year for those positions. And uh, Councillor, uh, what line are you looking at? Oh, I have no idea whatever budget we're on. Well, we got a few lines here. Maybe I'll refer it to Mr. Mason. If the cut was going to be made, what, what line on the long-term debt service? Is, uh, is it spread out? Over, is it is it in a particular line or is it? Uh, 590103. 590103. Say that again. Okay. 590103. It's the second line on the Long-term other. I got you. <clears throat> okay, so a motion. Um, let me recognize Mr. Walker real quick. He's going to stand up and and then I'll go to uh, Mrs. Mahoney and, and Councillor Kane. What are you, Mr. Chairman? I, I obviously defer to that there were a couple of councils that had their hand up before I did. I'm, I, I can speak oh. uh, to the Okay. End. All right. I'll go to Mrs. Mahoney, then Councillor Kane. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to tap into a little bit of what um, Mr. Pum Council Pumbucci was saying. Um, the the other thing that's happening that's even more frustrating is it starts <clears throat> it starts in the dip and then it moves now that we have the um, forty six million dollars in COVID money the the actual person that's in the uh, mayor's office which is the director of institutional relationships getting paid one hundred twenty five thousand dollars is being paid out of the COVID money now and the downtown event coordinators being paid out of the COVID money now too but more importantly none of these jobs again have been posted. They haven't been brought before the city council. They're being hit, they're being, they start in the diff and they moved into the COVID money. They're basically being hidden. And um, in, again, I'm going to go back to the transparency of this budget and the fact that the chief financial officer, when I asked him um, if he knew about it, he said he didn't. And that's really troublesome to me. But I'm going to move on from that. And I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, about two other things. Last year, when we talked about the diff, the diff was broken out a little bit differently. The diff used to have a separate account and now, um, the way the, the budget has been kind of operating a little bit differently and the expenses are kind of spread out throughout the whole, um, the whole budget. So we really can't see where the money from the diff is being spent and what department, how it's being spent. And the diff is supposed to be spent, is supposed to be paid off from the downtown. Um, and now it's kind of being all combined into one big thing, which is just, um, which is our debt service. So, you know, the general public, when they're looking at that, it looks like, you know, from West Quincy, from Ward 4, Brian is paying for um, the diff is supposed to be from the downtown. So I'm going to move on to the pension obligation bond. So, um, Mr. Mason, you had said that 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 number nine point five million dollars is conservative. Is that what you said? Yes, I did, Councilor. Okay, and it's based. Is that nine point five million dollars based on thirty years? Um, it, I believe the thirty year bond would be like eight point eight million. So it's based, I guess, a little north. Uh, the term is a little south of thirty years. Okay, so. In 30 years, based on two at that 8.8, .8, is that based at two? What percentage is that based at? Uh, 2.75%, I believe, Councilor. 2.75. So, when I was looking at your spreadsheet, though, you were given the bonds for a whole year, and it looked like it was 10 million. And from the, I don't have it in front of me, but two, it, 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 you had two, two and a half, two and a quarter for the 30 year. That first line was like half of what it would be next year, correct? It didn't say 8.8. .8. It didn't say 8.8. .8. 
and it didn't say 9.5, I thought it said 10, but I don't have it in front of me, so I apologize. I don't, I don't either, counselor. Okay, so, so it didn't say eight, and it, they're saying 2.75, I, 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 I might have to go look for it. But on the other side, that if it's a shorter bond, because the, the way that it was, I think, uh, amended, it said it would be anywhere from 21 to no more than 30 years. So if it was, hopefully it'll be a 21-year bond. Um, are you suggesting that we'll still be in that range of 9.5, potentially? I could potentially say that, yes. Um, but I'm sure Cinder would be a better person to pine on this, but your first year debt, this isn't like a traditional yeah, amortized debt. Um, it, it has non-uniform payment. So usually your first year payment is considerably lower. So t so if it's a shorter term, so like, and, and that's what I'm trying to get up. So if it's a short, short term, like our first year debt's going to be substantially lower because it's only based on, you know, if we were to do it July 1st, it would be six months of the year, but it will get hopefully bonded and locked and loaded sometime, I think, Mr. Walker was saying after it gets past the state, you know, maybe but sometime like August, September timeframe. So you're talking about like four months, right? Or you're talking about the whole year. Are you talking about the whole year? So it would be it would be for the, that amount would be for the the first year payment on the bond, which is likely to probably be about six to eight months of accrued. Six to eight months, okay. So then next year, what would your what's your anticipation for next year? Like would it be double that or do you Yeah, just, I would say double that or increase it. Uh, not double, maybe like increase it by seven point five million. All right. So then my other question is, is so similar to when we talked about, because this is now, this is a debt obligation because it got it, this is a bond that, that got approved. Um, but in that bond, we have Quincy College and we have Quincy Housing Authority. Um, so will those be, how will those be handled and will they be broken out? Like in the Quincy Retirement Board, they separated it out. And they kind of showed what Quincy, the city of Quincy pension obligation was and what Quincy College pension obligation was and what Quincy Housing Authority's pension obligation was for those portions. How will we as a city see those payments come in from those two, two other entities? All right. Uh, so while the number in the, in the financial state, in the um, actuary statement included Quincy Housing Authority, when the bond goes to market, it will only be bonded for the Quincy College and city portion. Um, I will, I, I'm not, I don't know how Quincy College will contribute to that. I'm assuming they can go back to their previous styles of transfers in. Um, I would, that's an administrative function, an executive function. So I would defer to Chris Walker if he has insight on that. Um, um, okay. So, so I guess, you know, just like the diff, you know, I would, I, I get concerned with the way the diff is being show, shown here because we had it separated last year. We, and the I idea that the diff is being paid for out of, you know, out of, you know, the downtown and it's kind of being scattered throughout the different departments, it feels like this time. So I'm concerned about the pension obligation bond to make sure, you know, whether or not, if, you know, if the city decides to make a, a, a decision like they did with um, the insurance and they don't come to us and tell that, I think we should be accounting for how much should be being paid out of Quincy College and keeping that completely substantially separate. I think you'd agree with me that's a cleaner way to do your accounting. We have, Quincy, even though Quincy College is a department, you know, a quasi department, it's substantially separate from the city of Quincy. Um, and we would want to keep those numbers separate. I, especially considering, um, you know, Quincy College is on record saying that they're no longer having any financial difficulties. They're out of the woods. Um, and that's, you know, that's concerning to me because the taxpayers of the city of Quincy has picked up a lot of their health care. And I do not want to see them picking up in this pension obligation bond the amount that they should be uh, reimbursing the city. Um, because they do, unlike any other department, um, they do charge fees for people to go to school at Quincy College, which inherently um, creates a income for them. And if they make if they make a profit, they should be and they are they are making and they're in financial good stability. They should be reimbursing like they have the agreement to do for their health care and for their pension obligations. Um, so that's my statement there. So I think that should be broken out. But again, I will I am um, actually agree very much with. Councilor Pamlucci that we shouldn't be hiding. And I'm very troubled by the fact that we have people um, that are being paid in bonds, getting paid at a high interest for salaries. And not only that, but they're, they're employees of the city. So they're getting health care and um, insurance and, and pension and for paying, for pay, it's like paying your salary on a credit card. It's very dangerous. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Let me go to Councilor Kane and then I'll go to Mr. Walker. Councilor? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you. Good evening, Eric. How are you doing? Good evening, Councilor. Um, so I certainly appreciate the 
uh, the message that Councilor Pomochi wants to send. I support it, um, especially because it has to do with with policies that we've you know either enacted or supported. Um, but my question comes around. So when you are moving uh, money to apply for positions across departments from other pockets of uh, funds, in this case, DIF funds, um, do you solicit an opinion on this, on the legalities uh, of those movements? Um, generally speaking, yes. I, I do. Uh, I talk to our outside auditor quite frequently. On so very- an, an auditor is not a legal body or a legal, you know, authority. So is there, is there like a, you know, considering these are governed under ordinances that, that we approve, um, do you, do you have to get solicitor approval or outside counsel for any reason? Um, I, for budgetary movements like that, I, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm unaware if that's necessary to do. And, and I, I mean, with all due respect, I would defer to Walker, uh, chief of staff Walker, solicitor Timmons, if that is the process that should be followed. Yeah, if, if Solicitor Timmons is available, I'd love to just dive into this a little bit because I'd like to support this cut, but I want to understand sort of the mechanics here that are going on. So we're moving money from one place to the next. Um, we've got I've got colleagues who uh, don't want to see this happening, but I just want to understand, can this happen? But moreover, uh, if there are policies that are expressed by the city council, it, who who enforces those when they go awry? <laughs> Right. So, you know, what essentially what's the point of our making policy, uh, you know, changes that would govern uh, fiscal decisions if if they're not enforced? Um, To the extent that's directed at me, I have not previously worked on this issue or these matters. Um, As as you know, most of the downtown work has been handled by Councilor Geary, with the exception of real estate things, uh, matters that I've I've got involved in. But I'm certainly happy to look into it with you. I know that Mr. Mason and I frequently, um, you know, when questions arise, we either go to bond council or we go to, as um, as Mr. Mason said, the the auditor, Jim Powers. While you're correct. Uh, Councilor Kane, that um, Powers is not a lawyer, he's an auditor. Um, his expertise is such that I'd accept what he had to say over most lawyers. But we generally do go to bond council as well. And I'm happy to follow up and review with those people. But um, thus far, that's not been a particular role that I've played. So I'm sorry I can't be more helpful tonight. No, that's all right. I mean, I just want to understand the ramifications of this cut. So yeah, sure, we can make a cut, but I want to understand you could probably just make this decision or take money from elsewhere so the cut would be moot and the message would not be, uh, you know, really understood. So, um, I, you know, somebody could have an answer so we could have a better informed decision on this uh, on this motion that's been made that would be useful. Um, and in the absence of that, uh, you know, I don't I don't necessarily I, I see Council Prime with his hand going up. If he has something to find on this, I'd love to hear it. I'll check Council Kane. For now. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank Council you. Council Palmucci. Yeah, I just wanted to um Council Kane makes a really good point in, in a broader sense in terms of um, enforcement of, of council um, edicts, if you will. So I would just repose the question to Solicitor Timmons and say, say it doesn't have to do with the diff. Say it has to do with anything else. What's the right. You know, where, where's that line? How is it enforced? I mean, I remember going looking out this. for us. <laughs> right. I remember going through this when we when the planning director was fired um, and it said only the city council can remove the planning director. And ultimately, the issue didn't come to a head. But so, uh, Mr. Timmons, what you know, what say you if same scenario, say it's a pension obligation bond and we put in a some sort of amendment in there that says you can't hire someone using this bond that we passed, you know, last week or whatever, or this week, whenever it was. Um, and then the administration does, or how does it go about doing that? I mean, who's, who's advising? Well, first of all, if there's a contingency in a bond, then an administration has to honor that contingency. Um, and in terms of enforcement, uh, I, I think it would be brought through the city council oversight and the question would be raised. But that's purely a hypothetical, I, I trust, 
you would agree, Councilor Palmucci and Councilor Kane, because that's not what I think is going on here. I think what's happened is that um, that the activity and actions that have been taken have been part of uh, a process where this whole district increment financing process and the things that, that go along with it, um, we needed to do a lot of ramp up to have personnel deal with the downtown development. And as uh, pretty much everyone here would know and probably agree to, with the exception of Somerville, I'm not aware of any community in Massachusetts that's been as aggressive in terms of development uh, projects. So it's a little bit of, uh, you know, gray in terms of experience, but I'm sure if we were to look, we could find the, uh, the proper guidelines. But it does come back to a few fundamentals. Um, one is that the council through its oversight could review what's going on. And then um, certainly, you know, if I were to find something that was not proper, then I would render an opinion to that effect. And I, I know from my dealings with the mayor over more than a decade now that the mayor is uh, extremely responsive when I address issues to him of concern. Um, he wants to do things, but he wants to do them the right way. So um, to the extent there were any future issues or questions, we would jump right into them and then report back. Thank you. All set, Council Palmucci. I am. Thank you. Okay. I, I, I actually have a, a couple of questions, if I could. Um, I don't know if it's with Mr. Walker or Mr. Mason in regards to this. The positions that Council Palmucci talks about, um, and we rattled off a few, uh, are all predominantly supporting downtown initiatives. Is that correct to say, I guess, Mr. Walker? That is correct, sir. And and um, so they're tied into the scheme of things in regards to downtown. They're not they're not elsewhere, they're not, you know, park and rack, DPW, whatever, they're concentrated on the downtown. So I, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. The second thing, Eric, I I uh, Mr. Mason, I I think you said that. Regardless if there's a cut, I mean, it's almost like paying your mortgage. You're going to get that mortgage bill anyhow, and you're going to have to pay it. Correct. That's uh, true with all that service counselor. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so we had a most up oh, Councilor DeBona. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just um, for clarification, those four positions, are they still being funded through the DIF? Or are they still being funded for FY22 starting July 1st? What's the... Simulation on that. As of May twenty eighth, as of May twenty eighth, there's only two positions remaining on the diff, which were the two approved that the council knew about approved. and had previously approved, which is special counsel and the en engineering manager. Uh, yeah, let me so, recognize, counselor. Let me recognize um, Mr. Walker for a second. He had his hand up. I don't know if he was going to say the same thing as Council yeah. Palmucci. Through, through you, Mr. Chairman, I was I was going to say that, but also I just wanted to note a, a couple quick things, if I could, um, that. Um, you're right, Councillor McCarthy. Um, this cut would be largely a, a message uh, and symbolic in nature. Um, the debt service is the debt service number. That number has to be paid. Um, and it doesn't implicate any uh, specific budgetary positions because the positions that have been discussed by the council tonight are not within the budget. They're not funded by uh, the general operating budget. Uh, to the larger point of uh, what was in the order and what would be allowed and not allowed under the bonding order. We're happy to, to take a look at that uh, and review our policies and procedures. Uh, I will say just a point of clarification relative to um, how the diff is broken out. Um, two years ago, um, we did uh, file with this, with this body uh, a separated diff budget that included uh, salaried positions so it showed uh, where, you know, with an offset from diff revenue, um, we hope to revisit that again uh, with this body. Uh, at, uh, if you, to everyone who was here at that time, recall, um, there was a, a, a good deal of discussion about that. Uh, it was the, the sense of the body that while the positions we um, 
proposed were necessary uh, at that time that the body felt, and as it is in today's budget, it's felt seven that o'clock. So, thank you, Solicitor Timmons, for the time check. Um, the body felt that those positions should be baked into the uh, regular budget uh, and not necessarily outside of uh, outside of that in a in a separate separate budget. I think some of these issues uh, could be addressed uh, if uh, the body would be willing to entertain that. Uh, perhaps next year with a, a discussion with the mayor and, and uh, move forward in that way. Um, that being said, um, again, I just want to reiterate that the body did support the creation of a number of downtown positions um, through past budgets. And the sense of the body was not to break it out, but to include it, bake them in to existing departmental budgets. Um, thank you, Mr. Um, get, Walker. Let me I could, back Mr. To Chairman, get back to Mr. Yeah, just Okay, yep. I'll go back to you, uh, Councilor DeBona, and then Councilor Phelan. Okay. Go right ahead. Um, just, just real quick, just on Councilor Palmucci's cut, he says 202, $202,164. That was for, for those two positions. Is that correct? That were put into the diff, just for clarification purposes? No, I didn't have them broken out, so it was for all four. Knowing that it's a symbolic cut, I just cut off for it. Madam Auditor can probably answer where those positions are now and how much they are, but the information I had just showed that it was thirty-eight eighty-four per week. So that was the only way I could come up with the number. If I could, I'd like to get some clarification from uh, our Madam Auditor, if I could, um, just because it, it, for me, it's it's and it gets gets back to a whole different variety of issues going on as a city council. But remember, folks. We're up here for a reason. We're the checks and balances of the mayors and the administration. At some point, and I, I think we can strike five votes at any time, it's becoming a city council again. And I haven't felt this way since 2016 when we had Joe Finn on the council. And that very first year, we were able to cut things. But you can never muster up those five votes. you know. And I, I, think, I think we're in a position to do that right now. And um, for us, I think it's the checks and balances of the city. Um, the folks put us in here and they elect us in here to be that. So for me, it's more on principle and it's more on um, you were getting back to Council Pamucci's cut previously was a tick for tat. So you were getting rid of a position, but you were adding a position. So you were getting rid of, uh, rid of the, the economist position, but you were adding the strategic as asset manager. And I think in, in, in upcoming budgets, you will see a lot of that happening where tick for tat, I'm going to get rid of a position, but I'm going to add a position. So it's gonna it's gonna balance out in, in price. So I'm I'm debating on this cut, to be honest with you. I I I like transparency. I want to make sure that the city council is the transparent body for the mayor and the administration. I know that this body has looked to fund other positions for other things, and sometimes we don't get what we want. So there has to be there has to strike a balance amongst us and the mayor and what we're all trying to accomplish here. But at the end of the day, I mean, talk about being on the ballot. We're all on the ballot this year. So we kind of have to answer to the folks this year. Um, so for me, sometimes I'm like, wait a minute. If it's clear and it's cut and it's 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 my fellow counselors have found it, I have to make a decision on what I'm going to do. So I need clarification, if I could, Madam Auditor, about that. Thank you, Councilor. Uh um, currently, from what I can see, there are three employees being paid out of the DIF. Um, two are being paid out of the DIF three, and one is being currently paid out of the DIF two, and that is as of the 625 payroll. Okay, is is um, is Council Pamucci's um, numbers fairly uh, accurate, 202,164? Uh, what I'm showing is I'm showing there is a salary of $65,000 being paid out of DIF 2, and I'm showing there's a salary of 90662 being paid out of DIF 3, along with another salary of 111501 being paid out of DIF 3. So if I add those three figures together, I come up with 267164 I'll accept that as a friendly amendment, Mr. DeBoner, if you'd like to make it. I'd rather you make I'd rather you make the motion if you want to withdraw and re resubmit it. Um 
I'm still debating on whether I'm going to cut or not. And um, I want to hear from my other fellow counselors first, but I'm pretty close, Mr. Uh, Council Pamuji. All set, Council? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Council Phelan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess this question would be for uh, Eric. Um, basically, if we make this cut where this is debt service, we really aren't able to make the cut. Is that what you're saying? Um, what is, uh, we cut it down to $202,000. Yeah, uh, so what would, what would happen from a per, from procedural standpoint for finance is that um, this probably wouldn't happen until based on the level of the cut relative to our upcoming debt payments. What would happen is this account would go into deficit probably in June of next year. And then we would either see a year in transfer occur like we did uh, on Monday night, or the body did on Monday night, I should say. And then, uh, or if the body chooses not to do that action, it would just cut into the city's projected surplus or create a uh, fund balance deficit at the end of next year. Uh, but Masters of General Law, does specify the city must pay its debt payments, um, even if the funds aren't in that account. So this this wouldn't affect anyone who's currently in a position? We wouldn't be cutting a position or anything like that? Um, my opinion is no, it would not be. Okay, so we're basically um, looking to have things that, that have already been decided on by the council that we get advance notice when people hire. So, uh, I, I don't see a big problem with that. And, um, and realizing that there's probably other room for savings in this account and everything like that, that, um, that I, looking at it, I, I would support this cut or by Council of And um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Con uh, Chair recognizes President Liang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not going to sit here and pontificate, so I'll be really brief. Um, Eric, when you said uh, the other day when we were looking at the payment for the bond, right, it was a range of anywhere from eight to $10 million, right? So there's a good chance that we could be a million dollars under or we could be $1.5 million over, correct? But we're sticking with the 9.5 on this at the end of the day. And the cut is being made to the bottom line of this, not to any one specific line item, essentially, right? Logistically, I'm saying. Yes, logistically, based on how it's accounts okay. so. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't interrupt. I just, there was a little bit of a lag. Um, so, you know, again, when I asked you earlier about the two scenarios, right, if $9.5 million is under what we need, you said the next step would be that you'd have to come in front of us to ask for the additional amount to pay back or to make that first payment on the bond, correct? Correct, counsel. But if we're, if the, if the first payment comes back and it's under, then again, we're going to have a $1.5 million overage, right? Correct, counsel. Okay, so there's already been a bit of a buffer. There's a 50-50 there's a chance we're already looking at a $1.5 million buffer, right? So I just want to clarify that, like a $267,000 cut, I think, to Councilor Pamucci's point, is, you know, for me, reasonably, it makes sense. You know, I think that this uh, sets forth a whole larger conversation that I think all of us, um, from the sounds of it, are interested in having moving forward. But again, logistically, then, looking at this, right, there's a good chance that cutting $267,000, well, there's a 50-50 chance we have $1.5 million to play with anyways. So... With that, I'm comfortable with those odds, and you know, I'd be more than comfortable moving forward to support that cut. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, President Liang. Um, back to Councilor DeBona, real quick. Thank, thank you, um, Chairman McCarthy. This is what I'm going to do. I'll take the friendly amendment from Councilor Pamuchi and cut two hundred sixty-seven thousand one sixty-four point thirty-five. Is that correct, Madam Auditor? Yes, it is. I'll, I'll go with the friendly amendment to cut that. I'll put that in the form of motion or friendly amendment. Okay, friendly Council amendment Palmucci, motion. Uh, okay, Council Palmucci, I'll go with that. Yep, I accept. Okay, Thank you. Um, with that, we have a motion um, amended by Council DeBona to cut 267164.35 cents from 590103, the principal long term uh, bond line. Right before we do a roll call, I just want to. Just comment a little bit. Um, I too agree with Council Palmucci and Council Kane on tightening up, you know, the communication. But um, the diff area, the downtown area, those positions, as Mr. Walker had stated, were floated out in front of us. And um, 
it was part of a, it's part of kind of a unique, I know that the dip's been around now for a while, but kind of a unique little entity down there where uh, we're trying to, uh, both the council and the administration trying to do their best to make sure that the downtown um, stays up to speed, stays maintenance wise and engineered wise with all the wonderful improvements that are out there. But um, hopefully, as Mr. Walker said, we can sit down and talk a little bit more about protocol and procedure a little bit and when, when situations like this arise. So with that, uh, Jen, will you call a roll? Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. Yes. Chairman McCarthy. Yes. Nine members passes. Thank you. We need to vote on it as amended. Oh, yes. Um, do I get a motion? Um, motion. To, motion to vote on as amended. Motion to approve as amended. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 And the, the ayes have it. Is that okay, Ms. Manning? I don't on that one, Dave, because I don't support the, I, don't, I didn't support the um, pension obligation one. So, no. Sorry. Thank you, Council. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, next up, Eric, uh, short-term debt. Uh, so this reflects the interest that the city pays on bands or the bond anticipation notes that the city uses to finance most of its projects, uh, including the debt that was just discussed. Um, it decreased uh, about $2 million this year. Um, that's because we were able to take advantage of some of the just incredibly like generationally low interest rates for long-term debt, and we accelerated some purchases. Um, in order, uh, not purchases, I'm sorry, accelerated some bonding for uh, previously voted on purchases at a much lower interest rate than we were projected. And this is also Sterling Middle School, I'm uh, sorry, Southwest Middle School. Um, those bands that were floating out there when we were going through MSBA approval, now the MSBA has closed on that and they you know, funded the city in excess of 60%, 70% of the project. We no longer need to have those bands out there and they've collapsed. Thanks, Eric. Uh, any questions, uh, Councilor DeMona? Just um, happy to see a discount here. Um, you know, a two two million dollar discount, two million dollar decrease here from twenty one to FY twenty two, Mr. Mason. Um, can you tell us what our our bands are going at right now for the interest? It, we just went to market today, um, and it was 0.144 percent. So fourteen basis. One point four four point one four four percent. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for giving us some savings here. Um, um, with that, um, motion to approve. Motion to approve by Council DeMona. On the motion, anyone else? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Um, appreciate all the work. I think we all do. Um, you uh, do a great job. And, um, Great addition uh, to the administration. Um, do a super job, Eric. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Uh, next up, Colleen Healy and the assessor's office. Hi, Colleen. Move approval. M motion to approve. Motion to approve by Council Palmucci on the motion. Uh, count, uh, President Liang. Thank you. Thank you to it. Um, I just had two questions uh, before I uh, go ahead and approve it as well. Colleen, um, there were two line items that I imagine, and I don't want to, I just want to make sure, right? There was the overtime one and then the travel in state. In the past, you've used pretty much close to what has been budgeted. And obviously, in the last two fiscal years, um, you weren't anywhere near that. And I imagine, again, it's because of what's been going on in the pandemic. I just want to make sure that is the case and that moving forward, um, as we're coming out of it, you do plan on using close to, again, what's being budgeted now. Yes, so definitely um, tons of our conferences and courses have been canceled, obviously, as a result of COVID. There's actually like two great conferences that go on for the assessors um, that normally we would be going to. Uh, so if we had gone to them, if they actually had happened, you know, that money would have been spent on that. And because there were courses that we didn't do, there were some dues and subscriptions that we didn't sign up for because you get discounts if you have a membership when you go to the conference. 
Okay. That makes, again, I, I assumed as much as this wanted to make sure, but, I, but I, like selective things that were, um, you know, being hosted, but some of my staff, um, just didn't feel comfortable going to, um, events just yet. So I'm assuming hopefully, um, you know, that everything will resume back to normal. No, that makes sense. And I mean, uh, between you and then John too, every time I have a conversation with either of the two of you, um, I learned so, so much about this process year in and year out. And so I know you take advantage of those conferences and what you learn from them. I'm excited to see you guys getting back to it, but I just want to make sure that that was the case. So thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, President Liang. <laughs> uh, the chair recognizes Councillor Phelan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the, uh, the, the head assessor. Uh, just a couple of questions, Colleen. I think you do a wonderful job down there and your staff is excellent. Whenever I've sent anyone down there, they're, they're very good, very professional, and they really know what they're doing. But, but a couple of questions. I know with COVID hitting and everything, um, do you have any plans at any point to go back out and do some of the seminars that you used to do? I mean, I actually attended one of you. It was when I was first elected. And it was yeah. probably one of the most helpful seminars I've been at. And I and the re, what came back, the feedback I got from the people who went to that over at the senior center was phenomenal. So I I think they were some of the most. It, it really laid it out for me, having been away from it for a little while. But are you planning on doing any of those? Yes. Um, yeah, and we're definitely open to you know even if you know you guys meeting the council, if you guys have ideas, um, you know if there's meetings that you're hosting even in your own. Um, you know, war that you would like us to attend, we'd be more than happy to. Um, you know, I, I believe it was Ian that did a couple that I know he had asked us to come to. And, you know, that's something we're definitely open to. And we did put together um, that, it was, I think the second or third year now, that Understanding Your Taxes publication, um, which I think is also very helpful, that is on the homepage of our website, um, of the assessor's page, and definitely, you know, have that be your go-to book when, you know, any of you counselors are getting questions that maybe, you know, you don't know the answer to right off the top of your head, but definitely point to that booklet. It has um, basically everything that our department does, and it's definitely laid out very straightforward, easy to read, as you can imagine, some of the state forms and so forth can be, you know, difficult to basically comprehend quickly, so. I keep a copy right in my desk here. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I bring it everywhere because I'm always pointing it to people. Look, go to this <laughs> page. And I guess another question I had, are we coming up to a reval year? Yes. Is this a reval year? So, um, fiscal year 2023 is a reval year. Um, so every five years, it's like an extensive audit with the Department of Revenue, um, which is why my budget reflects the funding I need for the reval because that work starts in fiscal year 22. Um, it'll start with a work plan with the um, Department of Revenue probably late this fall, early this winter. Yeah, that's something that we were, that it's a mixed blessing. Sometimes you bring in more money, but sometimes people pay more in taxes. So um, it's kind of a mixed blessing, I guess, on that. But uh, thank you. I thank you for your staff. Uh, nothing but great people working there. Highly professional, and they do a great job. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Council Phelan. Uh, anyone else uh, for Colleen? Any comments? Uh, just a quick. Oh, Mrs. Mahoney, go right. Council Mahoney, very, go right ahead. Thank you very much. Um, hi, Colleen. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, this is just a quick question, and I and it's just it's hard to tell like when our when when things come on. So, like when you know buildings come on and certain things. I know there's a kind of a delay as to when they actually. Um, what, what's the time frame typically? So like when new development comes on that once it's completely built and the permits are all done, then is it like the next year just to understand? Right. So for fiscal year, um, you know, by 22, which we're going into would be based off of what was there January 1st, 2021. However, we do, um, have a June 30th new growth date. So for example, for this fiscal year coming, um, you know, if, if the city hadn't adopted, um, and I actually have a law, um, section 40, chapter 653 of the acts of 1989, so if the city hadn't adopted that, basically next year's tax bill would be reflective of what was there as of January 1st, 2021. However, we adopted the section of the law that allows us to pick up that new growth. So we can pick up all the way until June 30th. 
up into June this year for next year's tax bill. And I know this is, this is going to be like a specific question, but I know I'm not even sure if this is if this is one because I know Cork had the designated port area and he built his um, Nissan. Part of it was mitigation to build it because it was a, it's a designated port area. Did that come on? To, is, is that now on our? Or is that now being taxed in the property assessment, or is that something that will come on later? So I would have to look at, I'd have to, you know, be yeah, I know you're not going to be able to look at some of the specific, but like, I guess it's just, and, the, and my other question that is like, so when development comes on, it has to be fully like the permitting and everything has to be completely signed off on before it actually comes onto our tax rolls. Is that true too? Like a new we, development? We pick up a percent complete. So regardless of whether a certificate of occupancy has been issued, we still pick up what was there as of June 30th. Okay. I was just curious because there's certain things like as you're looking at things and, and I, I don't know what the answers are for that. If, if it's something's done or not done. So I, mean, I really do appreciate the same thing that if you have to projects too, for sure. Okay. I mean, right now what's happening is we're, um, you know, from right now until the end of August is when we're um, going out on all our building permits because obviously we want to get as close to that June thirtieth date. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so if there were specific projects you had questions on, you know, I could definitely go over those with you. And then just one last really quick thing, just for people that might be watching, because then there's the people um, that. That might need that tax assistance. Once there, isn't there deadlines that come up right around? Is it the summer? So, so if you could just repeat that, it's important information for people at home. So, so definitely, again, going back to this understanding your taxes publication, um, in here it does talk about all of the property tax exemptions that the city has adopted. Um, we, what we do is we mail. We mail out, 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 out. Sorry, we're echoing here. We <laughs> mail out the clause exemptions to people that were granted, um, you know, for fiscal year twenty one. Um, but these exemptions are all on Sorry, I don't know why I'm echoing. So these exemptions are all on our website. Um, and if you call our office, we will happily mail one out to you. Um, and if somebody is unable to, um, you know, come to our office and wants to talk with somebody in person, we'll happily send one of our assessors to their property as well. Okay. And then I just let, this is something that you did help me with with somebody else. I think it was with their water bill. So that's a separate one. So, and you, you helped some people for me in the past for that, but that's a different department, right? So that's a different they If they need help with their water bill, they should get in touch with the water. I mean, with the. Uh, Correct. So what the um, people that qualify for um, a clause 41 C, um, which means they meet the income and the asset um, requirements to get a reduction in their property taxes, the water department, um, it's a separate, um, it's a separate function. It has nothing to really do with our department per se, but they rely on us vetting those individuals that meet those qualifications. So we send them a list and what they do is then they apply a 25% reduction in their water and sewer bill. Um, so we do work with the water department to provide them that list. And I know, you know, maybe there could be, I think with one of the individuals you had called that time, there was maybe some oversight and for some reason it wasn't applied to her bill. And we did work together to make sure that it was, um, you know, Done properly, and they have to do that every year, though, right? Correct. These applications have to be filed annually every year, um, and they are due by April first. Okay. So I April just wanted to mention next year for this bit of year coming. I just wanted to mention because I know you do a lot more than just. I mean, it's it's a lot. If there's a lot going on in that department, and you're there to to assist people if they need help, especially um, in those situations. So I thank you very much, Colleen, and it's great because I can. You know, you're always you always answer the call when people call, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, thanks. Thank, thank you, Councillor Councillor Palmucci. Thank you. I just wanted to um, take this opportunity to to thank you, Colleen. You and your team, I think, do a fantastic job. Uh, whenever I've had a question or a constituent issue, uh, it's always been addressed promptly and professionally. And I just wanted to thank you and tell you to keep up the good work. Thanks. I have a great team. It's not just me. No, I said team. I said team, but it starts at the top. So it thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, yeah, Colleen, thank you. Um, I know that right around when COVID started, we were about to have a road trip down in Ward 1. It's uh, Thomas Aquinas Hall for the seniors yep. in regards to going over a lot of things. And I know you mentioned Councillor Kane. Um, I think, uh, you know, setting up things like that, I think it's great for you guys. And, and it's terrific that you're willing to come out into the wards and sit down with some of the seniors to talk about deferments and and all the behind the scenes um, rules and regs that sometimes slide by some of those. So uh, it's great. As Councilor Palmucci just said, uh, you got a great team, Chris, John. You put up with me coming in with 
my questions or my phone call. So, uh, but uh, we appre- we all appreciate it. It's a, it's a great department. So thank you. With that, I, I, I had a motion to approve. I'd like to go forward with that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All against? Aye. The ayes have it. Thanks, Colleen. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is our, our new treasurer, Fee Du. Um, Good evening. Welcome, Fee. Uh, great to see you. And um, uh, go right ahead. You can talk a little bit about uh, the treasurer's department, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay. I'd like to motion to approve. What was that? I'd like to motion to approve. Motion to approve. Anyone on the motion? No one on the motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Great job, Fee. Good, good first year <laughs> out, Fee. I mean, Thank unbelievable you. job in answering those questions. Thank you. I mean, I don't know if I could have a few minutes just to kind of introduce Go myself right a little bit. It's my first year. Go right uh, ahead. So I've been on board since uh, December, and uh, there has been some transition going on. Um, the previous uh, treasurer, uh, actually, their assistant treasurer uh, also retired a little bit abruptly. Um, so um, we actually, it gave me a chance to dive into some of the process. Um, and so we had some turnover, but we managed the process well. And we, I actually had a chance to uh, revisit some of the process and we improved um, a little bit. And then the uh, my predecessor, uh, uh, the tre- uh, treasurer, uh, Deb Coughlin, she did a great job uh, training. So I, you know, transitioned pretty well into the role and um, we're deeply rooted now and, you know, we're becoming very efficient. Um, and I had a chance to work with our auditor, Susan, and she could tell you a little bit from the retirement <laughs> the office. And um, I, you know, uh, get along well with uh, finance and all the other teams. And I just realized that, you know, we're like the central part of of, of everything. And so, you know, I had a chance and the more I get to work with everyone, uh, the more I really enjoy my job. Um, and one of the things that I also learned is that a lot of the constituents, sometimes they come in and they're very upset because no one likes to, you know, pay. Uh, but it's just a matter of like how you handle uh, the, from the customer service point of view. So we were able to calm a lot of the, um, you know, the, the folks that came in and, you know, even turn them from being angry to giving us pastries the next day. So, you know, you can imagine um, just a lot of things that we have to deal with. And then from the treasurer's side, you know, we also uh, had a lot of deadlines, you know, to deal with. And, you know, so I I think that overall um, we manage the process well. And I'm just happy, you know, to be where I am today. Thanks, Fee. Yeah. Before you leave us, um, we have one more, uh, the tax title. Okay. Uh, department fee, and um, I look for a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Motion to approve on the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thanks, fee. All and, right, thank uh, you. We're thank very you lucky so that we're able to get <laughs> good people in, into into good positions. So, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on. Mr. Clasby, good evening. You're on mute, Tom. Approval. Motion to approve Council on Aging. Any Council, uh, President Liang. Thank you, Council Fallon. Thank you. Good evening, Tom. I just had a question about two line items. So usually when I look at these, um, I try to take into consideration what may have not been spent the last two fiscal years, obviously because of the pandemic, but then I also get to look back and see even pre-pandemic, you know, typically what has been spent. And there's two line items, um, granted it's minimal, right? But this all adds up at the end of the day. It's uh, the, towards the bottom, the contractual lines, um, the due subscriptions and memberships. I mean, they total a lot to be 525. Again, I, I understand it's minimal in the big picture, but they, Again, do add up, and I see that nothing has been spent in the last four fiscal years now. So I'm just curious as to why we still need that in there if it hasn't been spent in the last four fiscal years. Five hundred. What's the total amount on it? 
I have so 125. The dues, for the dues and subscriptions, it's 400. And then for memberships, it's 125. So I'd be looking to cut both unless you can explain to me why you'd need it this coming fiscal year. But again, the last four fiscal years, it hasn't been used. I'm not certain that's true, Councilor. Maybe, maybe it is. I, I, maybe I defer to the auditor on that. It's a membership for the, for the, um, for the Mass Council on Aging. And, and we do, I am a member. So, okay. so if we could just get some it's, clarification on that then, Susan. It's possibly then that they came out of contractual, but I mean, I, I, that, that is the line item that I would think I would take it out of. Uh, let me, President Leanne, let me just go over to the auditor and see if we can answer that. Okay. Absolutely. Thank so, you, Mr. Chairman. so the one line that you're talking about is under memberships. Is that correct, Council Leanne? Uh, there's two, Madam Honor. So one is our uh, five seven zero three zero zero, and then the other one is five seven zero three zero three. Okay. So the um, under due subscriptions, um, you are correct that there has been four hundred dollars budgeted each year. Um, in fiscal twenty one, the the department did use two hundred and twenty dollars of that four hundred. I'm not sure if they're going to use the remaining one eighty. Um, in, in the other line that you're talking about under memberships, um, that you are correct then that nothing has been used out of that line since, uh, I think since about 2010, fiscal 2010. Okay. All right, thank you for clarifying. So I won't cut the full amount from dues and subscriptions. And again, I, I do recognize um, and I do want to call out the fact that it does, you know, it's incredibly minimal compared to the, the entirety of the yeah, budget, but I do believe that the, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. That's all right, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to Council Liang. Uh, there was a South Shore Directors Association, and they haven't met in some time, and I think that's where that that money is, that's why that's remaining, we haven't, we haven't been involved with it for a few years now. Okay. No, no, I appreciate it, I just, um, again, I, I yeah. I do believe at some point, you know, even if it's extremely minimal, it, it does add up over time. So it's all right. I, I'd like to propose um, a cut of four twenty-five then from from the entirety of this budget. Um, That's you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, President Liang. Uh, on that on that motion to cut, I'll recognize uh, Council Phelan and Council Palmucci. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to, uh, to Director Clasby. Um, qu question: Are we fully open in the senior center now? Is that where's the COVID? We are about ninety-eight percent open. Uh, the cafe has not opened yet, but that's the only thing. So everything else is open. So yeah, you, you, all the sir. I, I noticed looking at the social media, the Watkins Club has started again. Correct. Um, I, I, I hear from a lot of people in the ward who utilize a lot of your services. And I think uh, I, I also remember a time when we didn't have a senior center. Yeah. And it was it was a shame to see it closed. For, I mean, it was no one's fault. It was, it was a pandemic. But I think a lot of a lot of seniors socialization and stuff that you do a wonderful job at down there, yeah. helping people and being a great resource for people. Um, so to see you back up and open again is, uh, is, 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 is really good news. And, uh, hopefully we can continue to keep, keep it open. But, um, so you are, you have 98% open. At this Correct. Point. In July one will be 100% open. And it, let me just say too, okay, I think most of you are aware of it, but you know, the office staff was in here through the pandemic. We were working, we transport to, uh, medical. So some of those people go to dialysis, and uh, many for cancer treatment. So throughout the pandemic, we were transporting uh, medical folks. In addition to that, for those people that were shut in and couldn't get any food, um, and, and not just seniors, but, but people that were quarantined, we were transporting food to, to the house. So I, I, I wanted, you know, the transportation in particular, but also the office staff here really did fantastic work during the pandemic. Very proud of them. Yeah, I think uh, definitely. You did a great job, and it's great to see the other services the, that, that were kind of shut down that are back up and going again. Great. So, uh, so Tom, 
yeah, I'm, we're going to obviously vote favorably on your budget. And, uh, and thank you for your service and thank all your staff because it was not easy working during COVID. They, they did a wonderful, they did a phenomenal job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Phelan. Chair recognizes Councilor Almucci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tom, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, you provide, you and your, your team provide an incredible service to the city, uh, and you do it very well um, and in a very kind uh, manner. And uh, you worked extra hard over the past year uh, to deliver on that mandate of providing services during the pandemic. Um, and I'm sure it was no easy task for you guys. And, as you know, I, th I think I say it every year. Um, I always tell residents if if they're not taking advantage of uh, services and programming from the council on eight of eight uh, council on aging or the uh, library, they're not getting their money's worth from their tax dollars. I mean, just the 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 depth and breadth of what you offer to residents is is really just fantastic. And um, so I just want to thank you and um, keep up the good work. Well, thank you, Councilor, for your kind words, and you do mention it every year, and I appreciate it, and you always remember the team, too, as, as you all do, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, I'm going to bounce back. Councilor, uh, President Liang, the, the cut was for 570303, the memberships, uh, the dues for 125? It was a total of 125 out of the... Uh, 570303 and then uh, 300 from 570300. Total of 425. Okay, so there's a motion to cut um, those line items with a total of $425, uh, dollars, respectively, um, 300 and 125. Jen, can you call a roll? Sure. Council Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. No. Councilor Phelan. No. Chairman McCarthy. No. Um, six to three, it passes. Now we need a motion on as amended. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can we get a motion on the amended amount, which I believe is so moved. 852 678. Motion on the amended. So moved. Okay. Uh, on the motion, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you, councils. Thank you, Director Clasby. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, City Clerk Nicole Crispo. Thank you, Chairman McCarthy. City uh, Council members. Motion to approve. Motion on the floor to approve uh, the City Clerk line. Any discussion on the motion? Councilor Andronico. Thank you, Chairman McCarthy. Uh, I call, just had a quick question for you. Um, I noticed the line item just under communication uh, for $20,000. I was just hoping you could provide uh, further explanation on that. Of course. Um, so in the last year, uh, we have um, had um, COT services for all of our council meetings. And um, it wasn't a line item that I had previously. So um, I was um, short, not short, but taking from other communication lines and other purchase services to pay for it. And um, I just know that now it's such a need and a want. Um, Council, um, Council President Liang asked me to get it for every meeting. So um, for that, um, we based it on the bills that we have gotten over the past year. Um, and asked for $20,000 to still provide COT services and closed captioning for um, the deaf and hard of hearing. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Chair recognizes Councillor Palmucci. 
Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Clerk. Um, good evening. Could you give us an update on where we stand in terms of um, uh, voting availability, uh, methods of voting availability for the next election, which I think is only a municipal election? Is there early voting, mail-in voting? What's, um, what's the state of voting in Quincy these days? It's actually um, in the House, and it has not been passed yet. So I'm waiting to hear on whether we're going to have early voting and uh, mail-in voting for this coming up September and November election. And so that legislation would, would um, put in place the availability of what we had last election during the pandemic? Is that? That is correct. However, um, I, I see that the, the lines are um, zeroed out and they were not um, last year. The reason that is, is because I think that the staff will be able to handle the early voting and the mail-in voting in office, and we probably won't have extended hours at this point for a municipal, municipal election. And you don't think um, there'd be um, like a Saturday voting location like we have? I mean, it, it that would be up to us. It, right. it would, and it's not mandated yet um, as far as the the law goes. So I didn't anticipate it. If it happens, I'll be sure to come back um, to the council to um, ask for an appropriation for that. I mean, you could always too, um, you could always uh, allow like Saturday voting in the clerk's office the same way you vote ahead of time. It doesn't have to be the whole North Quincy High School gymnasium where everyone, I mean, it doesn't have, it doesn't have to be as extensive because not as many people are likely to, to participate, but I, I do think it's a great option to have for, you know, folks who work um, hourly jobs and, and um, you know, have kids and maybe are, you know, don't have the time um, during the week, but uh, the ability to vote in person uh, early in the clerk's office during regular business hours is a, you know, I think that's a tremendous, uh, tremendous benefit and really, expands uh, voter access. So good. Well, I look forward to, I'll follow that. I'm sure you'll keep me informed too as to uh, what happens up on Beacon Hill. Thank you. Yes, Thank you, Councilor. Um, so we get a motion to approve all those in, oh, Councilor DeBona. Thank you, Chairman McCarthy. Just real quick on, um, if I could, um, um, Madam, Madam Clerk, just on that, um, is it possible to, I mean, now that COVID has kind of subsided, hopefully it doesn't reappear with this Delta, Delta variant. A lot, a lot of people are vaccinated up here in, um, in the Massachusetts, Quincy, um, particularly Quincy, Massachusetts. Um, do you foresee it having an early voting at City Hall on a Saturday? Or does it have to be at North Quincy High School? I know during the week we've had early voting at City Hall in the you know, City Council Chambers um, downstairs in the cellar, but do you foresee it on a Saturday over there? We certainly could uh, could take that into consideration and would be happy to work with all of you and the wants and needs of the residents for sure. Um, and we have line, we have money in our um, election workers line for that. Um, but and some other things that I do anticipate, um, poll padding, poll pad training. Um, I may have to add precincts, um, depending on the numbers that come out with the federal um, census. And um, the minimum wage did go up. So for that, um, you know, we did leave the um, election worker line um, the same, we did leave that the same as we had it last year because we do anticipate um, the minimum wage going up and um, some training and um, the fact that I may have to add some precincts. But of course we'll um, work, like I said, for the residents and probably, you know, have a Saturday. Um, we don't have to have it specific to North Quincy High, no. Because it would be so much simpler when you tell folks, oh yeah, we have early voting and it's at you know Quincy City Hall and you can go up there. 
rather than say, okay, Monday through Friday, you go to City Hall and Saturday, you go to, go to North Quincy. It's just confusing to tell the voters that are very busy. They don't know if they can make election day on November 2nd. They want to come in. They want to do vote, voting. And, you know, since the pandemic, I know that a lot of folks are doing vacationing more than they usually would because they've been locked up for uh, 16 months or whatever the case may be. Everybody's out right now. And they're probably going to have an extension of going down, you know, to Florida and these other places in, you know, October and stuff. So um, it would be just, just personally, I think it would be so much easier to do Monday through Friday, then Saturday, Quincy City Hall. It's just simple and easy to tell folks what they can do. Um, and on top of that, you're talking about the precincts. Um, I always thought it was um, easier for folks that are in some of the senior buildings to vote inside the senior senior building and then maybe even having an outside precinct outside of it. Um, I just feel that, uh, you know, and I know you moved, um, I think it was the Germantown Neighborhood Center a few years ago, and then you went up to um, O'Brien Towers, obviously Ward 1. And some of the folks that live, obviously, near the Adam Shore Library have to go back to uh, O'Brien Towers to vote. And sometimes they want to go the other way because the traffic's going that way. It just be a lot easier um, to take into consideration that possibly leaving the building of O'Brien Towers, but also letting folks go the other way. So it's just it's just something to make voting a lot easier for folks, um, especially in the, the senior buildings and stuff. So that's just my take, how I've been feeling over the last few years. But thank you for all your hard work. Um, I thank you for this past um, state election year. You did a fantastic job in general with uh, the primary and the, and the final election with all the, the mail-in balloting um, system. But um, we'll see what the state says when they come back. Was it, is it, are they come back before July 30th? with an answer is that correct um we're not going to get the federal numbers until sometime mid-august mid-august okay thank you mr chairman thank you madam clerk thank you thank you counselor anyone else uh with any questions for on the city clerk line i see none uh we had a motion to approve all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Clerk Crispo, for number one on the list. Um, elections, Nicole. So I just wanted to say um, we, we already talked a little bit about it. We are waiting for um, some clarification through the state on early voting and mail-in voting. Um, it was a big success in our office. Um, we, the staff worked really hard on it. And um, I, I fully think that it's a great idea. I wanna do more of it. Um, so with that, I don't think that there are any um, big- Need approval. Thank you. Uh, Council Palmucci moves approval. On the motion, any questions for the clerk? Chair recognizes President Liang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Nick, this is just, uh, similar to the question I was asking Colleen, where um, for ramp rentals and professional and tech, the last fiscal year, it, was, um, it wasn't it was used, but the previous years before then, you had used pretty much up to what was budgeted. So was that also a result of the pandemic? It was, yes. And um, we're looking, we'll look after this year to see um, what we can do to save some money on things like rentals and and try to um, work to establish a, a polling place that doesn't need um, the rentals, uh, but like the ramp, but the rentals themselves, we do pay a, a fee to the schools, to the churches, to the halls, um, for polling places. Okay. No, thank you for uh, the additional explanation. A brief yes would have been fine, but I, I mean, I know that I, I, when you, for folks who are interested, when you're looking through these budgets and looking through these line items, I mean, you zeroed out a number of line items, right? And you're really conservative in doing so because you want to anticipate that that may not happen. So why, you know, budget for it if you may not end up spending it, right? So you're, again, you sort of go the other route um, as you always do when you're budgeting for these kinds of things is you, you approach it really conservatively and you're not going to ask for something that you're not going to end up spending or that you're not confident that you're even going to end up spending. So simple no would have been fine, but I appreciate the explanation. And yeah, you always do, again, a phenomenal job, not just in your work, but also 
um, the way you plan your budget as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Liang. Seeing no other questions, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Next item uh, is licensing board. Move we'll approval. Approval. Motion made by Council Palmucci on the motion. Seeing no comments on the motion. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, next item is the census. Move approved. Motion made by Council Palmucci to approve. Any questions on the census? President Liang. Thank you. This is just a curiosity question. Um, are we able to determine how many um, how many folks responded to it? I think you answered this the other day. I apologize, but do you have a total on that? So we have about 30% of um, the residents responding as of now. And as of today, we're sending out a uh, second mailing to try to get um, people to send it back. Um, I was talking about it um, just today with Joe Catalano and trying to get the word out. And um, I appreciate this opportunity once again to those who are listening. Um, you know, we do use these numbers for grants. We do use them for um, facilitating um, doctor's offices and schools and uh, police and fire. So it is important for all our residents to answer our census. Sounds good, thank you. And if folks, um, I guess just using it as a quick PSA, right? If folks um, <laughs> aren't getting mailing, but they didn't fill it out, can they just go to City Hall um, or can they go online to just complete it? They can come to City Hall and they can certainly call our office and we can update them by, by phone. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't mean for that to be a PSA, but I'm kind of glad it was. I took advantage. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Oh, no problem. Uh, thank you, President Liang. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? And the ayes have it. And uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Crispo, you do you do a great job, and I I don't think uh, I don't I can echo for everyone else. Uh, very responsive, and um, another you know luxury we have, we can always seem to find someone who can replace someone, and uh, even if it was Joe Shea, and you filled his shoes pretty well. So thank okay. you, thank you all. Uh, next up, uh, Mr. Sleeman, emergency management. Allie, good evening. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, emergency management, all budget line items are evenly funded. Uh, no increases or decreases from a year. Uh, prepared to take any questions. Move approval. Motion to approve. Any questions on the motion? Seeing none. Oh, <laughs> Councilor Mahoney. I just have a quick question. When I was just looking at the... Um it looks like there was some transfers. $26,000 got transferred out, but then in the end, it looks like the budget was... What happened there? Why did we transfer... What was the transfer money? It looks like it was transferred out, though. Revised budget was thirty, Then it was expended fifty five, dollars and you ended with $25,000 in the, in the negative. So what happened there? Uh, yes, Councilor. We had a retirement at mid-budget mid cycle, so uh, we, we cut that. And then that position was, uh, was filled just recently, so that's why it went back in. Okay, so but then you're you're you had a secret is a secretary that retired. Yes. And then you created an operations manager that happened during the year. Yes. And is this is, is this similar to the sense that you created a and did we see the the change in that that job description? Um, I'm not sure. Um, the salary stayed the chance the same. We're just changing the duty title to kind of expand uh, the the duties. No, I understand that, but I think anytime we have a change, whether it's to from a secretary to any other change, the job title is changing. Did that? Do you know if that job? I mean, the job. I, I assume that you're you were looking for somebody with different skill sets than the secretary. Is that true for the operations manager? Yeah. Yes, uh, okay. I'm not sure if that was that was all done through human resources in the mayor's office. So it was all done through human resources in the mayor's office. Is that what you yes. Said? So yes. this person's reporting to you, but you didn't have any say as to what the person was going to be doing? 
Uh, I worked on creating the job description, yes, but as far as how it was filled and everything else and what went on with uh, the budget transfer, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, through you then, I guess, to Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker, this goes back to the heart of the problem again, where positions that are being created for transparency's sake, you know, we do, we did ask and, and we did pass to have all positions um, up so that pe people can apply for these positions online. And I'm not sure if this position was, it could have been, I have no idea. But also when there's a new position that's created, it's supposed to come before the city council for us to approve. Do you know why this didn't? Through you, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is not a new position. Uh, this is the administration. I realize this is a swap. It's changing the secretary to an operations the, manager. It's not a new position. It is the administrative assistance position. And through Director Sleeman and the mayor's office, um, the job duties uh, were expanded to some degree. Uh, and the new title is before this body as part of the budget. But from a practical standpoint, um, we could have just kept it as administrative assistant and it could, it could, I guess, the I guess. duties, but we decided to change the title. Um, so the job description is exactly the same as the secretary, but you changed no, the title. Is, I realize no, no, the salary is the same. It's actually a little bit lower. The salary's a little bit lower. No, the salary's the same. I'm sorry, the salary's the same. Mr. Walker, you got anything? Uh, when I, when Mr. Councilor Mahoney, why don't you let Mr. Walker just finish and then... Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to let him finish. You're good? Well, no, Mr. Walker's good. So, Mr. Walker's so I'm good. sorry. So, okay, so I'm sorry. So Mr. Sleesman just said that the... the the job description description changed. The role changed. We have a new we have a new accounting number for the role, which means that the the in any other situation that would mean that the job has changed. I realize the salary is staying the same. I don't really have a problem. With, I just have a problem with the fact that was you, the person retired, and I have a question in regards to was the position posted online or was it not? I'd have to track that down, Councilor, whether or not it was. Uh, the job was filled prior or after the ordinance that was filed um, and approved by the council. And I also don't believe, I believe that ordinance does not apply to direct appointments uh, from the mayor. So, so the direct appointment for the mayor, I believe, would be the director of this department, which is Alex. So the operations manager, direct, so all these people are direct appointments now? So who when are, you, the secretary is a direct appointment? Who are all these people? So when you say this is a direct appointment from the mayor, are you saying that Ali's secretary was a direct appointment for the mayor as well? The secretary not, was not, no. Okay, so the operations manager would be a direct appointment for the mayor? That is correct. Okay, so you changed the role because you said you didn't change it, but now you're saying that you did change it. Now it's now that was it. So how many other positions that we have in the budget, could we get a list of those as well? other than directors that are also direct appointments for the mayor, because I thought the director was the direct appointment for the mayor and then the people there, who were hired were. I'm, I'm just trying to figure that out now. Through you, Mr. That's Chairman, there are, there are a number of mid-level management positions that are appointees of the mayor that don't uh, fit into a collective bargaining unit. So anybody who's not in a collective bargain, bargaining unit, is that what you're telling me, is a direct appointment of the mayor? That is correct. That's fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. Transparency. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Sleeman? There was a motion to approve. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 No. Opposed? No. Yes. No, I'm, I'm opposed. I'm opposed for that piece. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Sleeman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we have uh, Mr. Murphy uh, up next, correct? Now we get to the meat and potatoes of, the, of the, the budget here. Good evening, Mr. Murphy. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the council. Uh, before you tonight are three separate uh, budgets that uh, make up the Department of Natural Resources. These are the funds we need to maintain our 52 parks and playgrounds, our 12 uh, municipal beaches, 24 memorials and islands, six cemeteries, 23 school properties, two ponds, 
countless acres of salt marsh, 20,000 street trees, approximately 40,000 uh, trees in our parks and cemeteries. And to run, in my opinion, uh, the best and most affordable and most inclusive recreational program in all of the state, if not the country. And uh, I'd like to mention that uh, Mrs. Hanley, our recreation director, is also uh, in the meeting this evening. So uh, the first budget before you is uh, 491 for the cemetery. Uh, that budget is essentially uh, level funded from last year to this uh, same amount of positions uh, from last year to this year. Any questions for Mr. Murphy on the cemetery budget? Councilor Palmucci and then Councilor Phelan. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Dave. Um, uh, th thank you to you for the, the great job you and your team do as well. I, I said it in another department, but anytime I have um, a constituent issue, um, you're right on top of it. And anytime I have a question about something uh, policy related or uh, procedure related, you're right on top of it. So I appreciate it. Um, can you tell me about the cemetery? Right. So. What is, our, I don't understand why we're even in the cemetery business. What, what's the historical, what's the historical um, kind of uh, road or path that we took to get to this point? And what's the future hold for the cemetery department? And is it just, it's just going to be an ongoing obligation, right? Because we've made a commitment to, to folks that we're going to care for these grounds in perpetuity. Yes, I can speak a little bit to the past, but more to the, the, the present yeah. and future council. So, you know, we go back as far as the, the Hancock Cemetery in the, in the 1600s, um, you know, Mount Wollaston in, in the mid to late 1800s, um, the Sailor Cemetery, Snug Harbor and the Sailor Cemetery uh, out in Beecher Knoll. Um, and then Pine Hill is probably our most active uh, current uh, cemetery. We did, after years of trying to get permission from the state to expand uh, into seven acres of Pine Hill Cemetery, which um, within our current inventory will be the last frontier for cemetery expansion in Quincy. I, I guess the answer of why we're in this business, um, you know, if uh, upon losing a, a loved one, having the ability, uh, especially for folks that are uh, advanced in age, you may not have the ability to drive or travel that far. Uh, having their loved one uh, in a local cemetery where they can grieve uh, certainly is an important part of that process. Now, that's one's personal opinion. I don't know what they decided back in the 1600s, um, but I, I think from a standpoint of why we're in the cemetery business, uh, we're certainly not alone. Uh, and I think that um, we're looking at those last seven acres at Pine Hill is really the last opportunity for Quincy residents to be buried in Municipal Cemetery. And where are we comparably on costs to uh, other cemeteries that someone could go to? Do we know? We do, yeah. We, we've actually done an analysis uh, of this with the cemetery board. And just this year, we've actually raised the rates to get more in line with the rest of the marketplace. Even as a municipal cemetery, our costs were, were very, very low. Um, and within the last three months, the cemetery board voted to uh, increase those costs, which will also help pay for that expansion and then some. And so uh, once the seven acres, you call it, you know, the last frontier there, uh, once those seven acres are exhausted, uh, that's it for revenue, right? I mean, that's the last bit of revenue that's going to come in to offset expenses, right? Conceivably. Just today, uh, Mr. Logan and I, the cemetery uh, general foreman, toured um, uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery, and they are doing some very creative things as it relates to the use of space. Um, you know, when our sem municipal cemeteries first started, um, cremation was not a, uh, a, a viable option, and then it became more and more an option as you went along. So there are ways that we can be more creative with the use of spaces that we do have, uh, particularly as it relates to the expansion of Pine Hill. Uh, there will be an endpoint at some point in time, uh, but I do think that uh, using some creativity and some modern engineering, uh, we can certainly uh, continue to maximize the very limited space we do have. Yeah, I, I, I just find I was thinking about it the other day. I just find it really, it, it did, I don't know, just interesting as to how municipalities got in the cemetery business in the, in the first place. You know, it's, it seems like something that wouldn't be in our, our wheelhouse. And we're not, like you said, we're not alone in the fact that we have a municipal cemetery. I mean, a, lot are, a lot of communities do, and I just don't know what the, the, the genesis is of it. Um, how long do you think it'll take before we exhaust the seven acres in, in Pine Hills, roughly? Um, my guess is we'll see a pretty early run on the sale of lots. We haven't had what they call pre-need sales um, in decades in Quincy. Uh, 
Um, um, so, you know, we're looking at some pre-need sales once that expansion project is complete. So they may sell pretty quickly. They may not be mm. filled for decades. Right. Right. So uh, between doing the, the new burials at the time, but, you know, the maintenance will be an issue uh, throughout. The, the other wrinkle to this council I think is important, especially uh, during the pandemic we saw it. Our cemeteries became some of those popular parks in the city. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. The gyms were closed and the fitness studios and, you know, all the other places that are shut down because of COVID. Not only our parks, but our cemeteries became incredibly popular for, for walkers and even bicyclists. So, you know, I do yeah. think um, they have a role. You know, I've often said that I think Mount Wollaston is a, uh, one of those beautiful uh, museums I've ever been in, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the stone uh, artwork that's in there. So, I, you know, I do think they have a role uh, even beyond the traditional cemetery. Yeah, it, it's funny that you say that because that when I was thinking about why are we in the cemetery business, it was on one of my many nightly walks with my my two little ones through the um, Hall Place Cemetery next to St. Mary's. That's you know it's right near. It's a it's a good loop for us. The kids you know the kids like to walk on the pass, and um, that's where I got to think it. So yeah, I was out, we were out there all the time. We still are um, during the good weather. So all right, well thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate um, your your, your uh, input on that. Thank you. Thank you, Council Palmucci. Chair recognizes Councilor Phelan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to, uh, to Mr. Murphy. Uh, do you have a completion date on up at uh, Pinell? So right I'll now it would be complete. Sure. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman to Council Phelan, we are beginning the engineering design phase right now. So we're looking at uh, engineering and design probably into early 23 with construction uh, beginning in 23. The site is quite a challenge. So when we went through the permitting process uh, with the state, the, the members of the council may uh, remember that uh, you approved a conservation restriction for the 15 acres that we actually had to preserve as endangered species habitat for the timber rattlesnake. We, we got the other seven acres. Now, fortunately, the seven acres that we got were in fact Pine Hill. Uh, and you can imagine uh, the, the topography there is going to be a challenge uh, along with a lot of the ledge there. So the construction of that site uh, may take a little bit longer than your typical cemetery expansion only because of some of the challenges that we face. Um, but I, I think by the end of 23, start of 24, uh, we should be pretty near completion um, with the, uh, the seven acre expansion. Uh, thank you. And just, just to let you know, uh, Mr. Murphy, through you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Murphy, I, I got to compliment the way, the way uh, Mount Wollaston looked over Memorial Day and then at the Fire Memorial, Police Memorial. The crews did an excellent job. I am a regular walker on Mount Wollaston Cemetery, and every time I do walk there, I usually find something, like you said, a museum, that, um, that is quite, quite amazing. And every time I walk, I find something new. And it's a, it's a wonderful resource. And just kudos to your crew. I go to a lot of cemeteries all around Eastern Massachusetts. And I got to say, one of the best I go into is, uh, is, is the crew here in Quincy. Thank you. They're very attentive. They're great to work with. I've heard nothing but compliments from, from people using the cemetery service. So, um, I guess I'm going to pass that along to everyone who works down there. They do a great job, and particularly over the memorials that we just went through. Uh, Mount Wollaston looked probably one of the best I've ever seen it. So kudos to your crew, and you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Phelan. Uh, a- anyone else uh, questions for Commissioner Murphy? This is just on cemetery, right? This is just on cemetery. Okay. And I'm looking for a motion to approve cemetery. Motion. Motion made motion by council. Motion made by Councilor Palmucci and another motion made by Councilor Phelan. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, Dave, yeah, uh, just to echo real quick Chuck's, uh, Councilor Phelan's thoughts. Uh, bang up job, Scotty Logan. And, and the whole crew there all the time. Um, it's a wonderful thing to have. It's, it's majestic when you go up uh, C Street by the police station. Um, comments come from people that, you know, are outside of here that travel Wollaston Beach and have to, you know, take that run. And, and I hear it all the time. You know, it's, uh, 
It's a uh, monumental and uh, unbelievable, well-kept uh, piece of land that we should always pay attention to, which we will always pay attention to uh, in the city. So thank you. Uh, next up, um, Parks Department and Forestry. Commissioner Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A little more interesting uh, wrinkle this year than in past years. Um, I'll break it down into three different sections for uh, hopefully an, an easier uh, discussion phase. The park and forestry side, um, we essentially have the uh, same number of positions. It's actually one fewer position this year uh, than what we've asked for in the past. Um, the two uh, interesting wrinkles are the components of the uh, downtown division, if you will. I know a couple of years back, the mayor tried to, to um, create a downtown department. Uh, the feedback at the time was to incorporate uh, those positions into uh, departments and half of that department is in the park uh, budget and the other half I believe is in the public buildings uh, uh, budget. So there are elements uh, in this budget uh, dealing with the downtown, including two uh, new positions, uh, one which is a horticulturist and the other one is a, a handy person um, the laborer in the budget. Um, we also have for the first time this year, it was mentioned earlier, the Furnace Brook uh, Golf Club. So uh, the city working with the mayor's office and municipal finance looked at um, uh, the transition process, if you will, of the Furnace Brook Golf Club uh, for the better half of uh, the last 12 months. Uh, we've been meeting with the, the board uh, at Furnace Brook Golf Club. We've been meeting with the staff at Furnace Brook Golf Club. We've been meeting with uh, other municipalities that run golf courses. We've been talking to the folks at the county that run the president's golf course. Uh, and before you tonight uh, is a budget request uh, within the park budget that uh, should be offset by a similar, if not more revenue that will come into our local receipts uh, to help make the Furnacebrook Golf Club a municipal golf course for the first time in more than 50 years. Now, I think one of the reasons why that is important is uh, access. Um, you know, we talk about inclusion. I, I think that golf is a sport that is very exclusive. I think if you look at the way that um, the golf courses in this city have been run in the past, including this very course, um, they have created a lot of barriers for entry, I think, to a lot of people who may otherwise enjoy the game or, or sport of golf. Um, I do think that um, locating it within this department and having it run directly by this department creates a series of opportunities. Uh, I've talked about this at length with Mrs. Hanley, the Recreation Department but really opening up the game, uh, using the facility in the adjacent um, Forbes Hill Park to really create a, a youth training center um, and, and new golfer training center, really. You don't have to be young to, to start playing golf. So I, I do think that uh, adding uh, a nine hole golf course to our inventory of parks um, is really going to open up some opportunities for our residents that otherwise wouldn't exist. Um, and you know, I do think that you know, there is some work that we're going to have to do. I mentioned that we've been meeting with the staff at the golf course. There are three full-time positions that will be looking to transition the existing employees uh, from the golf course uh, into city employment, uh, along with a series of seasonal employees that help out uh, not just on the grounds, uh, but occasionally spell um, the golf pro in the pro shop and the admin and, and the office that she works in as well, too. So, Again, uh, our projections based on going over their P&Ls for the last four years suggest that um, the revenue that will come in uh, will be in excess of the amount that we're requesting uh, for the particular items that relate to the golf course. We also think that marketing this course, uh, as some of you may know, it's been described as a semi-private course. Now, I, I remember as a young Quincy resident trying to go up there and golf and being told that it was a private course and I, I wouldn't be able to golf. Now, I do think marketing uh, Furnace Brook as a public course is also going to impact the revenue in a positive fashion uh, as it relates to walk-up greens fees. Uh, so I, I think that there is an opportunity here uh, that could uh, actually benefit uh, the taxpayer. Uh, I also think it will substantially increase uh, access um, to golf uh, for a, a wide variety of our residents that currently uh, have barriers to entry as it relates to the game of golf. So, those uh, two items, uh, the rest of the budget is pretty much straightforward. I mentioned there's one fuel position in park and forestry. Uh, the expenses are pretty similar. We're asking for a slight increase in contracted uh, services. Um, but I think the, uh, the other, I'm sorry, the other issue that is of significant note is in years past, this council has supported uh, tree planting. Uh, we've asked for $300,000 uh, for trees. Last year, we were able to plant 450 new street trees with that money. 
This year, we're asking for an increase uh, up to uh, 400,000, which uh, based on the economy of scale, we expect could help us plant 600 new trees uh, in the upcoming year. So um, that's an overview. There's, there's probably a lot more in this one than there are the other two, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I'll recognize Council Palmucci, then Councilor Kane, then Council Mahoney. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Dave, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the the tree planting and 20,000 trees is, is amazing. Uh, and I, as a ward counselor, like tree calls are, I don't want to say they drive me crazy because that's not the right thing, but like they find them the most frustrating, not because of like helping people or anything, but because 50% of the calls are for people who want trees and the other 50% are of the calls are for people who want the trees removed. And it's like, oh, if we could only just, you know, swap, like move that tree from in front of your house so oh, this, you know, Mrs. Smith's house. Um, it, so it's hard. So I know, um, I know it's a lot of work for you guys to keep up with that. And I appreciate the job that you do. Um, my, I guess my comments in, in, I guess they're real, just more comments and questions um, relate to the, to the golf course. And uh, let me preface by saying, I know a lot of work is going into uh, the lead up to this uh, from you, the administration, I know the ward council has been very involved um, and, and residents in the area have been very uh, involved in, and, um, I, and I appreciate that. And I, I certainly don't mean any criticism um, of any of the work that's been done up until now. But for me uh, personally, I just still haven't been persuaded or convinced of the city's capability to manage and oversee a golf course. Um, we've variously been in the hospital business, the college business, proposed we be in the presidential library business. And I'm just not sold on the expense. And I get that it'll be offset. Um, by revenues that we expect, but you know maybe that's in the short term. In, in the long term, there are, there are going to be a lot of capital needs. We're going to spend a lot more money on this golf course than we bring in from it. And um, quite frankly, I don't think we've had this discussion. Very similar to the college, and we're talking about spending a hundred million dollars and um, building them a new facility without ever having the the, the conversation about what what the city's role in oversight of the college should be. I don't feel like we've ever had, we've, we've had a, a, a robust discussion here. And again, I know the ward council has been involved, some of the residents and, and um, in your department, but, but, but up here, I don't think we've had a robust discussion as to what, you know, what policy wise, um, whether or not it makes sense for the, for the city to be in the golf course business. So for me, it's, you know, I just think, um, I don't know that residents would be better served by having the golf course run by the municipality rather than a, um, another entity. Um, and it comes down to what Council De Bono often says up here, which is, you know, is it a want or is it a need? Um, and again, I know that it offsets now, you know, the income versus expense offsets now, but that's not going to be how it is in two, three, four, five years with the capital, uh, the capital needs of, of running a golf course will require. Uh, and then I also think of, you know, the mayor says that we can't afford a director of DEI for, you know, what, $60,000. But, um, you know, we have a budget request in here uh, that suggests we can afford a golf pro. And we're, we had 100 residents tell us that they want a DEI position. I haven't heard a soul tell me that, you know, that the city needs a, uh, a golf pro. Uh, so with that being said, um, I'm going to move to cut 100 and forty-two thousand five hundred dollars, which is the golf course budget, um, out of this budget until we can have a, until we can have a um, more robust discussion about the city's role and oversight and uh, policies and whether or not we should should be managing the golf course. One forty-two five. One forty-two five. Yeah. Okay. Um, on that motion, I'll go to Councillor Kane, and then uh, anyone else would like to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, Dave. How are you? Um, I, you know, of course, I appreciate everything that you guys do. Um, always. I, um, my comments are about the golf course as well. Um, to the extent that there have been, I guess, there's been this much kind of work and discussion taking place. I actually haven't been that involved, and so I think I'm a little surprised to see some of these things in here. Uh, and you know, there, there really hasn't been much, uh, by way of neighborhood input. Uh, and I hope that's the path that we're going to, uh, go down, um, so that we can figure out what's the best sort of application to serve the needs of the, the neighborhood that this, uh, this property exists. 
but it's good to know and reassuring, you know, I think people uh, are under some impression that it might be developable land, but it's nice to know that the city wants to keep the space open. Uh, I value that property. I grew up around there and I live right by it now. So, um, you know, please keep me in the loop or, you know, let's, let's engage because I, I sort of don't appreciate being updated on this through a budget uh, hearing. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Mahoney. Um, I, I, so I have a couple of questions, but I want to, I, I'd like to can just stay on the, the, um, the cut that um, Councillor Mucci had, and then maybe you take a vote on that. We can come back to my other questions. I'm not sure um, if that's how you want to handle it, Councillor McCarthy. No, why don't, why don't you go ahead and we'll talk off course and then we'll, we'll go back to the. Okay, that's fine. Go so ahead. I'm, I'm going to. I'm in agreement with um, Council, Councilor Pamucci on this. Um, he's beating me to things, but that's okay. I'm in agreement of it. So, so long as I, it, it's an, this is an important conversation because we're adding into a budget the golf course, and, and um, it's even more disturbing to me now that I found out the Councilor Kane wasn't even part of the conversation. So, I think this 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 is one of those things that the although a lot of parties are working very diff- hard on it and do with their due diligence, and we're being told that it's going to be offset. But we're learning about it in a budget and we're adding a pretty much a whole department. And this isn't just going to end with the people and it's not going to end. We don't even, you know, and they, we're, we're not getting a perspective of, you know, we're being told it's going to be able to afford the, the offset because they're going to make, we're going to market it. It's going to come in with money. We're going to pay off this. It's going to pretty much be a wash. But there, we don't have anything in front of us for that. So this, this can't be part of our 2022 budget. It has to be removed, be brought to us in a different way. And then determine how whether or not this is the right thing for the city to do or not. There are other ways to do this, and I believe we said at the beginning that the the, the administration we're already paying. Can I just have clarification that are we already paying these people right now, the city of Quincy? No. Who said no? no? We're not paying these employees are still currently employees of the Pernsburg Golf Club. Okay, because I think earlier when Mr. Mason was talking, there was a suggestion that that, that they might have been paid. So. So I, I'm definitely in agreement with that. So now I just have some questions. We didn't get to have like, every year I ask you guys to come in and, and present. And unfortunately, um, Dave, you've never been able to come in and present. And I'm, before I even get into my questions, I just want to say that you are very responsive. When I get in touch with you, you are very responsive. So I do appreciate that. Um, no matter, um, there's several departments that, that I can say that without a doubt, and you're one of them, that if I get in touch with you and I have a question, um, no matter what time of day it is, you take care of it and you get back in touch with me or at least direct me to the right person. So I do appreciate that because responsiveness like that means means something. Um, but I also now now this is where it gets tough because I'm going to have some criticisms. <laughs> so um, and they're not they're just they're things that upset me because Kincaid Park in Ward 4, we just unveiled that last year. We did it during a pandemic and um, it's only a year old. And, you know, when I went to when I went there last year, it wasn't really completely done. They were, you know, they unveiled it and there were plantings that weren't planted and there were things weren't done. And I understood that because we wanted to get it up and operational as soon as we could for families to be able to use. But then when I went back, you know, I went back to see, you know, uh, many things had grown in. So you started to see some vegetation grown in and, and, and that looked good. But there were things that really upset me because, you know, it's just not getting the care it deserves. The trees haven't been edged around. Um, the weed hasn't been remote. There's weeds everywhere. And let me tell you, I'm, I'm not even allowed to weed in my yard to pick up the wrong things to weed. But now I know the weeds when I'm going there. I'm thinking to myself, I can even recognize the weeds. And that's, that's disturbing if I can recognize the weeds. Like I know what a milkweed is, but it hasn't been remulched either. The grass hasn't been, it, it, the grass hasn't been trimmed in between the trees. Um, there's weeds in, all around the perennials. That's an investment that the city put into this, this beautiful park. And then there's dead bushes um, on the nursing side home. And there's one dead pine tree near the basketball courts. Like, and then the trees, there's, there's trees when you go towards Southwest Middle that are so bent over. I'm not sure what happened to them, but they're, they, were never, they were never straight when they went in. And, you know, it, it, it's just, it's it, me. I was just so disappointed. It's beautiful. People are using it, but it's, it, could, it just is not holding up. And it's only a year old. That's an investment. We spent a lot of money on Kincaid Park. And I'm not sure, is it just because it's in Ward 4? I'm, I'm not trying to say that that's why, but I feel as though it doesn't get the attention it deserves. The grass and the perimeter, it, it, there's clover all over. I'm not sure, was that planned? Did you want Did you want the grass to have clover? Is that is that is that the way it's supposed to be and how it was planted? I just, I don't think that was the vision when we did it. And I'm concerned about that because it's, it's um, 
it was a lot of money that we spent. And I agreed to spend that money because I believe Ward 4 deserved to have something done over there because Kincaid Park was, was in need of that. I know that the, the fields are being used, so that's a positive. There's a lot more action people over there. But to really drive people to, to use it, we have to maintain it. And that's something that happens throughout our whole city is that we come in with these projects. And I'm concerned about the golf course because of this, because that's another thing will be taken on. And will we be able to handle that? So now I'm just going to move over to South Central, South Central Middle School. The planting and the beds throughout South Central Middle School um, have need to be weeded. The stairs going up the steps, um, the area in the front of the school, they they were like there were weeds growing all over the place. Now I'm not sure is that the school that has to do it, but I you know the park departments took care of the schools. But you know again this is this is something that when I I went over there I was a little disappointed because the building itself and the school itself is beautiful. I know the kids just went back to school. Maybe it's because it's the pandemic and the tension wasn't being, but it has to happen. Um, so that's that's word four. But now when I move up, move over to Elm Avenue. Um, this is a big deal over on Elm Avenue, and, and I know this is Ward 5 that I'm talking about, but over on Elm Avenue, they took down all the beautiful trees that went down there. It was because we were paving, and it sat for, there was no plans. The neighborhoods weren't talked to by the counselor at the time. Nobody knew what was going on. It was a big, big problem during that year, and when they did go in, when the trees did go in, and it finally the beds finally got planted, it was perennials and ornamental grasses that was put in, and 95 percent and, and, and of all of that was been yanked out and it's been replaced by mulch and a few annuals have been replaced sporadically and then some trees and some and some low growing um, some low growing plants have been put in there but my problem with that is we spend a ton of money on perennials and ornamental grasses do we not know what we're planting in the city because that's in fact that's part of our budget and that's going into the area we seem to we did it at atlantic middle school so we did a beautiful beautiful job at atlantic middle school and then you went back and everything was ripped out and something else went in so i I, I have sensitivity to that, um, much like Councilor Yang talks about, um, you know, these these might seem like small things, but they're big, big things, especially if you're a gardener, you'll know what I'm talking about. You put, you put the perennials in because you don't want to go back to them next year, you want them to come back. So we're, I don't know whether or not we just don't know what we're doing or, you know, we, cho we chose the wrong things in the area, but all I know is that we're spending a lot of money over and over again in certain areas and then... In other areas where we spent six million dollars for a park, we're not taking care of it. So it's very those those things are really bothersome to me. So that's a more comments. I, if you want to, if you want to respond to it, does it mean that you don't have enough people, Dave? I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I can actually respond to each of that if it's helpful, Council Three, yeah. Mr. Chairman. So as it relates to Kincaid, I agree with you. Like we we have a subcontractor who is responsible for maintenance there who has let us down. And what we have done, we've actually taken over the maintenance in the last couple of weeks because I saw the same things that you just pointed out, and I'm not happy with it at all. So the city has taken over maintenance sooner than we other would have uh, otherwise would have contractually because that the public doesn't care about the legal battles with the subcontractors. So we've just taken them over and we'll work it out with them. Mm -hmm. As it relates to Elm Ave. You're right. The public doesn't care, but I do. And I appreciate that, David. I just really need that attention right. to be taken care of over there. So I, I, I agree you. with it completely. I see the same things that you do down there and they were driving me nuts. So we stepped in, you know, ahead of a legal fight with the contractor. Well, the the park and the millions that the city spent there don't look good. You know, we're going to step in there and stop maintenance sooner than we otherwise should have, and we'll resolve the legal issues on the side. Relative mm -hmm. to Elm Ave, we didn't throw any of that plant material away. That's being moved uh, around the city uh, at different locations. That's being transplanted. Uh, from the day I started here, the neighbors in and around Elm Ave uh, raised some concerns, and I think I talked to you uh, when I first came on. The ornamental grasses and the sight lines that were on Elm Ave, along with the lack of color and pop on Elm Ave as well too. So we were able to come up with a new planting design in-house by one of our talented uh, staff workers who came up with a, a new planting plan. They also did the planting plan um, within uh, a few of the other parks as well. So we're able to save the material that was on there, transplanted to different locations, and I think meet some of the concerns and suggestions that some of the uh, local neighbors had over the course of the last uh, couple of years. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it was done haphazardly or without a plan or that that uh, investment that was originally made was wasted. Those were transplanted uh, to other locations in the city. Well, glad to hear that. And and the thing about it is it's those same neighbors that have the problem with that or having the problem with what's happening now because they don't know what's happening. I think that's another piece of the puzzle that's missing. So, you know, you had an area that, that they, and I think 
for some of them, they were glad the grass went away, but then it was, it was weeks that they got ripped out and mulch got put in and they thought, is that all we're going to get? They don't know. And, and there's not much going on. So it's, it's more of the communication. And I don't, I don't anticipate that you have to go out and talk to every neighbor to tell them what they're doing, but these are opportunities that the city has because we have a website. We could actually put some plans that we're doing to say, these are the things that we're doing in your neighborhood and get the communication out that way. It's just, just it's just really difficult because this, like I said, I go back to the point where, you know, if I call you with a problem, like, you know, the the um, water park that wasn't working, that wasn't even in your, like the Germantown, that wasn't even in your, that's not in your wheelhouse, but you made sure that, that that got turned down because it was 100 degrees out for people to use. But like this type of stuff, not having that communication and being able to tell somebody what's going on. And then I, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I think, and Again, the perennials, the ornamental grasses, it's important that taxpayers, especially the gardeners, we have a lot of incredible gardeners in the city, they're recognizing those things being taken out. And they're not seeing where they're going to, so it's, it's an investment. So I'm glad to hear that those are being, you know, repurposed someplace else. And I, you know, because I, I have a gardener and I have to keep him in a budget because if I wasn't to keep him in a budget, you know, I do have a beautiful garden, but, you know, this we have a budget. So there's the, the last question that I had in regards to, you know, in particular in the department, it seems like, and, and I don't know, it just seems like, and maybe if it's just noticeable because of the pandemic, it seems like there's, that your department in particular has a lot of new purchases for vehicles. And I'm just curious, is that something that came on and how did those, you know, do you know where we, do we know where the, and you may not know this, but do we know where those vehicles were purchased from? Were they pandemic money funds or were they, you know, are they, were they bonded somewhere that I didn't know about? I'm just curious. I'd, I'd have to defer on that one, Council. I, I, I think there are a couple of new vehicles. I don't know that there was, um, I think there were three possibly okay. four pickup trucks um, over the course of the last year and a half or so. Yep. And again, this is, this is no, this is no hit to you. This is more of a, these are the things that people notice. And there seems like, you know, in the budget for the police cars, I get that, but then there's, there's vehicles. That, I think it became more noticeable because the pandemic people just noticed all the new equipment that the city of Quincy has and where's it coming from and how are we paying for it? And it's not identified in our budget. So it becomes a real critique that we have because there's not, that's another line that's not transparent. What's coming on for vehicles? What's coming off? Or what do we need? Um, the other thing that I just raised, and you touched upon this about the, and I know Mr. McCarthy and coming up in time, but you touched upon there's two other things. Um, how many parks are maintained by contractors, and how many parks are maintained by us? Because, or how many contractors does the city do you have on staff um, to you know, to Kincaid Park? And the last one is where's a dog shelter going? Do we know where that's going? <laughs> Uh, the dog shelter is a product that's being overseen by public buildings, but my understanding okay. it's going in that location that it was originally planned on up off Quarry Street near the dog park. Okay. And then the contractors, how many contractors do you currently have um, Have on, I guess, I, I would assume that it's underneath your control, contractors that work on, on parks with the city and then which parks? Yeah, so the only the only real park that we maintain was the uh, Kincaid issue that we're resolving and taking over control. Um, there are uh, contractors that do work within some of the small pocket park uh, pocket parks in the downtown. The other wrinkle to your question is we have a, a pretty robust adopt an island program. So some of mm -hmm. these larger uh, islands, uh, the folks that adopt them may hire contractors to do their work for them. Yeah. And again, I'm just going to go back to, you run a big department. If you, if we, if we put those things on a website, we'd be able to be a little bit more transparent about what's happening for the whole city, because it appears that there's a lot of contractors and I'm, I, I can't say whether or not they, they're through your department or who they're through. And you're absolutely right. They could be through the Island. And again, this was just meant to be reviewed. It would have been better if we reviewed it outside of the budget, but, um, but those two things uh, as well. I'm done asking uh, questions. I will say that I, I, I'm going to approve, um, I'm going to be with, with um, Council, Councilor Pamucci in regards to the golf course, but I'd also like to go back to, um, there's two line items that I'd like to talk about uh, after with that vote. Okay, Ms. Mahoney, let me go around the horn here a little bit and get some more people involved. Um, Chair recognizes President Liang and then Councilor King, Councilor Phelan, and Councilor Palmucci. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. So were we talking about just the cut or are we just asking everything? We're talking we're about talking? a cut. We were talking about the entire parks um, uh, department there for a while, but I'm trying to bring it back to the uh, Furnish Brook golf course. And then if okay, I'm, I'm going to hold on that then if I could, Mr. Chairman, because um, just out of respect for what you had said at the beginning, if we're just talking about the cuts right now, I'm just going to hold until okay. after. Let me go to Councilor Thank Kane. Thank you. you. No Councillor Kane. Let me go to Councillor Phelan, then back to Councillor Kane. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you to Mr. Murphy. Are we actually, have we actually taken over the golf course? Is that part of the city now? Has the lease run out? No, the lease is designed to run out uh, this year. Uh, my understanding is that legal has had conversations about taking over control of the golf course, not mid season to interrupt their operations, but to do so at the end of the golf season, uh, potentially, I think January 1st, um, to, to make it as clean as possible. So, ba so basically we haven't, we haven't taken it over at this point. It, it will be taken over in January. So these, uh, these expenses here, are basically based on a half a year. Correct. They're prorated. So they're prorated. And um, okay. Uh, and we're going to be making it definitely a public golf course. And who would, who would be in charge? Is it going to be the same pro was there before? Is it going to be oversight from the city? I guess the question I would have. The structure would be oversight from the city, the staff uh, that exists. Uh, the mayor wants to, to provide as smooth a transition as possible, uh, both for uh, staff members and residents of the city uh, and also people who use the golf course. So, you know, one of the key to the uh, finances of the golf course is, is not to turn this thing on its head and have all of their members flee uh, and then inherit an asset that uh, numbers don't work. So that's why we've been speaking with... Um, the uh, the board and the, and the membership group up there from the beginning to make sure that uh, this transition goes as smooth as possible. The oversight of the actual course and the operation will happen uh, by the city through this department with the uh, existing staff. They have some very competent and quality staff there, both uh, on the administrative side and on the superintendency. I was uh, very surprised uh, to see um, the quality uh, of the course for a simple uh, nine-hole golf course uh, the superintendent and his staff uh, down there do a, uh, a remarkable job. So I do think there is some talent down there that the mayor uh, would like to, to hold on to. Um, I, I do think that uh, any uncertainty as it relates to um, the budget for that, um, you know, may create some concern on their part. Uh, but I do think the plan is to transition uh, the existing folks that are running the course in a, in a, in a very good way uh, to make them part of our team. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I've been on the Norfolk County Advisory Board for a number of years now, and I also have looked at the, the, the president's, president's golf course budget yearly now for almost 14 years and see there is a benefit to bringing that in. There's also a benefit to keeping it as open space. But as a ward counselor, I also have to defer to uh, Ward 3 Councilor Kane and say, you know, before we move forward with all this, if we haven't taken it over yet, there should definitely be a conversation with the ward councilor and the neighbors in that area. I'm not, you know, I, I support Councilor Kane on that. You should definitely uh, be part of it and let them know exactly what's going on there. And I think that's a that's an important part because originally, when I got in my fight with uh, Furnace Golf Course, the area where Councilor Kane is was part of Ward Five. And it was the residents there who were very upset with the golf course. And I think, um, I think we need to, um, as the city is getting, getting ready to transition, there should also be a meeting with the, the uh, you know, I'm, I'm just saying what Councilor Kane said. He's, he's, he's absolutely correct on this. And I would say that it should be a meeting with, uh, with the wooden color that Councilor Kane was set up. Because I remember when I was the ward councilor up there, there was a lot of comments from the um, neighbors on different issues that they were having problems with. And I constantly had problems dealing with uh, with Furnacebrook Golf Course. But, um, you know, I'm going to reserve, I know Councilor Kane wants to speak, and I'm going to reserve, as a, as a fellow ward councilor, I'm going to I'm going to yield my time to him because I think that that is a very important issue that the neighbors have input in what's going on up there. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Phelan. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, Council Kane. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I think the only I have a request, if possible, um, because I don't I don't want to see that money taken out for uh, you know maintenance that would be taken care of for the club and for the course. Um, I doubt you're going to let the course go on un, uh, unmanned, for lack of a better term, right? So you're going to figure out how to 
operate it anyway. So if you take the money, it'll probably come from somewhere else. But um, I'd like to give Commissioner Murphy an opportunity to come back if we can put this portion of the budget on hold to show us uh, the historical performance of the club and the uh, projected performance of the club and how that will be offset by uh, these budgetary items that have been proposed in here. I think that would make sense if we look at it from a fully operational perspective, not having those details tonight. Okay, that's a good thought, Councilor Kane. Um, um, thoughts on that, uh, Commissioner Murphy? Real quick before I go around to a few other people. Uh, I'll defer to the council. My, my, my objective here isn't to force anybody into a decision if they don't have information that they need to make that decision. So whatever the will of the council is, I will, I will of course, comply. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mr. Murphy. Let me recognize Council Palmucci, President Liang, and then Councilor DeBona. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I'm thankful for the opportunity to uh, listen to my colleagues. I always find that very helpful and, um, and crystallizing my opinions and, and um, figuring out different aspects of the issue. And I, I had an idea similar to what I think Councilor Kane is suggesting, and um, I'll let him tell me if this doesn't achieve the results he's looking for. But um, I was thinking about it and listening to other folks talk, and I thought my, the purpose of my motion to cut this was not to hurt anybody. You know, there, I cut the personal services, which are people's salaries, um, and, and that's not my intention. Uh, the purpose was to force uh, public discussion about this this issue as to whether or not the city should be running a golf course uh, to get input from area residents in the community at large. And, and I, too, uh, I forget who else said it, but I, too, am very surprised that that um, the ward councilor wasn't engaged in more um, by the administration. I, it's disappointing uh, as a fellow ward councilor. But what, so what I was going to do is um, I was going to withdraw my motion and then make a new motion. Uh, the the total the total budget for the golf course is four hundred and one thousand five hundred dollars. So what I was thinking about doing um, was making a motion to cut three fourths of the golf court but golf course budget. So cutting three hundred thousand of that four hundred and one five hundred five hundred, um, so that the operations can continue unabated for one quarter, which is three months. It'll take us into October, which gives the administration three months. Um, to facilitate a discussion with the stakeholders here in the council. Um, and I'm happy to do that or withdraw the motion. I, I kind of defer to, to Councillor Kane um, on this, but I, but I think if we, if we don't give them all the money now, then they have to come back to us to get the rest. So we're going to force that discussion. And, and I think kind of building on what you were saying is we don't want the maintenance to go. I don't want people to not get paid. So if we give them a quarter, that's plenty of time, I would think, three months to... Um, to have this important discussion. But I, again, I defer to you, Councilor Kane. Councilor uh, Palmucci, I, I think that um, I certainly appreciate your thoughts on this and uh, normally I'd be with you 100%. I would like to see that this pencils out. I think if, if you would entertain me on that, if we could put this on hold and we can see uh, how the forecast look for revenues so that it can be funded uh, through the year during the oper when the operations are taken over, I think that would be an appropriate path. And, you know, we can come back tomorrow and look at this. I'm sure Commissioner Murphy would be happy to put that together. That's fine. Uh, that's fine. I, I, my concern with that is it only gives us like 37 days, but that I'm fine with that. So we'll, um, traditionally, anytime a counselor asks to hold a budget, the budget just goes on hold. It's almost like an objection. So um, I, I'll withdraw my motion for the time being. And Councillor Kane, um, you know, I support his, his request to put the, the budget on hold and we'll get back to it um, at the end. Uh, thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> thank you, Councillor Kane. And let me go to President Liang and then to Councillor DeBona. Thank you. Thank you for coming back, Mr. Chairman. This this didn't have to do with um, golf course. There are other questions I had in addition to this uh, for the budget as well. So, um, hi, Dave. I have a question about a couple of the offsets that you have in here. So, for the top line item in my budget book here, so CPA administrator is 50284 and then it has CPA administrator offset for a difference of a couple hundred dollars more, but it's a it's a negative. So can you just explain those two line items to me? Uh, the offsets are put in uh, by the Muni Fire Office. Um, so I would defer to uh, Mr. Mason on both the tree offset um, and the CPA uh, admin offset as well. You read my mind. That was my other question, was the tree offset. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I got it. 
Um, to that CPA offset is um, it's related to that CPS uh, CBA appropriation that was done on I believe it was on Monday, um, and that's merely the administrative expense side of the CPA. And the true offset similarly is related to, is very similar, and will the appropriation will occur at this time next year um, if the body so chooses to pass this is um, from the hotel motel tax. Okay, but I think my so I think my question is more so though as far as what the difference is. So if you look at the tree offset for three hundred thousand, right, and then um, down on the next line, the contraction of the tree offset for four hundred thousand, it's it's exact, right? The improvements on trees is four hundred thousand, then it's a tree offset for four hundred thousand. So this one's off by again a couple hundred dollars. I'm just trying to understand, shouldn't it be exact? So I can't. Technically, if I'm changing this, I would be adding to the budget, which I can't do. But aren't the two things supposed to match the way they are in the tree offset as well? So with personal service, the way the CPA works is that it's an X percentage of the CPA fund, which is projected to increase this year as it falls its trend line. But there's been no salary increases. So that falls in line with what our projected salary increases, I believe, are. And if we didn't do that, we'd have to come back for that whatever percent increase um, would have to be later on. So this is done similar to that salary and increase in the budgetary reserve. This is a very similar process, just um, has to be a right, little- but we do, uh, Sorry about that. Um, it, but we do know that the, there isn't, because it, it says the exact number in here already. So we know that it's not going to be an increase, right? It says right here it's 50,284 for the CPA administrator. So shouldn't the offset be also 50,284? budget to I feel like this is the second time I've asked you something that the, there's like now this weird pause loading moment. So I apologize yeah, no, for I'm sorry about that. Into it. So just know uh, we all stare at you, counselor, during these pauses. <laughs> what is it? We all just stare at your screen during these pauses. Well, that makes me feel comfortable. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. So that is what I. I described earlier, counselor, that would be us per, that salary budgetary increase, that same percentage, but being um, expressed in the offset. Because the budgetary increase, this position is paid for out of the CPA fund. The budgetary mm -hmm. increase for salaries is paid out of the general fund. So we have to reflect that within the CPA CPA admin offset. Now, if it does end up get, if it does end up being used, for example, the unions don't agree to the contract. Um, and there isn't a move to increase salaries, then that would merely just fall into surplus. Like it, uh, it would merely be adjusted in the vote next year during the CPA uh, vote that we do every year. Okay, but because it's it's not a it's not a positive here, right? The um the offset it's a negative. So if it ends up not being the full four seventy seven, but in fact two eighty four, then we're not pulling enough into the budget. Isn't that the case? I'm just gonna, I don't know. I think I'm just not understanding sure. why it's Offsets not. Are inverse. An, an offset in a budget, because a budget's a negative, a budget's an expense document. So an offset in a budget is a positive. So this is, re this is relative to like a CPA offset that we voted on on Monday, and it's just a holder. The Respectfully, when the uh, council orders in front of the council, um, the body is approving org codes. So these object codes are merely representing the bottom line for each of these sections. So it's how we get to that calculation that you see in that org code right beside personal services. Um, so this is what the this is us projecting that this time next year, when we're in front of the body looking for the CPA appropriation from the administrative for the administrative side, that it will be that number. Okay. All right. It would just be helpful, I think, moving forward if we have an understanding of these offsets then coming into it, just because again, when I'm looking at this, even last year, it was under what was projected there as well. Um, so just, I just wanna make sure that, you know, when it comes to the bookkeeping side of things that um, we're doing less estimating as much as possible, particularly if we know for this year, this fiscal year, we're not doing a raise that line item. Um, all right, well, I appreciate the explanation uh, in multiple different ways, Eric. Um, back to you, Dave, if I could, so for, the um, the improvements on the trees I see here that you bumped it up to four hundred thousand, which is is super exciting to see. Um, you know, I, to Councilor Pemberton's point earlier, right? There's a lot of folks um, who do care, right, and do actually uh, want to make sure that you know trees that need to be cut down genuinely need to be cut down, right? Like I really don't 
the, the concerns that I get anyways, and you know, because you're super responsive when I talk to you as well, is when folks ask for a tree to be cut down, they don't do it lightly, right? They want you to go out and actually take a look at it first and, you know, make sure that it's a tree that really is, is dead before actually cutting it down, right? Or if it needs to be trimmed, they prefer that to be the option. And so um, my question to you, I think is just, you know, with respect to the trees that you're planting across the city right now, is this something where you are, um, are you, are you using trees that are a lot smaller and going to grow over time? Are you bringing in trees from other places that are already like a sizable, um, I guess, footprint, right? And my question for that reason is because I've also had a lot of folks reach out um, and express a lot of concerns right now about the heat waves that we've been having. Um, obviously concerns for folks who are, you know, outside a lot more, who for whatever reason can't get shade. And, you know, that's, that's the rising heat essentially that's happening across the city is a concern that's been brought to my attention. And so I'm just curious, you know, people are happy that we're doing more tree planting across the city, but now the, the follow-up question to that, uh, which we have the luxury of asking now, which is good, I think, is what kind of trees are we planting and are we being intentional about the types of trees we're planting? Mr. Chairman to uh, Council President, yes, uh, we actually spend a lot of time, uh, our tree warden is very actively involved in species planting. You know, one of the biggest problems we have in the city as it relates to our urban forest is the conflict between utilities and our trees. And through the years, the utility companies have done uh, quite a bit of damage. Uh, but truth be told, a lot of the trees that were planted underneath the wires uh, are too big uh, to be planted in those particular spots. So we are extremely deliberate to the point of actually citing each specific species at a location to make sure whether it's width of the loan border, whether it's the utility clearance, whether it's the side clearance, whether it's the uh, width of the trees that relates to the sidewalk or the front walk. We, we literally go out and cite every single uh, tree that we plant uh, to make sure that the species is appropriate for the location that it's going in. So now we also work hand in hand with the DCR. Uh, uh, Aaron Lehman is the DCR forester and they plant um, smaller trees. They, they plant one, one and a half uh, inch caliper trees. The city spec is between two and two and a half caliper. In the last contract that we received, uh, we, that we went through um, with uh, Cassidy, uh, most of those trees were two and a half inch caliper. So, you know, they still take a little while to grow, uh, especially in a, a stressed urban environment. But, you know, I, I do think as far as making sure we can meet the uh, tree requests that we have uh, versus planting something of, of substance that's going to make an immediate impact. I think we're in that sweet spot right now. Okay. I think, thank you for clarifying. I think um, to that point that I'd love to follow up with you offline about um, what we can do to sort of combat the issues that you're facing up with the utility companies too, because, you know, you can only do so much, right? If they're coming in and there's mandated work that they have to do, um, that's taking away from all the effort and frankly, the money you're putting into the work you're doing. I'm sure there's something that we can try to figure out to, um, to work around that. So I'll make sure to follow up with you offline, but thank you for the information. Thank you. Thank you, President Liang. Uh, Chair recognizes Councilor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just getting a little bit back to, I know this is put on reserve for, for the next um, discussion for tomorrow, but I'd like to add a few things and, and, and get a little light upon, you know, uh, just the whole getting into the golf business and um, thinking about Quincy College and, the nursing program a few years ago and not having the proper oversight of knowing that information ahead of time. And um, getting for clarifications, $401,000, $401,500 is the total budget for this. Is that correct? Is that that's, what it's going to do to operate the entire facility? No, Council, that's the prorated amount. I think there's a little uh, bit of confusion around that. This appropriation uh, comports with the city taking over the golf course on July 1. There isn't a June 1st deadline that that the city or the council faces as it relates to this particular budget item. So I, I don't want anyone to think that um, the clock is ticking in a few weeks from now. We're not going to have any money to support golf course operations. This budget is intended to be a six-month prorated budget um, in the 401 uh, $500 is what's in there for June, uh, January 1 through June 30th of next year. So half of this fiscal year. So you're trying to say it probably is approximately about $800,000 for the total budget. Is, is that roughly the amount to, to operate the entire operation? Correct. Our, our estimates based on the numbers provided by the golf course is approximately $800,000 a year uh, with revenue right. projections uh, in the mid to upper rates. You know, the only reason why I'm asking this is we're going to get into the golf business and um, it's an exclusive group of folks that, that do the golfing. I remember when we established the, the TPAL department, the traffic park and alarm and lighting, and we had to move different people from different departments over to that. And 
who who would you think would be doing the grass cutting? If um, would it be under your department to do the grass cutting? Because that would add to a lot more responsibilities. The requested appropriation would handle the entire maintenance requirement of the uh, golf course. We have uh, seasonal help uh, and a superintendent within this budget request that would handle that. I would not recommend pulling folks off of parks and cemeteries and sending them to the golf course. Their requested appropriation would be enough to handle the actual maintenance and operation of the golf course. Thank you for clarifying that. I'm just thinking back a little bit, get back to Councillor um, Phelan being the advisory board of the Norfolk County um, Advisory Board. And the president's golf course is under the jurisdiction of Norfolk County. And every position, every employee that goes through there has to get the approval from the county commissioners. And you basically have a line item on there that just states the person's name, where they're from, and the amount that they're going to be getting, getting paid. And um, anybody who comes in and anybody who, you know, new hires or people that are retiring or people that are uh, resigning have to go through the county commissioners. And it's a great oversight because, you know, the employees going in, you know, the employees going out, you know, if you have any red flags where you have shortfalls and you have to make up for it, whatever the case may be, summer help, all these different things. And I'm just looking at if we're going to get into the golf business and I'm thinking about the Quincy College businesses, we need oversight. So. I know that Council Palmucci is very good on legislation. Um, could we even be into writing up legislation on how we're going to operate this rather than just give the keys to the ignition to the executive body, which is you guys, and say, okay, run it. And if it does, if it fails, guess what? We're all, we're all in trouble because now it's on the taxpayers of the city of Quincy. We have no oversight. We have no control over who gets hired or who gets fired or who needs to be replaced or having the oversight of just seeing the facility um, basically on a daily basis, the operational side of it and making sure that we have proper oversight. At the end of the day, we approve this and then it goes under and it, it doesn't uh, fulfill the, the expectations of the 800,000, which I know is going to grow to a million dollars in a few years. And obviously, you know, your new positions or whatever the case may be. And I, I, I know all these other departments have done it in the past is, I don't want to be in a situation of proving something. Then in two years, there's fault problems and issues, and we didn't establish any type of regulation legislation to cover the taxpayers of the city. That's my issue because it's on the city council because we are proving the funding for this if we go forward with it. We're taking on something that is basically funded, going to be in, in the purview of the taxpayers of the city. Is, is that correct? I mean, if you take this on... Councilor, can I jump in for a second and make a suggestion? Um, I know we're going to pull this out tonight. We're not going to approve it. Uh, but all the questions you have are all the questions that Councilor Kane has that he hasn't seen yet. Okay. And I'm wondering if tomorrow night Mr. Murphy could come back and we could pull out. Because there's different things in here. I want to make sure the numbers are right on, on, on everything, that we covered everything in this in this whole department because there's rental expenses and cot rental and et cetera. Why don't we pull out the golf numbers? Yeah. Have somebody cut me off if I'm, if I'm wrong, but, but uh, I have commissioner Murphy and uh, Mr. Walker get with uh, counselor Kane and with us early on in September, we start right up with a early presentation on the golf course and then we can add the money back in if we feel, because we've got this half a year, um, half a year thing going right now. So I'm, I'm looking to pull it out and come back in September, get a presentation in, get Councillor Kane totally warmed up on, on the whole project as long as, as well as everybody here. And then, and then make a move in September with the golf section and at that point, we can either put it in or we can modify it or we can keep it out. Just thoughts on that. Uh, Commissioner Murphy, I, I don't want to mess anything up, but or, or, or Chief of Staff Walker, but any comments on that? Will that what will that do? And, and again, as Council Palmucci said and Council Kane said, you know, um, I don't want to hurt anybody, but I think a presentation would be in order before we plugged into this and that way we can take out a lot of uh, 
questions out of this, Dave, and tomorrow night we could do, and then what we have left in the box and, and plug that back in. But Mr. Murphy, I'll, I'll could, ask you, Mr. If I Walker. Could, Mr. Chairman, I just, I just want to just, just finish up with this. That's all. Those are just my concerns. And yeah. if I'm going to be voting on anything, if we have to approve some funding tomorrow, I want to make sure that that's on record, that those are my concerns moving forward. And that, that's all, because I have a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpayers of the city. So I need to make sure if I'm going to approve things that we follow well, through on what we are supposed to do. So that's all. That's Council, if we take that. it out, if we take it out tomorrow and don't act on it until September, it won't be in there tomorrow. So I just want to get the okay. thoughts of, of the administration if I could. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Either Mr. Walker or Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as Commissioner Murphy mentioned, this is not a time sensitive uh, issue in, in our minds. Uh, if it's the body's wish to break out the golf course operational costs um, for presentation in the fall, I, I think that's that, that's doable um, from, from our perspective. Um, I guess, and, and I don't want to get into the 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 business of the body to any great extent, it's not my role, but um, it, it may make sense just to save everyone the time and, and energy. To uh, There's some talk about bringing Commissioner Murphy back tomorrow night. I think if the body... No, whatever a, works, Mr. Walker, makes, I understand. Whatever makes works. A recommend, makes a recommendation to cut the budget as it stands right now by the amount, and then we come back in the fall for that same amount, I think that that, that addresses that issue. Is that... Um, Seem appropriate. Well, that's what I, I'm just, you know, I, I agree with Councilor Phelan. And, and if something like this was going on on Ward 1, you know, I'd be the first one coming up to the office. So uh, I, I, Councilor Kane, uh, well, we're not, all of we're us not trying to make a big deal of this, really. No, somebody but I mean, made, you should somebody, be involved. Somebody made, no, 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 listen. So we're well aware that there's a transition of a golf course taking place uh, from a contract that was long ago. We were paying taxes on this thing for a club that wasn't entirely enjoyed by the city. Okay. Someone, one of my colleagues just made a cut to the budget and in order to save this portion, in order to justify it, I'm asking for just more details. And, and just, just on that piece, how can we cover that cost to make sure that we don't have to cut that money? It's very simple. This, this wasn't meant to be a big deal and we're, we are spending a lot of time on it. Uh, well, Council, so I'm just saying, are we going to get that detail and all those answers by tomorrow night? I don't know. I, I, I don't I think so. You know, I'm not, okay. I'm not making it. I, that's what I'm asking. I, I think it's kind of a rush job to throw something together that we'd probably have more questions. Well, the rush, the rush <laughs> with all due respect, the rush job is throwing this in here. The the planning would be, hey, here's this thing. Okay. No, no, I agree. That's what I'm yeah. saying. We pull it out. Yeah. But I don't think you're going to get your answers tomorrow night. No, that's fine. I just want I, I want to just make sure we're all on the same page. Again, this yeah. isn't a big deal. We know where we're going. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 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 happy. We're, I'm just trying to protect. Ward three. That's it. Quickly, let me go to Councilor Palmucci and then we'll we'll make a move here. I think what Mr. Walker suggested is uh, probably the, the best idea, which is let's take this out of the budget right now. We'll come back on it when we need to and have a larger discussion. So I'd, I'd move to cut the four hundred and one thousand five hundred dollars. OK. So we have a motion to cut four hundred and one five hundred from the parks uh, department, uh, those um, item numbers that involve the golf course. Uh, any comments on the motion? And then we'll take a roll call. It's a big number. No comments. Jen, can you call a roll? Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. Council Phelan. Yes. Chairman McCarthy. Yes. And members. Passes. And members. Okay. Approve as amended. I get yes. Are you motioning? Motion as amended to cut 401, 500 from the box. Any, Mrs. Mahoney on the motion on amended? <laughs> Not on the motion. I, I have um I, I, I had one I had one other question and then I also had a cut that I wanted to make as well. Okay. <laughs> Let's go through 
Councillor Kane has just amended okay. to cut 401, 500. Um, Jen, can you call a roll? Point of order. There's going to be another amendment. All right. So I, so, I, so my motion was for the cut which passed. So now the budget that we would be approving is $401,000 less. And I think Councillor Kane was moving approval of the total budget. And what Councillor Mahoney is saying to you is she wants to make another cut to that okay. budget before we vote on the budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Go right ahead, Council um, Mahoney. Before I make that cut, I just have one other question to um, Dave, Dave Murphy, which is um, in the Mar Marymount Park, I noticed that there's a new fence that's going up in Marymount Park. Where is that getting paid out of, just out of curiosity? That is the uh, CIP. There is a line in there for uh, Marymount Park improvements um, in the master plan that was approved a number of years ago uh, yeah. for improvements to Marymount Park. I figured it was there. I just didn't know where it was coming from, so I just wanted to make a note of that. So, um, and then my question is, in your horticultural labor and handyman labor, they're both $36,000. They're both new new appointments, and they're, both, they're all for the downtown, right? They're both for the downtown? Those are two downtown appointments, correct? Okay, so those are the two I want to cut. So five one two four one one and five one two four one two for um, seventy two thousand dollars. And um, again, I, I just I'm not justifying any new um, new new um, positions of the budget. And that is the reason why I'm cutting that. And also, it's because of the downtown and the use of the diff for um, for for hiring people. So just I think we just need to be a little bit clearer about what we're doing and how we're handling the downtown. So those two items are what I'd like to cut. Make what are the sense. item numbers again, Mrs. Mahoney? 512411, 512412, both are $36,000 for a total of $72,000. Okay, so for clarification, for clarification, what are what are these what are they for? Horticultural labor and a handyman labor. New positions. I can can I add some meat to that bone, Mr. Chairman? Please. Those are uh, new positions to to raise Council Mahoney's point from earlier. We're building new parks and we should be taking care of them. These are new positions to take care of the uh, new parks that we're building in the downtown. Yep. And we have we have staff and, and contractors too. So. Okay. So I'd like to do two things here, if I could. Um, Take the 401, 500 cut first, and then come back to the $72,000 cut, if that's okay. We already approved the 400. Say it again, Jen. We already approved the 400. We're just doing the 72 now. Oh, okay. I didn't even say we'll all those. As amended once, if this passes, the two total. Oh, I didn't even know. I thought I was going to call a roll call or, or all those in favor with the as amended, but that's okay. So, um, we have another cut here, 512411, 512-412, $72,000. Um, motion made by Mrs. Mahoney. Jen, can you call a roll? On the motion. On the motion. Oh, thank you, Chairman McCarthy. Uh, just a Sorry, quick question, Council. Uh, Commissioner Murphy. Uh, I know it was just mentioned that you know we have current staff and we have uh, contractors to take care of downtown parks. Uh, just as a general rule of thumb, is it uh, more financially beneficial for the city to in-house labor uh, as opposed to a contractor take care of parks? Uh, three, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Council, I think the answer isn't all of one or the other. I think it depends on uh, what we're doing uh, and what we're asking them to do. So, you know, this proposal uh, put forward uh, by the mayor for the downtown department was to recognize the millions that we've invested uh, not just uh, in Hancock Adams Common, which we've already have staff with two employees, uh, but also Kilroy Square and now the new Generals Park. I don't know if you had a chance to um, see it yet, uh, but it's it's an area that's going to require um, some attention. And I think that uh, his objective is to hire additional staff to make sure that we can maintain some of the investment we've made in the downtown. Thank you. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Beeney, can you call Councilor DeBona? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just real quick about, um, you know, we're, we're, we're obviously a growing city. And the biggest thing that I get personally is, especially being a community preservation committee member, is we need to preserve open space. We need to preserve green space. We need to do more parks. We, 
And it does require more manpower. I hate to say it. It really does at the end of the day. And we want to maintain that. So these two positions I, or, or appropriations of funding is not a huge amount that we need to do the work that we need appropriately. So where I usually will approve a cut where it's notable, this is not a, a huge amount to ask for. Um, so I, I'm not going to support this particular cut. And I, I, I do know that the city's grown. We need to preserve these parks. And I want to make sure that we have the proper manpower to do it correctly. So I'm, I'm not going to support this one, although I will support other ones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, can I just speak on something quickly? Thank you, Councilor DeBuana. Yeah, Mrs. Mahoney, real quick. So the reason why I'm cutting these is because they're specifically specified for the downtown. And they're only they're being they're being identified as a horticultural laborer and a handyman specifically for only the downtown. I have a problem with the fact that we just built a downtown and we then we tried to have a department in the downtown, which was like, you know, only going to take care of the pet projects of the downtown. And I did talk about Kincaid. Kincaid is the one that had the contractor that they had a problem with. And Kincaid looks absolutely horrific. Not touched, not taken care of. I don't care who's taking care of it. It's being managed improperly. These are two positions that are being hired specifically for the downtown. And taxpayers of the city feel as though they're not being taken care of in other areas of down, other areas of the city. But these two people that are being hired are specified specifically for the downtown. And I'm not here to hire people specifically for certain parks in the downtown. That's why I'm cutting it. So. Remember that when we're at the doors. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, so the cut for 72,000 is on the floor. Jen, can um, you call a roll? Councilor Andronico. No. Councilor Kane. No. Councilor DeBona. No. Councilor Harris. No. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. Councilor Phelan. No. Chairman McCarthy. No. Motion fails. Six to three. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we need so to we'll, motion. We will just for just before we move on to the next um, item, which is rec. We will not see Mr. Murphy tomorrow. We will regroup on this and um, get a presentation together and uh, get more uh, information on the golf course and move forward, correct? We'll also need to move, move approval of the budget as amended. As amended. No, no, I know we're gonna do that, but we're not gonna see Mr. Murphy tomorrow. I just wanted to get that before we went on to a different subject. So, um, Mr. Mr. Uh, Councilor Palmoose, you just made a motion as amended to approve the budget. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Thanks, thanks, Commissioner Murphy, for uh, going through that. Thank you. Um, recreation's up next. I'm happy to be joined uh, tonight by uh, Michelle Hanley. Michelle Hanley is our Recreation Director. And uh, if I may, uh, in other areas of our budget, we've mentioned the job uh, of the folks that work in this department do from uh, Mr. Logan and the staff of the cemetery uh, to the entire park and forestry staff. Uh, what Mrs. Hanley has done through the pandemic, uh, and I know the council has recognized her as a COVID hero, um, I'm proud to say was recognized by the National Rec and Park Association in their keynote address in their annual conference. Uh, what uh, the Quincy Rec was able to pull off in the last year uh, was remarkable. If you remember last July, uh, people weren't conducting programming uh, of any kind, and yet Michelle and her team uh, working with Ruth Jones and others put together a robust recreation program um, that really met the needs of, of all of our residents in a time when uh, very few organizations were doing so. Many other communities around us just simply walked away and canceled the summer programming. So uh, before I turned it over to Michelle, uh, I did want to thank her and recognize her for an outstanding job once again last year, especially in light of uh, the issues of the pandemic. So uh, Michelle, if you want to handle the, uh, the budget piece. Motion to approve. Motion by Councillor Kane to approve any comments on the motion? Councilor Palmucci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess Ms. Hanley, you're you're um, you're handling the questions. I just uh, I just had a question about the rec program coordinator. Um, I believe it's line uh, five one two seven six zero. Can you tell me what's going on with that line? 
It was yeah, it was yeah. previously being paid under under a different line item, right? It was absolutely um, was previously for the um, uh, uh, Barry Welch retired in uh, February, and by April we realized that two people in the department full time was not enough to huh. make services, and so we um, put together a job description and a program coordinator was appointed and was previously paid out of line 510110, uh, the salary wage permanent line. Um, uh, this year we uh, moved that out. So that's not a new hire or a new employee. It's just rather than being paid hourly, this person um, will now be salaried. Okay, so it's not a new position. It's just you're, you're, you're paying them differently. Exactly. And Barry Welch was so valuable, two people couldn't do his job when he left, right? Is that well, what you're we, had three. <laughs> we had three full-time employees when oh, okay. Barry was here. Um, yeah. The program manager, a director of recreation, and the clerk, one yeah. typist. Yeah. yeah, I suspect you're uh, just as valuable as Barry, so we don't want to lose you. Uh, thank you for the good job you do. Keep it up. Thank you, Councilor Palmucci. Thank you, Councilor Palmucci. Any other questions? Councilor DeMona. Just a quick comment, Mr. Chairman. Just thank you for all your hard work over there, uh, Michelle, and um, you know the recreation department and expanding it and going into the summer programs right now and the swim programs. And it's been great for the kids of the city of Quincy. So I just want to thank you for it. I'm happy to have some new items and, and new funding for proper areas where we need to invest into our kids. So I'm happy to support this budget. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you for the department. Thank you, Mr. Murphy, for this as well. Everybody in the in the, in the in the group, your your crew. Thank you, Councilor DeBona. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor DeBona. Anyone else? All right. There's a motion to approve the rec portion of the Natural Resources Department. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Commissioner Murphy, thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Council. Appreciate it. Uh, next up is old friend, Director Cassani of TPAL. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, before you tonight, we have the uh, fiscal 22 uh, TPAL budget. Um, by and large, uh, pretty similar from you know year over year. Uh, the biggest difference that you'll notice uh, is that we have increased the offset uh, to nine hundred thousand dollars from six hundred thousand dollars where it had been for a number of years, and we have added in a parking garage operations line item for three hundred thousand um, dollars into the budget. Um, that would pay for the contractor that we have working at the garage, who really has been invaluable uh, manning that facility 24 hours a day. Um, and as anyone who has gone through there would attest, I think it's as clean and safe a feeling a garage as you'll find anywhere, um, which was something that I know was incredibly important while that facility was being developed. Um, unfortunately, in today's day and age, as we've seen certainly in other places around the country, not in Quincy, thank God, um, if you leave things unattended for a short period of time, a great deal of damage can be done very quickly. So we feel very strongly that the presence we have over there 24 hours a day is uh, is invaluable to maintain the integrity of, of the garage. Um, apart from that, um, we have a, we've restored the full funding to the bike lane improvements um, line item and um, you know a couple of other odds and ends in here, but by and large that sort of covers the, the biggest thrust uh, was that Increasing the offset in the um, the contractual line item there, that, uh, relative to parking garage operations. Thank you, Mr. Cassani. Any questions for Mr. Cassani, President Liang? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, Chris. Um, and we have a couple of questions, which I think is a good thing. When you first started, I remember with this new department um, getting created, there were, uh, I think, you know, hours I think spent on having a conversation. I think you've done a phenomenal job. Um, similar to what we're saying to Dave. You're incredibly responsive. I know it doesn't matter what time of day it is. If there's a resident that has some random question about like a small light somewhere on some side street, you are super responsive. And, and I just really want to thank you for that. Um, as far as the parking receipt offsets go, is that being increased because of the parking receipts we're getting from the garage now? 
Yes. So um, the parking receipts for the garage, you know, we were able to sort of crash land the plane, you might say, during fiscal 21. Um, the revenues picked up. We had, you know, a couple months there where we brought in absolutely nothing, um, which was sort of a deliberate, you know, move to sort of not knowing what the situation of the pandemic was. Um, we sort of hit a low of, uh, of credit card receipts on the monthly basis. We certainly had a gigantic drop in our monthlies. Um, but then what we noticed was a very steady trend upward um, as COVID restrictions were loosened um, to the point of last month, you know, collecting almost $32,000 in credit card receipts, which doesn't even get into, you know, some of the monthlies and the cash and the residential component that, um, you know, from Peter O'Connell's project and from the LBC project. So um, the projection that we're making of a $900,000 offset is really, I, I would say, a very conservative projection based on the performance we've seen over the last few months. Um, and obviously, look, if anything happens COVID related, we think as long as the restrictions don't go to a complete lockdown type scenario, that the floor was realized that we have these residential buildings being lived in and that we'll be able to reach these numbers um, quite easily, even if we see um, some type of you know, restrictions return in the fall. Okay, thank you. And that actually leads me to my second question, which is the parking garage operations um, amount that's being requested, right? And so walk me through whether it's the receipt side, actually, yeah, walk me through the receipt side and the um, the payment to maintain and operate the garage side, right? And to my understanding, in my recollection, when we were looking at this garage and building it out, there was a, a certain part of ownership, essentially, of the garage with respect to the parking spots that the O'Connell building and the LBC building would be taking over, right? So the receipts would be coming in for residents, um, they would have to pay a certain monthly, you know, cost to the two properties, right? And then that money doesn't come to the city. But then on the flip side of that, I would imagine that also they would be contributing to the cost of maintaining the garage as well. Is that correct? So um, the uh, Bill Gary, Attorney Gary has, you know, did, went to great lengths to negotiate the various parking leases with um, Peter O'Connell's project and the LBC project. And those leases really stipulate sort of what the city's responsibilities are and what their responsibilities are. And really, I mean, I could be wrong here. I don't want to speak for Attorney Gary, but their responsibilities sort of end at paying us. And our responsibilities begin at maintaining that infrastructure. Um, so they are paying right now $100 a month per space to the city of Quincy. They charge their residents a different rate, which is not uncommon. Um, but that is the negotiated rate and that rate will track what we charge monthly customers moving forward. So if there are, you know, adjustments to, due to inflation or, or to get up to market rate or whatever the case may be, that will be the rate that those, uh, those residents pay as well. And it'll just be a single. So they, are, they are paying something into yeah. our maintenance of the garage, right? Exactly. It just gets put into that, that larger account that go, that's really, um, that, you know, you funded the other night, for example, um, that takes care of that offset. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. And again, thank you so much for, um, again, always being so responsive to any wild question that I have when it comes to either sidewalks or, you know, pedestrian lines being painted or lights or speed traps or anything like that. It's just, again, you are just, again, one of the most uh, responsive department heads. So I appreciate it, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, President. Um, Mr. Mahoney? Hey neighbor, <laughs> hi Chris. Um, so I have a couple of quick questions. So um, I know that you're the the increase to the parking offset that's great, the nine hundred thousand. Uh, so when it comes to enforcement of parking throughout the city, I think there's some confusion because people uh, sometimes if there's problems in the city, um, you know, no no parking signs, no parking from here to the corner just different things, they might call the police department and they're not received very, very well when they call the police department because the police will say it's not their job. So I think there's some massive communication as to who's responsible for actually dealing with cars that might be not parked in the right place. And then how do we enforce the rules that we put for the signs that are up throughout the whole city? It seems like we have it figured out in certain areas, but in, cer in certain other areas, it's not. And it's it's really um, discouraging because people get really upset. I know I've talked to you about this, Chris, before, and I've sent people your way and we try to I try to deal with it, but it's it's a it's a big pain point. So if you could just touch on that. Sure. I, I think in some cases, you know, it's force of habit where folks may have called the police station, you know, in the past that, that they continue to call there now. 
um, you know, we certainly do what we can on the website to sort of, you know, our, it's in our name and it's on our page and we describe, you know, what, what we do. Um, so, you know, we do work collaboratively with the police department. You know, the police officers are all duly authorized to write parking tickets. Um, and, you know, certainly in off hours and so forth, you know, um, they do do that. And, you know, paper tickets are issued by the police department, um, you know, on a near daily basis. Um, but, you know, our department really takes a, uh, the responsibility of issuing the parking tickets on that Monday through Friday basis. We typically run an overtime shift um, on the weekends to enforce, you know, certain uh, types of items that, that could plague an issue, a neighborhood or the downtown area or any other commercial area on the weekend. Um, but so we really do try and make it clear that we want people to call us. Like I said, I do think there's a little force of habit there um, in, in calling the police department. So when, you, when we talk about the parking officer receipts, is that from mostly from the garage, though, or is that from your tickets as well? That's just from the garage. Okay. So what is the receipts that from the from the tickets that you write, or who gets the receipts from that? That goes into the general fund, I believe. Goes into the general fund. Okay. And that, you know, um, last year it was a very, you know, small. it will stand out as a very poor year for parking ticket generation. Um, obviously, the pandemic played a huge role in it. And honestly, I think it played a, a more uh, extended role in that so many restaurants did not have anyone sitting inside of them sort yeah. of with that extended parking. So it was very, you know, our, our staff, it was very difficult to sort of get tickets, which you know, people were complying more. So I guess you can't complain um, about that on that front. Okay. So, so it, it, it still was an ongoing problem and I'm not sure. I mean, I know you have some information on the website. I don't know if it's really, a, you kind of have to dig to find that. It's not really a front on it, but it's just, it's definitely a concern. And where do we stand with, I know that you did some uh, neighborhoods for residential parking. Um, I think this, it's more kind of over North Quincy. I know it's over in Ward 2, but where do we stand with the residential parking um, in that program? Um, so what we, what we have done is really, I would say, the Penn's Hill program sort of prompted us to sort of look at sort of how we were managing uh, that program across the city. And, you know, I had said this a number of times before, the, before the, this body relative to that whole program is that, you know, certain parts of the city, take your peninsulas, take parts of West Quincy, take Squanum, you know, um, parts of Quincy Point, et cetera. You know, it's really not important that we're over there all the time checking whether or not people have a free parking permit affixed to their vehicle. Right. Uh, whereas it's very important to make sure that in neighborhoods that are abut the train stations, that mm -hmm. that sort of behavior isn't happening. So we really focused our efforts on encouraging it will require really the folks who live in those areas to apply yeah. online for free. Um, and really leave folks who are not in those areas alone, basically, so that they really just don't have to take yeah. any action. So I know, like the, the like because of the pandemic, they, the the Wilson T station like just basically came online, and then nobody's taking the train again. So, but now that we're kind of coming out of the coming out again, I think maybe not yet, but I, I predict hopefully we won't see any more of this, but more people will start be parking and using the T again. So I see like Wilson and. And those areas in North Quincy in particular is very, very tough because it's just so tight down in North Quincy. So I was just curious to know how those, those areas were going as well. Um, and then the other thing that I have is the bike. So I'm really happy to see the bike lanes. I just have, this is just a question. It was asked by, um, by, um, by a family member, uh, a driver. What is she supposed to do when she goes over Corey Hill if there's an ambulance coming in this traffic on the other side because of the the that I don't know what you call those, but she was like, where do I go? And I was like, just stop. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so she's like, they didn't teach me uh, that. Your, school. We've given, you know, I've given a similar answer to some people. It's like, look, what do you do on water street when that happens? Right. I mean, we have a lot of tight places mm -hmm. and Quill, like Corey street went from being very wide to, to pretty narrow. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, there's, there's work to be done relative to right sizing the amount of bollards um, that we have. Those are flexible. You can drive over them and you're not going to hurt. I'm your not body. telling her that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, in terms of right sizing those, I think that it's been effective in narrowing the road down and helping slow traffic down. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that the initial design, we had never done it before. Um, we probably have more of them over there than you probably need to accomplish the goal that we sought to accomplish. Yeah. Um, I was just curious. It was a question she asked me. I was like, well, that's actually a good question, but, um, and I just told her to pull over stop, but, but, you know, but, but I, but it was, you know, there so lots of feedback about that. People are, like, it does narrow it. I, I actually think that does help. 
it's there's a lot of them. I don't know, you know, I'm not criticizing. There's a lot of them. It's just, um, but and I, I've actually seen people riding their bikes, so that's that's the key for that, right? Yeah, it's been what's um, been great about that project, and I think Quincy Avenue as well, is that you know it really freed up people to more adequately use this, you know, to to walk. I've seen people in wheelchairs on Quincy Avenue navigating that in a much different way than they used to in the past. So yeah, it's. I think these projects, you know, for every um, thing that they take away, they do add something. And if they're adding safety and, and accessibility to people, that's you know a core part of our mission. Yeah, I guess the other question. This is another question that somebody else. This is not a family member. Somebody else said to me, "What are you going to do in the winter when you have to plow? Where does the snow go?" <laughs> I mean, these are real questions people ask me. So I'm what's just, the parting just... <laughs> gift for me to Larry Prendeville, Really, um, no, it's. Uh... <laughs> and now I was like, gonna... "Is that why you're leaving? Because you don't want to deal with the snowstorm." <laughs> It's that uh, those will be removed. They're removable. Um, okay. So I, that's, that's the thing for that. I didn't know because I, I was just like, that's that's actually one I don't I don't have any quick answer for. So I'm glad I'm glad you were here long enough for me to ask that question. <laughs> um, so the other question I have is there's a new position five one two four four three. Um, it looks like it's a laborer and gardener. What's that for? So the uh, working foreman position. So we had a departure um, in the department um, mid year. And, you know, in consultation with the mayor's office, um, it was an employee who came over from DPW who was at that level. Um, the, the decision was made to hire that person um, mid-year. We had the ability, as I'm sure many people are aware, um, and I just would like to, for the record, thank Mr. Steve Cubitt, God rest his soul, for all of his service, mm -hmm. um, when, especially when Steve died, sort of the, some of the um, personnel shifts um, were really necessitated by this. So having a working foreman was something that we had wanted to have while Steve was alive. And certainly when he passed, um, it became, it became something that we really wanted to, to do, um, and got solidified that way. Right. But I don't see where it's, so you said it's, it wasn't in 2021's budget. So I'm trying to figure out because you said it was somebody retired. So where did they retire from? I guess they, a, a, uh, an employee left, um, <laughs> from the traffic maintenance position. So we're forecasting for the, current, the the fiscal 22 that we will have one traffic maintenance person, we'll have one That's working it. foreman, we'll have one signed painter, and one general foreman. Okay. And again, so I, I guess I have to ask through you to, to Mr. Walker, is this, is this an appointed position from the mayor again because there's no job description and nothing, was, nothing came to us to be able to identify this person as being coming into the budget? All right, Madam, uh, Madam Council, can you repeat the question? So before you said, you know, the mayor can appoint somebody into this position. This is a working laborer, gardener, an added position, new position to the budget. It, I realized that it's going to offset to somebody who is who retired. So, you know, it's it's a little bit more than that, though. So this is a new position. So the new position didn't come before the council. I, I'm going to go back to the rule I asked. I had asked. Um, I don't have the, the document in front of me, but it basically says any new position that's being added to the budget has to be approved by the council. We're approving a budget, but we never saw this position. So I'm just questioning that again. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I'm not, I don't believe this is a new position. So did, did I get to clarify, there was a, uh, an employee left the department. The decision was made to to bring in a working foreman, which, as I, I had mentioned, you know, sort of a variety of different reasons right. for that to be done. Um, but certainly, Mr. Cubitt's passing um, uh, played a major role. So the traffic, if the job title, traffic. if the job, if the job title is working foreman, it's a collectively bargained position, Madam Council, which would Sorry. exist in the budget. It's not a, it, it's not a newly created position. Okay. It's a new line item in this department, though. Okay. I just want a clarification. Thank you very much, Mr. Walker. I appreciate it. All Thanks. set, Mrs. Mahoney? I am all set. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Kane and then Councilor Palmucci. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you, uh, good evening, Mr. Cassani. I just, uh, I have nothing to pick apart, and I just want to say thanks. It's uh, nice to see, you know, I know that there was considerable debate when this department was uh, cobbled together a few years ago but it's nice to see an investment really come to fruition. Um, and not that that doesn't happen in other city departments, but particularly in this one, especially being so new, we've been able to see the fruits uh, of the labor of this department really come together. It might've taken a couple of department heads and then for you to come back and join us, but I appreciate the efforts that you and your team um, have put forward to really make improvements, especially on the um, pedestrian safety front. I know you guys have been doing your best to make 
uh, certain that there's availability for multimodal transportation, especially for walking. I've, I've certainly appreciated, uh, I've been doing a lot of walk around the city over the past year and a half. And it's great to see the, you know, different corridors, especially like Beale street, Quarry street, uh, just be so improved and passable and to slow things down, uh, through all of the signage and the electronic equipment. So I just want to say, thanks. It's nice to see these things pop up. It certainly makes the city more enjoyable and uh, you feel, you know, certainly more safe uh, traveling throughout, whether on on a bike or on foot. Uh, so thank you, especially to you and your team. I appreciate it. And, uh, and I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, we have a motion uh, to approve. Um, let me recognize Councillor Palmucci, then Councillor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chris, I just wanted to thank you for the job that you do. Um, budget time when everyone comes to Forest is one of the opportunities we get to um, really highlight uh, good work that's been done over the course of the year, for some of the department heads and some of the department staff. So um, you're, you're so quick to respond to, to residents and myself whenever there's an issue. Um, I really do appreciate it. You do a fantastic job. Um, when you take those, uh, what do you call the, the things on Quarry Street? Bollards or flexi posts? Bollards, yeah. When you take the bollards down for the winter, will you put them wherever the uh, memorial bricks went so that I don't have to see them anymore? Uh, I, I'm all for bicycle safety and pedestrian safety. That is, I mean, I drive it three times a day, four times a day. It's just, it, it kills me. It kills well, me. I, I find a lot of complaints too, for the record. But. Well, like I said, I, I think that uh, there's certainly a conversation to be had in a right sizing of that at a minimum. I, I, mm -hmm. I hear you loud and clear. Yeah, my vote is for no size. All right. Thank you. Keep up the good work, sir. Thank you. Councilor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chris, yes. Um, I remember when you were formed this, this department and uh, we had a lot of dialogue and um, you've done a fantastic job. I want to thank you for all your hard work. Um, some of the things I noticed out there on the streets is these, um, these new blinking crosswalks. Um, Veterans Memorial Stadium, Adams Field, where that is right there. You have nice ones right there. Um, They've been a huge help for the folks just trying to cross them, especially during graduation, ball games. Um, it's a busy intersection. People cut through there, obviously, as you know. How many do we have throughout the city for those, cr those blinking crosswalks? I think we're north of 30 right now. Oh, and, um, you know, I, I don't think we've, we, we haven't hit the end of, of deploying them. I, I don't think, you know, they're really, they are very, very valuable and, you know, I would say if, if this standard had existed 30 or 40 years ago, you would have seen these 30 or 40 years ago. It's just a much better way of getting people across the street than the passive planet. The blinking, even during the daytime, is unbelievable because you can see it from a distance. And then at night, it's, it's unbelievable. So I want to thank you for those because they, they, they help a lot of our pedestrians. It helps a lot of our drivers to slow down and say, oh, there's a blinking lights right there. Someone's getting ready to cross. So thank you. Um, just to get back a little bit on, um, just like the back of the last two years and into fruition is the uh, Independence Ave Adams, um, MBTA Adams Gate that was opened. And the process of having Councilor Palmucci, Councilor Kroll with the two ward councilors and all the neighborhood meetings. And we really vetted that very well. We got a lot of input from the folks. Mm -hmm. And then the council came in. And we did some legislation based on parking fees and all these other things. And that was something I look back on and say that was when administration, department heads, neighborhood, counselors, and everybody had a word in on it. And I, I think it's a success. I go by there quite a bit just to, just to see how the gate is doing. And um, all the things that we had concerns about with the folks around there seem to be not as much of an issue. So. I want to thank you for that. If we could do all projects or all new things like that, how we vetted the process amongst the uh, the neighbors, the administration, the counselors, we got proper input. We didn't open the gate right away. We waited, and and then we did it right. It opened in December, and um, I think I think if we look back, if we could do the Furnace Brook Golf Course as smooth as that one, that would have been great. But um, I'm just looking back. Um, how has that been going? Has it been? Has well, it been I, 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 what I say? You know, a total, a total success, um, and I think all the, the fears that folks have expressed, you know, really, whether it's because of which step exactly, I'm not really sure, but all of it put together, I think, really did address all of those concerns in a pretty cohesive fashion. So, no, that, that was a real slam dunk win for everybody um, without causing anyone any undue, you know, problems in their, in their home life. 
And I can remember back that we increased the parking fees and um, I think that made a difference of three strikes and you're getting the boot or whatever. <laughs> so, or the toe. Um, but thank you so much for all your hard work with some of these issues that I've seen across the city. Um, I, I know we're, we're obviously, uh, I'm going to miss you. You've done a great job. I see you out there early mornings doing surveys, doing all kinds of data. So thank you because traffic was a, is still a big concern, but you've mitigated a lot of it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Well, thank you, Councillor DeBona. Um, could I get a motion to approve? Councillor Kane already did. Councillor Kane did. Councilor Kane did. Thank you, Councillor Kane. Um, before we um, finish, though, Chris, just thank you for all the hard work in Ward One. Been an honor and a privilege to know you, and uh, good luck out west. Thank you. Um, I, I know you'll be successful and stay in touch. Uh, you, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Both say no and. I think Mr. Walker threw in a crack there or something, but uh, we'll let that go. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Chris. Everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next up, um, <clears throat> Mr. Hines with Public Buildings. Good evening, committee members and Mr. Chairman. Um, as suggested, it is the Department of Public Buildings budget session. Uh, I would like to take a brief moment, if I may, uh, to apologize to any counselors who recently received an, uh, an email regarding the condition of a building on Savile Avenue. Uh, I was embarrassed that that email went out. Uh, I'm equally as angered that it needed to go out. Um, the condition of that building is not the standard that I set uh, for my department and for our maintenance staff. Uh, and the ironic part of it being the, the home of the maintenance department uh, is not lost on me. Uh, we immediately addressed it. Uh, Dave Murphy, Commissioner Murphy from the uh, Natural Resources, get in there, get the landscape going, and uh, the companies are already addressing uh, the condition of that building. So I do apologize to the councils that got the email, and I certainly apologize uh, to those neighbors. Um, regarding the budget, um, it's largely, like others, level funded. Uh, in the contractual lines and the current expense sections, uh, there is no difference uh, from fiscal 21 to fiscal 22. Uh, the only places there's marginal difference or any differences uh, is in the personal services. Uh, at this point, there are no raises uh, put forth, uh, but there, was, there are some differences that I will follow up by line item uh, to note to you. Uh, one of which is line 512454, building custodian. I mean, note that in the 2021 budget, it was 405527 uh, and we're asking for the 438 625. Uh, if you skip back to fiscal 2020, you'll see there's 488,000, excuse me, 448,000. Uh, the reason for the dip in 2021, uh, there was a long term absence uh, owing to a significant health issue. Um, and the reporting that got populated into the, the budget preparation um, missed the fact that that salary wasn't being paid when the position was still current. So the apparent increase from 21 to 22, it really is just a correction uh, of a, a clerical error in the 2021 budget. Uh, the next ones with any difference, there's a, there's a drop in line 510-189 clothing. Uh, that's the clothing for the tradespeople, the carpenters, the painters, those folks. Um, and uh, that is actually owing to a retirement, a percentage of people the percentage of pay that they get the, uh, the allowance based on. Um, so the, the older people, the highest salary. Um, it, so there's a slight drop off there. It's, it, it's nominal, but I thought I would point it out. Um, the others, um, the, the next series was this changes uh, basically at the Department of Public Buildings proper. Uh, that is the share of the downtown employees who are carried in the Public Buildings Department a budget. You saw the other half that were earlier presented by Dave Murphy, Commissioner Dave Murphy, uh, the half of these same positions that are carried in the Department of Natural Resources budget. Um, it's not a, some people are on one budget, some people are on the other. It's literally 50% of every individual, 50% of the salaries in parks, 50% of the salaries in Department of Public Buildings. Um, so beyond that, um, the, there's a cut 
in the last line in the top line, which is 519-153. Uh, that's the travel allowance. Uh, nobody's taking junkets or uh, going off on vacation. That is actually an allowance uh, per the contract for any employees who use their personal vehicle for all work purposes um, during the work day. Um, they do get a monthly allowance for that purpose. Uh, we reduce the number of vehicles that are being used by the individual employees, the personal vehicles. So there's a, a, another small cut in that line. Um, beyond that, the rest of the budget is level funded over the last uh, fiscal year to, to today's request. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hines. Questions for Commissioner Hines? Council Palmucci. Thank you. Good evening. Um, uh, Mr. Hines, thank you for uh, opening about uh, and addressing that email. Um, and when I saw the pictures of it, it was, it was uh, something was clearly amiss. A uh, couple of questions here. Uh, so the horticultural laborer position, the handyman laborer position, 512411 and 512412, those are not new positions. It's just a split between you and Parks, is what you're saying? I'm saying I believe those are the new positions that Commissioner Murphy already addressed. But this is 50% of those two salary lines. The other 50% he's already addressed with you. Okay. But they, so they are new positions, though. Net new positions. Frankly, I, I don't want to state that. I'm not certain of that. I, I'm going to defer to through, how it's described and settled yeah. with Ms. Murphy. Through, through you, Mr. Chairman, yes. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Walker. Those are, by those all are, means, Chris, jump in. Through you, Mr. Chairman, those are new positions. Okay. Um, and uh, Mr. Hines, what, um, What's the deal with the 50% um, split? That yeah, was just a policy decision from the third floor. Uh, you, you'd have to defer to Mr. Walker on that or Eric Mason. Mr. Walker? Through, through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Council, you may remember, uh, we talked a little bit about this earlier in the meeting, uh, that two years ago we did present a, a budget for a downtown department. Uh, the, the will of the council, I think you... Uh, were deeply involved in those discussions was to not separate out the duties. There wasn't understanding. Yes, I hated the idea. Yes, yes. Recall correctly. So I that's what these are. Essentially, it's the... At that time, I think there was the understanding, even though the, the separate department, um, which we hope to revisit someday, um, was not supported by the body, uh, including yourself, Counselor, that you did support at that time uh, the need for the positions themselves uh, to be included as part of the city's operational budget because at that time we had just opened the Hancock Adams Common. The garage was starting to come online um, and we clearly needed uh, city employment help relative to the general upkeep and maintenance of those facilities, particularly when it came to Hancock Adams Common relative to the mechanical engineering and the work that needs to be done on a regular basis to keep um, the uh, green uh, up kept in the, in the fountains running appropriately. In this particular case, um, we are quite literally doubling the amount of space uh, that we have uh, public spaces in the downtown uh, between what we have open now, uh, just within the last several months in Kilroy Square. Um, you know, I only have 15 minutes, right? Is this a filibuster? The gallery at Kilroy Square and uh, the soon to be open Generals Park uh, in terms of square footage that is pretty much doubling the size of what these two employees and um, have been uh, assigned to upkeep. So we have proposed the addition of two employees uh, for the area to assist in the upkeep and general maintenance of the downtown. But they'll, they'll, they'll supplement uh, existing staff in other locations as well, right? These particular jobs are located in the, are specifically for the downtown. Okay, so um, just back to that original point about creating like a downtown department. The, the problem wasn't that um, we were creating a downtown department. The problem was that Ward 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 don't, don't have dispatched special um, service providers to upkeep the parks, clean the streets, whatever, what have you. Um, and I think it's it's really a, an equity issue in terms of fairness between the downtown and the neighborhoods. The, the, these neighborhoods 
you know, our residential neighborhoods and our taxpayers here, uh, they're the ones footing the bill for the economic recovery or redevelopment of downtown, which, you know, it's been some new restaurants. It's, it's obviously, we're all very proud of it, but it's a lot of luxury housing. I'm not aware of a single affordable unit that's been built downtown. So essentially what you're saying is the poor people in the city of Quincy, they don't get special services, but this, uh, this luxury enclave that we've created uh, and we've dedicated $182 million to at this point, uh, backed by the taxpayers of Quincy, uh, the residential taxpayers of Quincy predominantly, uh, you know, they're going to foot the bill for this. And I just, I, so that's what doesn't stick right to me. It wasn't to create the downtown department. It was that, you know, if you told me that we need another laborer, uh, horticultural laborer, another handyman laborer, because we're bringing on the, the parks downtown and it's just more workload for everyone and they're all going to go where the work is needed. I don't have a problem with that. I, I don't disagree that there's, there's additional work created downtown. What I have a problem with is when we say downtown gets their own employees because where's West Quincy's employees? Where's South Quincy's employees? Where's Marymount's employees? Where's Germantown's employees? That's not, it's just not fair. Fundamentally, I just, I have a real problem with that. Um, I did then and I do now. And I, I, I suppose I appreciate that you, you came back with it and just didn't do it, you know, with federal money or something. But um, I, I don't, I can't support this uh, for that reason. Again, I, you know, I, I don't disagree that these, that we need additional labor because we have additional maintenance needs um, as a result of the infrastructure we've created. But I have a, a serious problem with um, the downtown, one particular neighborhood in Quincy getting their own uh, service members, their own gardener, their own horticultural laborer, uh, their own working foreman. I just, it's fundamentally unfair to me. So I'll move to cut uh, whatever 36 times two is. Seventy-two, Councilman. The same conversation you had on the other department. <laughs> Did I say it's a long night? So I, I moved to cut seventy-two thousand dollars from this budget. Sure. That's line sure. items uh, yeah. pending four one one and four one two. Okay, I got that motion made by Council Pelmoji on the motion, Councilor Harris. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> good evening. Thank you, um, Chairman McCarthy. Um, um, Paul. Um, Thank you for your presentation uh, this evening. Um, I was wondering if I could take this just a quick moment. I, I don't. We all know about the North Quincy uh, branch of the library building. Um, can you give me a, uh, an update when that's going to be open and completed? Yes, um, we are substantially complete. Uh, the carpeting and floor tiling uh, is set to commence on uh, July. No, excuse me. I believe June thirty-eighth. June. June. 30th, uh, and we are turning it over to the library department the first week of July, uh, where at which time they are new furniture and shelving, handicap compliant because of the cost of the building reservations. Uh, their contractors will come in and assemble the furniture, assemble the shelving. Then the company that took away the collections will bring the collections back. The library staff will restock the shelves. So um, the plan of the library on opening is to have a soft opening in August uh, and the library's determination, the library's decision to open fully uh, for the uh, month of September. Very good, Paul. Thank you. As always, you you have uh, great detailed answers. Um, so, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, after the uh, the vote on the um, on the on the cuts, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Okay. Um, okay, everybody's got their hand up now, huh? Now let me go to Mr. Walker, and then I'll go to Mrs. Mahoney and Councilor DeBona. Councilor Mahoney. You want me? No, Mr. Walker first, okay. then Councilor Mahoney. Go, I just want to hear from Mr. Walker, and then... Sure. Mm -hmm. Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, a couple of thoughts on Council Pamucci's comments. Uh, first, on the affordable housing component, um, within the last couple of years, the city has invested upwards of $4 million from the Affordable Housing Trust for affordable housing uh, in the downtown. Uh, we have a major project coming online uh, on Hancock Street, uh, I believe within the next several months, um, that is just affordable housing uh, for the downtown. Uh, there'll be a project that follows that uh, in terms of timing that is under construction now, some of you might have seen the veterans housing 
on the corner of Temple and Hancock Street, uh, where uh, we'll be providing affordable housing for uh, veterans who are in need of housing. Um, so uh, just in the last couple of years, $4 million of affordable housing uh, in the downtown. Relative to the specialties and the specialty jobs for the downtown district, I think it's important for us to keep in mind a couple of things. One is that these are very specialized positions. There's a lot of different stuff in the areas of downtown that we don't have in our parks across the city. There's a lot of hardscape. There's a lot of different kinds of hardscape. There's a lot of water features. There's a lot of different parts to this. There are mechanical pieces to this. There are a lot of different plantings um, that are part of the downtown. Now, part of the argument is that anything that we do for the downtown, it breeds flexibility in the other it, for other park department workers to be doing their job. So it does affect the city overall. It's less time, it's less work for someone who's already working the parks in some other parts of the city that would otherwise be dedicated, perhaps dedicate, have to be dedicated to the downtown. Uh, and the third piece is when we pitched this budget, uh, pitched the departmental budget a couple years ago, it was to make very transparent that as we have said from day one, as the mayor has said from day one, and this goes back 10, 12, 14 years about the district itself, that there was always going to be a operational function that was included in the downtown that was paid for by the DIF. What we originally proposed was to be paid out of DIF money from the district, specifically for the downtown, and it was going to pay for these positions. And we were going to show it in the budget and show the offset in the budget. Um, that was not the will of the body at that time. That was that, that is revenue that comes from the downtown, is meant for the downtown. But we didn't go in that direction. It was the will of the council. I, I think, if I remember correctly, the will of the council was, yes, we understand the need for these specialized positions in the downtown. We understand the need that the fact that there is just a ton of foot traffic, a ton of different, it's a different animal in a lot of ways than some of our other parks, that it does take specialty positions. And that was the will of the body when they created the downtown coordinator position and the two technicians that currently exist in the budget. This is simply an expansion of that operation based upon the expansion of space. As I mentioned, we are doubling the amount of space in the downtown and the need is there for these specialized positions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Walker. And uh, no, that's a great explanation on, on the downtown, which is uh, very unique. And if it doesn't have the support uh, down there, then all of a sudden things start to fall apart. Uh, mm -hmm. Council Mahoney. Thank you very much. So I just want to clarify. So you were telling me that it's because of the water features, the perennials and other features like that. That's, that's the, the, hard features, and I just want to make sure you have all those right things. Those are all, most of the things you said, Mr. Walker? Uh, through you, Mr. Okay. Chairman, what I'm saying is like other positions within the park department itself, that these are specialty positions. Yep. There are other specialty positions within parks, within DPW, within public buildings for very specific purposes. Yeah. Okay. So, and those very specific, those very specific um, positions are, can be utilized throughout the whole city on those other things. And I think just to tag on to what um, Council Pamucci was saying, because I was trying to say the same thing, but thank you, Council Pamucci, because I think you said it so much better than me. But um, so water features and perennials and architectural um, hard spaces and soft spaces and artificial fields and fitness equipment, they're all at the Kincaid Park. Six million dollars was invested in the Kincaid Park. That happens to be out of the sight line of the mayor. And you know, we're not getting a special, we're not getting a special person um, to be hired to go over there to take care of those things. And it happens to be in Ward 4. And it wasn't complete when we actually unveiled it. And it hasn't been taken care of. And trees are bent and bushes are burnt out. And it looks terrible. No different, no different than when we started this meeting with everybody got the picture of 30 Seville Ave. And we should all be embarrassed by it no more more embarrassed than what Paul Hines said he should be and there it's being taken care of because that's also not obviously in the sight line of the mayor's office because he can't see through buildings but that is in the downtown 
And that's something that's being taken care of by this administration and by this department. So when you say things like, this is something that we have to hire people very specific for the specific of the downtown. Yes, we are, you know, I know that I think it's the Joe Finn house that's, I'm very excited about that in the downtown that that's going to be coming for affordable housing. But majority of what the downtown is, is really for, as, as we like to like, we like to pretend for the affluent that are coming and, and, you know, and it's supposed to be all paid for by itself because that's all you ever hear about is how, you know, this is a no brainer. This is the downtown. It's being paid for by itself. But in this particular case, we're building out a budget and we're hiring very specific people for very specific jobs. And I do have a problem with that because, you know, there is no equity in that. And we like to point out social justice and equity and everything else. Well, that is that is a problem because in Ward 4, yeah, Mrs. Mahoney, park, Mrs. Mahoney, park, you have park, a question. Care of. Mrs. And Mahoney, do you have a question about the downtown? We heard that about like, Kincaid. We know yep. Kincaid's an issue. Well, we just got a let's, long explanation. Let's we talk about the downtown and talk about this cut right now. Okay. And we'll, I, I'm going to agree with this cut. And we just talked about the downtown. And we just talked about the specific, the specific needs for the downtown. And I'm just pointing out just in my little neck of the woods, that specific thing. So, yeah, that's what I'm pointing out. And if Because it's the same thing. We have water features. We have perennials. We have we have a turf field and we have hard spaces. Same thing. Same exact description of what he just gave for the downtown. Thank you. Thank you. May I suggest that it is the mayor that proposed that park and the mayor that proposed that school, the Southwest mm -hmm. School in, in I love Fort Fox? That's okay, Mr. Hines. We're gonna we're gonna move we're gonna move uh, on the motion right now um, on the seventy two thousand dollar cut. Real, real quick uh, on the, mo on the real motion. Real quick, Councilor DeBona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know you forgot me. It's no big deal. Um, uh, just to elaborate a little bit on Councilor Palmucci, he, he he makes he makes a lot of sense. Exactly what he says. You know, it doesn't go out to the thing. It, 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 we need to start thinking about um, the position. I understand is for the downtown. But it's not the only park that we're making new throughout the city of Quincy. I, you know, it makes it makes sense to take them off the job if there's, you know, off the job of the downtown to send them over to um, Southwest or Kincaid to, to help out with the other landscapers or the other other work um, throughout the city. So I think we need to look forward to. If we're going to be doing these positions, and I know you're going to be coming back with something next year and the following years as we get more green space, more uh, open space to be, you know, grass cuttings, that they're not just exclusively for the downtown, that they can actually leave the premises and go on to other new parks or new um, open space or new green space that needs to be cut. Because as the city grows, I continue to say this, they always, everybody's always talking about preserving um, open space, green in space and that requires more workforce to do those cuttings so and plantings of of tree of, uh, of, of perennials you're talking about all these other etc things so i think moving forward is maybe not having exclusively just for them but and caviar and new parks or and new and new any new developed um areas throughout the city of quincy i think that should be the extra caviar on oh. top so that's all I have to say. Just looking forward. Um, you can go with the um, the roll call, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Right. And, and one of the things that Mr. Walker said before we do that, you know, the downtown, everyone sees how clean and how well kept this downtown is coming around and, 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 and coming to what uh, the administration and what a lot of people on the council, a lot of people in the city um, you know, thought it was going to be. A lot of people had doubts. It looks great down there. And to have people paying attention down there, that's fine with me because it looks good. The first time it doesn't look good, we'll all be asking why it doesn't look good and we'll be looking to add people. And I know these people, as Mr. Walker states, they're, they're trying to specialize to make sure that the downtown stays the way it is, that the Hancock Adams Common stays the way it is. So with that... Um, Real quick, Mr. Chairman, I'm not disagreeing with that. That's no, I know my, you're not. I know I, you're not. I'm, I'm just. I, I want it I'm to look just, beautiful up there. We do a lot, just of taking, events, a lot of activities up there, and I want. Yeah, Councilor, sure I'm good. just voicing my opinion. Okay, okay. this is my opinion. Okay. So now we're going to have. We'll take a vote um, on the seventy-two thousand dollar cut. Uh, Jen, can you take the uh, roll, please? Councilor Andronico. No. Councilor Kane. No. Councilor DeBona. No. Councilor Harris. 
No. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council Pamucci. Yes. Council Fan. Um, no. Chairman McCarthy. No. Six to three, it fails. Okay. Um, did anybody have any Wait other motion questions? to approve? Motion, uh, to, motion approved by Councillor Harris. Um, any other comments? Can we take a roll, Jen, on this? Real quick, Mr. Chairman, if I could, uh, just thank you, Mr. Hines, for all your hard work you've done across the city with the public buildings. I know it's a big undertaking. Um, Special Education Center, all these other things you do. Um, also, a side note, very good job with the proms, both Quincy High School and North Quincy. Thank you for doing that. I Thanks. appreciate it. Um, that was that. my pleasure. The kids were thrilled. There was 500 kids got a prom that weren't going to get it. So Thank I, you so I much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Jen, can you Thank call you. a roll? Council Mahoney. I had a question you raised. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Councilor. Um, just a quick question. I was going to say something about the prom as well, um, Paul. It, it, it looked. I didn't get. To, I didn't go to it, but it looked fantastic. I saw all the pictures, and I just think that was. That's a, if we could have the proms there all the time, I think that would be fantastic. Um, but on the other side, I also had one quick question about the Greenleaf Building, the rehab okay. that's going on there. Where do we stand on that? That's been going on for quite some time too. So just looking to find an update on that. The historic railings and skirting have been replicated and a meeting tomorrow morning at nine o'clock with the painting contractor. The new windows yeah. are in. So, uh, the new donated fountain from Monty's uh, Granite in Quincy is on site. It looks beautiful. Beautiful granite uh, historic fountain they donated. Um, so so, we should be done soon, is that what you're saying? Yes, the meeting with the painting contractor tomorrow morning. Okay, and then one last question about, and this is my last one, about the, um, the Thomas Green Public Library and the rugs. Where do we stand on that? That is the last, uh, the final rooms are being done as we speak. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, the last batch of the copper tile is not the right color. Um, so we're going to put down the wrong color until we get the right color because it's going to be about four months to get that copy. And that's that's what delayed the opening the building to this point is the, the COVID impacts and all the supply chains yeah. on everything that we've done. So we're going to complete the job with the wrong tile in that one limited area and then come back and swap it out. Uh, but that same flooring contractor under our contract, when they finish the main library, you're going right down the street to the North Quincy Library and getting that float in. Okay. So when do you think so, how, just, and when do you think the library will be open again? Just well, we we did a, a huge mitigation plan and orchestration of the of the phasing, so yeah. as to keep the library's current public face open. Yeah. Uh, if from our perspective, the building could open tomorrow, but the the library uh, administration has their own uh, their own process that they're following. So Megan Allen will best answer that. Uh, I do know there were issues with a security guard and uh, okay. vaccination of staff. So I don't know where any of that stands. So I don't have that information. That's up to so the, the library. But from my okay, perspective, but, it's ready to go. But the work, your work will be done relatively soon. The next, is that what you're telling me? It, from my perspective, we could open tomorrow. The, the, okay. back of the house back, the children's section is being done as we speak. When okay. that's done, there's very limited back of the house that needs to be done. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Council McCarthy. Thank you. Jen, can you call a roll? Councilor Andronico. Yes. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. No. Councilor Palucci. No. Councilor Phelan. Yes. Jana McCarthy. Yes. Seven to two. Passes. Thank you. Thank you, community members. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, rounding out tonight, Mr. Timmons, good evening. Yes, good evening, Mr. Chairman. Um, there are two items in the first of the three budgets um, under uh, my control or my jurisdiction um, that are different. And other than that, the budgets are precisely the same that they've been the last couple of years. Line items 530010 and 530303 uh, both reflect $100,000 increases from prior years. Uh, one of them is for outside counsel, 
The other is for contracted services, uh, such as experts and engineers. Um, this is primarily driven from uh, our involvement in that Long Island Bridge case. And we also have a case um, with the EPA involving the EPA that was recently concluded. And essentially, the experience with the legal bills was that we were coming back before you um, at least once a year. So the thought by the mayor was that he would request that the lines be funded now. And um, it's a more realistic uh, view of what to expect in the coming year. This doesn't mean that these lines would remain the same or remain static going forward. But we expect for the coming year, this is um, realistic and necessary. Thank you, Mr. Timmons. Any questions for Mr. Timmons? Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve the legal department? Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Councillor Harris. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. The ayes have it. Thanks, Jim. Uh, workman's, workman's comp? Um, there are no changes there. Uh, I think there's a slight increase in the medical bills, but that's just reflective of uh, that industry, the uh, costs of uh, medical care. Um, I mention this every year, but uh, attorney Mike Maxey and then Laura Power in my office, they manage this account and they've done so flawlessly. We've been very fortunate to not have uh, major problems. Mike's very involved with various department heads um, when issues arise. And then it's also notable that the workforce, um, we don't have malingerers. So um, these budgets have been um, realistic, well-managed, and uh, reflect only a minor change for medical costs. Thanks, Jim. Any uh, questions for City Solicitor Timmons on that one? Motion to approve. Motion to approve by Mr. Harris. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Both. The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Timmons. The last one is uh, court judgments. All right, court judgments. Um, what we're doing here is uh, the requested budget shows an increase in the uh, settlement authority. The distinction between judgments and settlements is that with settlements, we can control outcomes. So when there are matters that come in, um, we can work with the other side and reach a resolution um, and, and then avoid uh, the risk or the vagaries of the court process. Um, you heard about that judgment the other evening uh, that was very unique during our time. It was a, a big whack, and, um, but it's the only one that has occurred um, while uh, you know, we've been working in this administration because of a couple of dynamics uh, one of them being that um, there's been a fairly strong economy, so people are working. Um, we don't have a lot of the type of bid appeals that we've had in the past and other contract disputes. So in some respects, claims are down for that reason. Uh, but in other respects, it's just been that we've been managing claims and um, we believe this is an appropriate increase in the amount to continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Timmons. Uh, any questions on that to Mr. Timmons? Motion to approve. Motion by Councilor Harris to approve. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Timmons. Is that it, Mr. Chairman? I believe so. I hope so. Councilor, Councilor DeBoner has had something nice to say to everybody tonight. No, don't, here, don't, get going. don't get him going. Don't get him going. I'll have to invoke <laughs> that 11 o'clock rule if you get him going. <laughs> okay, well, thank, thank you, Mr. Timmons, thank for all your hard work. And everyone's been very supportive, and I thank you for that. Thanks, Jim. All right. Mr. Chairman, um, if, Mr. Chairman, if I could, just something oh, real quick. Oh, I'm going to get Oh, I was just kidding. Oh, that's yeah, you, no, you're, you're all set. Thank you, Jim. Um, oh, is, this, is this it for tonight, right, Mr. McCarthy? Mr. Yes, sir. Okay, just real quick. Um, 
just if I could to the auditor, um, where are we at with amount of cuts tonight? And are we still on the, for every million dollars that you cut, it's $25 for the taxpayers that you save. Are we still in that range? Are we off differently now that I know a few years ago, that was the marker. So yeah. what, what have we cut so far and how much do you need to cut to save the taxpayer a certain amount of money? Uh, yes, Councillor. Generally speaking, it's about a million dollars. Takes about twenty-five dollars off the tax rate. Um, the total cuts that the city council has made this evening total six hundred and sixty-nine thousand oh eighty-nine thirty-five. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's a lot. Uh, since my first year on the two thousand sixteen, I remember we did a two fifty cut for uh, health insurance and. It was something significant, and I think this is this is definitely topped it so far. And we still got tomorrow to go. So, thank you. You're welcome, Council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mr. you, Council. Um, we have first of all, thanks everybody. Um, you know, got through a, a, a good portion of this uh, tonight. Uh, tomorrow we have five thirty again uh, for the finance committee meeting, and then I know everyone. About the special city council meeting notice that we kick off at 7 30 tomorrow night of course if we're not done with the finance we'll come back and then go back to the council meeting but with that um i'll adjourn to this evening and um and, and see everybody tomorrow night thank you thank you thank you